So now it's eleven fifteen. Um, dear copyright lov lovers from all over the world, uh, on behalf of the um, Institute for Intellectual Property Law and Market Law uh, at the Stockholm University, uh, I am glad to welcome you all to this uh, release uh, webinar. We are celebrating a most remarkable anthology on EU copyright law, state of play, and future directions. Um, I started my own um, thesis in 1997 mm -hmm. by quoting T.S. Eliot and his um, uh, first quartet, Burnt Norton, by Time present and time past are both perhaps present in time future and time future contained in time past. If all time is eternally present, all time is unredeemable. So uh, now we are in time present and we are looking to time future. Um, and we have got a um, marathon program here, uh, so by that I uh, would like to uh, uh, give the screen, uh, screen to um, Professor Eleonora Rosati, um, who uh, is um, the brain about this um, remarkable anthology. Uh, so please, Eleonora. Thank you very much uh, Per Yunas and uh, welcome uh, everyone to today's online conference devoted to all things EU copyright. Uh, so I would like to start by noting one fact and it is that 2021 is a remarkable year for copyright law in Europe. It is the 30th anniversary since the adoption of the very first directive harmonizing copyright protection of computer programs. It is the 20th anniversary since the adoption of the InfoSoc directive, a remarkable harmonization achievement. And in a few days time, the deadline for member states to transpose the 2019 DSM directive will lapse. So uh, it has been a remarkable journey so far. And today's event is intended to uh, analyze, comment on, and try also to predict what future awaits EU copyright law. Having said that, I would just like uh, to add that uh, copyright law today is a very interesting uh, beast. Uh, it is a mix of legislation, the number of directives and uh, regulations has increased over time. And in parallel to that, uh, the Court of Justice of the European Union has also played a remarkable role. In uh, many instances, we have not just had an active court, but also an activist one. And I'm sure that today's speakers uh, will be commenting on uh, the legacy of a CJU case law in the area of copyright. Copyright law has also become increasingly uh, diverse. Many uh, stakeholders' views uh, are expressed uh, with uh, increasing uh, um, strength and uh, the harmonization process is gaining in complexity. So it is uh, my uh, great honor and pleasure to welcome uh, today's speakers. They are uh, all the authors of the handbook uh, that you see uh, behind myself. So I would like to thank them and also celebrate the diversity of uh, this uh, cast of authors. Uh, they have uh, devoted their time to uh, study, research, and write about copyright law at a time when the world has faced a very significant challenge, uh, the struggle uh, that COVID has put on individuals, families, and also uh, professionals has been uh, very intense. And so I would like to thank them even more for all the efforts uh, done at this challenging time. 
Uh, we are also very happy to have uh, participants uh, joining us uh, from all over the world, uh, with the exception of Antarctica, all the continents are covered. Uh, so welcome uh, to participants uh, joining us from South America, Central America, North America, uh, Europe, uh, Africa, Asia, and uh, Australia. Welcome uh, to everyone. It is great uh, to see such uh, a significant interest uh, in uh, what is happening in the copyright field in Europe. I would also like uh, to express my gratitude to those who have helped uh, making today's uh, event possible. And in particular, I would like to thank uh, Rihanna Harvey and Alex Zavantamura, uh, two students researching copyright law uh, as part of their LLM studies at Stockholm University. So thanks uh, to both of them for their help. I would like also to thank uh, Alva Vester, the amanuensis of IFIM, for all her assistance in uh, organizing uh, today's event. Um, I think that without further ado, we should uh, start uh, and kick off this conference. Uh, insofar as the bios of today's speakers are concerned, you can refer to the IFIM website. Um, I guess that most of them will be known to those participating in today's conference. You can learn more about uh, their research interest, uh, latest publications by looking at their profiles, uh, which are linked uh, on the IFIM's uh, website. One final uh, organizational matter. Uh, we are, of course, uh, very happy to have uh, uh, participants uh, contribute to today's discussion. To this end, please uh, use the Q&A function that you see on Zoom. If you have any technical problems, uh, use the chat function. And uh, uh, feel free to jump in with your comments, uh, questions, and remarks at any point uh, during uh, today's conference. Insofar as the program is concerned, you will see that uh, we will we'll be looking at different areas of copyright law, starting from uh, the very basic question, uh, that is, uh, what copyright is and what it does protect, uh, to then explore uh, the topic of uh, economic rights and uh, how far the scope of protection has gone and has expanded over the past few years, uh, the activism of the Court of Justice that can be seen in the alleged merging of primary and secondary liability, questions of practical relevance, such as proving copyright infringement, to then move on to explore the state of exceptions and limitations uh, that uh, some commentators refer to as rights of users. And then we will be looking at enforcement aspects, uh, focusing in particular on the technological and transborder dimension before concluding with a discussion of the merits, lack of merits, of the harmonization process and what might await EU copyright law in the uh, very next uh, few years. So thanks uh, to everyone who has joined today. Uh, I would like uh, to kick off uh, the uh, conversation by um, opening the uh, first uh, panel discussion that is indeed devoted to the question of when and uh, when a protection does arise and when it should arise. So it is my pleasure to welcome uh, Justin Pila, Marianne Levine and Silvia Scalzini uh, to join this first discussion um, of today's event. So let's start uh, with Justine, who has uh, written her chapter on uh, the concept of work. She has also touched upon the issue of authorship. So I would like uh, to explain to us uh, what indeed the copyright does cover and uh, whether there is any clarity in this respect. Justina, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, so, well, a striking feature of personal property, I think, is its agnosticism regarding the subject matter it protects. But the same can't be said of IP, including copyright. In Europe, both the justifications for copyright and the scope of its protections are tied closely and inextricably to its subject matter. Indeed, the very concept of copyright contains a reference to its subject matter. As a right of authors, copyright requires the existence of something that might properly be regarded as an authorial work, a work of authorship. And of course, under European law, if an authorial work does exist, member states must ensure its protection by copyright. But how to tell if a subject matter is an authorial work for European purposes? The question raises, I think, three discrete issues. The meaning of the term authorial work, the essential properties of an authorial work, 
and the degree to which a subject matter must possess those properties to be protected. And these three issues are the focus of my chapter for Eleonora's book. So on each, I think much can be discerned from EU secondary legislation and, and the Berne Convention. For example, the directives tell us that the term authorial work means a literary or artistic work within the meaning of Bern that is original in the sense of constituting an author's own intellectual creation and reflecting its creator's personality. Burns' definition and examples of works also suggest that they are artifactual objects of expressive or informational significance, not protected as such, but as and only as intellectual creations of an author, which is important given that some authorial works, as we know, can also be conceived as works of technology. Byrne is also instructive on the essential properties of works, suggesting that as objects of expressive or informational significance that can be read, viewed or listened to, they require a certain unity and stability of expressive form, expressive properties susceptible to sufficiently clear and objective human perception. Hence, features abstracted from works, such as TV or magazine formats, are not works nor a subject matter dependent for perception on unreliable human faculties, such as tastes, Ebola, or on the intrinsically subjective experience of individuals, such as subject matter defined with reference to their aesthetic effects, Kofenol. So these are the essential properties, I think, of a work, apparent from Byrne and confirmed also by the Court of Justice, a certain unity and stability of expressive form. As for the properties of a work of authorship, a two-stage test can, I think, be discerned from the cases. First is the work of a type that affords scope for the exercise of free and creative choices in its creation. And if it is, stage two, has its putative author exploited that scope sufficiently to produce a work that is her own intellectual creation in the sense of reflecting her personality. At the first stage, we can exclude those types of work incapable ever of being original, such as single words, infopack, and works determined by their nature or purpose, FAPL, Football Dartico, BSA, Funk Media and Brompton Bicycle. While at the second stage, we can exclude those individual works whose type affords scope for originality in principle, but whose creator has failed sufficiently to exploit that scope in fact, to produce a work that reflects her personality the issue in Painter. And it's here, I think, that we can expect more guidance from the court moving forward on both inherently unprotectable categories of work and the extent to which a person must exploit the scope for creative freedom afforded by different types of work to merit the title author and the protections of copyright. And in offering that guidance, if I can say, my hope is that the court will maintain its basic approach, its two-stage test, but reconsider its conception of authorship and hence of what constitutes an original work. So since InfoPAC, that conception has been a formalistic one. An author is a person who chooses, orders and combines words or other expressive elements. And an original work is accordingly a selection and arrangement of the same such expressive elements. And it seems to me that this has the support neither of law nor of policy. Of law, because it fails to reflect ordinary language conceptions of authorship and original works, and relatedly of policy, because in doing so, it fails to restrict the protection conferred by a copyright to intellectual creations of an author specifically. So I can suggest the solution here lies in recognizing that as a matter of ordinary language, Authorship and intellectual creation do not involve choosing, ordering and combining words or other elements of expression. Notwithstanding that what matters about an original work are its formal expressive properties, how a literary work reads, an artistic work looks, a musical work sounds and a dramatic work looks and sounds. For despite this, I think most people are unlikely to regard all combinations of words, colours, sounds and movements as intellectual creations of an author and are likely instead to distinguish between music and other sounds, drama and other events, sculpture and other three-dimensional objects, and art and other visually perceptible artefacts, and to be influenced by an object's non-formal features, and in particular by its origins, 
the intention or expectation of the persons who created them, and the view of the society in which they were created in deciding whether a given subject matter is a work of authorship. So if I may say, the court is right that football games are not authorial works, but the reason is not because the movement of players is determined by the rules of the game as said in FAPL, but rather because the intention of players is not to create a work of authorship and nor does society, currently at least, regard football matches as works of authorship. So I think this is going to be a key challenge for European copyright law moving forward, restricting copyright to works of authorship properly conceived in the recognition that in Europe at least, both the justifications for copyright's existence and the scope of its protections are tied closely and inextricably to the subject matter that it protects. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Justine. That was uh, fascinating. If I may ask you a question from a UK perspective, um, you know that, uh, of course, uh, in the UK now there is the issue of Brexit, uh, how to relate to existing and future CJU case law. But uh, uh, another big issue that has arisen in the aftermath of this uh, string of decisions of the Court of Justice uh, is uh, that of the compatibility of the UK closed system of protectable works uh, with EU law. So um, there has been uh, that decision in a response clothing uh, in which uh, um, Judge Acon suggested that if one was to follow CJU case law fully, then uh, perhaps you should no longer ask whether it is a work of the right kind, but whether it is uh, just uh, an original work of authorship. So I would like uh, to seek your input as to whether you think that this uh, category uh, categorization is uh, still possible or uh, instead there should be something uh, to be removed. So, well, I mean, thank you for the question. I guess there's an issue of sort of method here and a, a methodological and a substantive issue. So, so the methodological issue goes to the question that we should be asking, as you've suggested. Um, you know, should we be asking when we face a question of subsistence in the UK, do we have a subject matter that is uh, a literary, dramatic, musical or artistic work? And, you know, and if we do, is it, is it, orig is it original? Um, versus do we have a work of authorship, which I think is, is, is the question that European law requires us to ask. Um, now, I think even, you know, notwithstanding Brexit, if it's clear, if it were clear from the UK legislation that the first question is the one that needs to be asked, then the courts would have to follow that, would have to ask that first question and not the second question. So in that sense, if you like, Brexit doesn't doesn't really change anything. I, I think the more interesting question in a way is, is, is whether there's any substantive difference ultimately between those two questions, whether ask whether the different formulations are likely to result in, in different decisions in practice. And that of course depends on whether or not we can think of a subject matter that is a work of authorship um, within the meaning of the Berne Convention. Um, so if you like an original literary or artistic work that is not um, also uh, an LDMA work within the meaning of, of, of UK jurisprudence. Um, I mean, of course, you know, the Berne Convention has closed categories of work, doesn't it? It, it, it only recognises the protectability of literary or artistic work. So if you're on its face, uh, you might say, well, that seems to be even more restrictive, if you like, than the UK, than the UK categories. So um, I think the, uh, I assume that the UK courts well, they should, as a matter of law, continue to ask, is our subject matter an LDMA work uh, that is original? Um, but, you know, whether there's any difference ultimately between that and asking, is it a work of authorship within the meaning of EU law, i.e. the Berne Convention, is a matter for debate. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, I think that we can uh, continue this discussion uh, by exploring further uh, what the Court of Justice has done uh, with uh, the requirements for protection, the understanding of originality, and also the very availability of protection. And here I would like uh, to bring in Marianne in, uh, to the discussion. Her uh, chapter focuses on the impact of the COFEMEL ruling. And of course, uh, for many member states that traditionally have been reluctant 
to grant uh, copyright protection to designs, uh, the change that the Court of Justice uh, seems uh, to signal uh, is uh, quite significant. And we have seen uh, already national courts uh, um, applying or struggling with the application of the Coffemel ruling. Uh, so, Marianne, what do you think of the direction that has been taken? Uh, where uh, do you see that going? Uh, and uh, you think it is uh, a good or a wrong direction? The floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, you are muted, you need to unmute yourself. Thank you. Mute me. So now, yes, now we can hear you. Thank you very much, Eleonora. Uh, I, uh, yes, uh, I said, welcome to Stockholm where the rain is pouring. You uh, can avoid that sitting somewhere else, and most people can. Uh, you posed a question which I will answer with this uh, day on 12 September uh, 2019, when the Kofemel decision was uh, decided and acted. Uh, from the Court of Justice was one of the happiest days in my life, at least. It was a relief because this is a question uh, which I have been fighting with and for since the uh, 80s, so uh, or, or very early 80s, and I started my dissertation in, in, the, uh, in the 70s already. So uh, to me, this was indeed a relief, and I called my chapter that, or the Kofemel Revolution, because suddenly Kofemel solved the problems I had had, both during my um, writing my dissertation and later uh, when I had to struggle for an equality in copyright law where the traditions were that you should have a qualified copyright uh, requirement. In Kofemel, as uh, most of you know, there was the question from the Portuguese Supreme Court uh, to the Court of Justice. In principle, uh, can we add something to the InfoPAC decision? Is it allowed to require quality uh, as we have it in our legislation in, uh, uh, in Portugal? And the court said, no, you can't add anything because originality is the only standard that is accepted under EU law. That is the author's own intellectual creation. And this should apply to all types of works. So the Bern Convention, which was already addressed by uh, Justine, and uh, now with the InfoPAC, we have a strict rule to, to follow, and that is no qualification of copyright. It should be just this minimum requirement which helps you to concretize and explain the work. Therefore, uh, as already was mentioned, for instance, required skills and talents uh, is not a work. Um, the uh, Court of Justice, both in InfoPAC and in Global I handle refer to the Bern Convention, so we can see that that is then part of the basis. Uh, all works are equal now, and this is also a happy finding after the Coffemel decision. You can't deviate from this um, authorship uh, non-quality requirement. Uh, the uh, um, Court of Justice, I, 
am I supposed to do something here? I thought maybe it was a repetition, but I don't know. Uh, the, uh, there is one, one more quality here, and that is the neutral approach, which is not uninteresting. Uh, could I get the next slide then, please? So different types of works and degrees of creative freedom does not make any difference. And this is very interesting uh, because we have, there, there is a conflict maybe for people who say, oh, but uh, if I have a broad, if I have a broad uh, scope of protection that depends on uh, that I have had uh, a broad scope of ability to work on something. But the court it does not really mean that, that, that the basic rule in EU law is gone uh, because of that you of course, have a broader scope of protection if your work is more original, or should we say, as particular. That still uh, is not the, the answer that the court gives here when it talks about the uh, differences making no, uh, the differences in areas of copyright don't make any difference for the scope of protection. Uh, so the degree of the creative freedom is something else that should not govern what can be protected. A, uh, um, a genes is as protectable as a, a work of art or as a, uh, a music uh, piece. Could I get the... Next picture then, please. Alexander, I, don't, I, I can't move you from here. <laughs> okay, so actually the, uh, the, the, the status of, or the play of the game is of course uh, a starting point for what is the future and the future of copyright and design law, which has been one of the questions uh, when you uh, address applied art. Uh, suddenly, by the Kofemel decision, we got uh, what I would call an EU formulation. Some people have named this a l'unité de l'art à la française, but it is not, in my view, it is something else. This is EU accumulation. Uh, it has objectiveness, it has equality before the copyright law. And it means that all applied art or aesthetical designs that correspond to work are could enjoy copyright protection. But the accumulation is not available where there is not an originality package uh, present. So Infopark and Pioneer will govern what is a work together with, uh, of course, uh, the Nebula Hengelo uh, uh, and the uh, Falpa, the Football Data Co, uh, and the Brompton Bicycle. That is then a package that we have to respect. So in the end, uh, I would say this is not the end of design protection, but it is instead a new definition of design law, which is better defined than before. Um, it should increase, I think, a better awareness and requirement for both unregistered and registered designs, not least the, the, the latter, uh, will benefit from this EU accumulation. And uh, if I can get the last picture, please. Or oh, the one with the last. So uh, this 
is then where we have this revolutionary effect of the Cofemel, uh, which confirms the neutral originality requirement. Uh, and as said, this is not uh, l'unité de la. It is something else. It is something which is unique for the EU. There will be uh, an enjoyment of copyright where works are works and deserve a protection. But of course, as the court says, it is important also that all fields of intellectual property are used in a proper way. And here, there are big differences between copyright and design law, where you have a registration system with barring effect contra the uh, uh, exclusive right, um, uh, which is based on copying, uh, which is more in line with the original ideas of, or of intellectual property, the sharing. The sharing is important and we should not forget that for the future. There is no categorization of works as I read the Kofman decision and the later decisions. This means that legislations probably will have to change in the future, not have a, a, number, a numbering a lot of various types of works that could go under copyright law and then maybe be decided in uh, different ways when the question comes whether they should be protected or not. Another question that has been raised in connection with the uh, Kofemel is uh, whether it introduces a fixation requirement. Um, one can also say, of course, it is about applied art. Uh, so it's a logical consequence that uh, in this area, things will be tangible and they will be fixed. So this remains to be seen. And of course, as already has been said, uh, the court's active appearance has been very challenging. And I think it will be even more so in the future with the DSM directive. Thank you very much. Can I have the last picture? And I say tack in Swedish. Thanks so much, uh, Marianne. Uh, just a, a quick uh, follow up question on the basis of what you have said. Um, uh, currently in Italy, uh, a big uh, debate is the one concerning uh, the um, lawfulness of the very language used in the Italian copyright statute, uh, which says uh, that designs are eligible for copyright protection only if they have artistic value. And the post-COFML uh, debate that has emerged is whether uh, this language should be changed and uh, it is no longer possible to require this artistic value. Um, so, um, to understand uh, more fully from, uh, from your uh, interpretation, you think that this is indeed the direction that should be taken and this language should be repealed from the law. Yes, that is my view. And uh, it, it is not only repealed from the law, it should also, and that is more difficult, I think, be repealed from, from court decisions because it is also with a long tradition where quality requirements have been lifted and have been part of the argumentation by the court, of course, it is very difficult to change and reframe these uh, requirements. So I think there, there is a sort of double problem. There is the problem with the, how you formulate the law and it should definitely not after uh, this decision and the following. We can also see the, the Brompton Bicycle tells us, uh, in principle, the same. I, I would say that uh, Kofemel is confirmed by Brompton Bicycle because it really tells this is the law. So uh, the Italians will have to protest, but go home and, and read you, as did, I think, the Portuguese because they asked and they got the answer, no, you can't have the, the quality requirement anymore. And it will be very difficult in Sweden because there the courts still uh, are leaning on uh, 
uh, equality requirement as well as in the other Nordic countries. Thanks so much, Marianne. Uh, let's now continue our review of uh, indeed uh, the possibility of protection by moving from the realm of copyright to that of related rights. And indeed, uh, in the 2019 DSM directive, uh, there was uh, the introduction at the EU level following some uh, national experiences of a related right for press publishers. This is Article 15 of the DSM Directive. As those in attendance will probably know, it has been a heatedly discussed provision. So I would like to hear from Silvia what you make of this new right. What issues do you see arising in connection with that? And what challenges may lie ahead for member states that need to transpose and then apply this new layer of protection? Silvia, floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Eleonora, for uh, having organized this event with so many interesting voices and uh, perspectives. And uh, of course, for having designed this book, which is very timely, as we, we are all experiencing a fast evolution of copyright and related rights system. Indeed, uh, there could not have been a better moment to assess the state of the art and to detect uh, partners and, uh, and the future directions. Moving to my contribution to, to this work, uh, in, uh, in my chapter, I have the opportunity to outline the root of uh, the introduction of uh, a very much discussed, uh, I would say, um, of a new related right within the uh, European catalog, namely the related right for press publishers for the reproduction and making available to the public of press publication uh, in respect of the online uses thereof by information society service providers. So in order to analyze Article 15 of the Directive Copyright in, in the Digital Single Market, I tried uh, from a systematic perspective to shed some lights uh, on the interests at stake and the origin of the conflict that uh, brings the introduction of uh, the state provision. Uh, indeed, the uh, intended goal of uh, the provision is to facilitate the control and the licensing of uh, press content in the digital environment and to in a way rebalance the bargaining power of uh, press publishers vis-a-vis -vis the digital platforms supporting at the same time the uh, sustainability of uh, the press industry so while the solution of this, uh, such a conflict has been framed within the reform of copyright and related rights in the digital single market, also uh, uh, following some uh, national experiences, the nature of, of the problem concerns also the regulation of business to business or rather a platform to business relationship as this conflict touch, uh, touches also the competitive uh, dyna dynamics between uh, these two uh, categories, I would say, of, uh, of business uh, uh, operators. So coherently, the first concern that uh, has been raised involves the choice of the tool, namely a related right, as a solution to this problem. Since, of course, the introduction of a further layer of exclusive rights has uh, effects on contrast, contrasting interests and, uh, and rights, such as freedom of information, and freedom to conduct a business, and also in consideration of the fact that uh, other legal systems explore solutions with uh, different natures. So since, uh, since the entry into force of uh, the, the directive, uh, the attention has shifted uh, to the ways forward to limit the concerns raised by this uh, new right, while uh, at the same time possibly uh, enhancing the fairness uh, and the well-functioning uh, of uh, uh, copyright focus markets. Indeed, beside the uh, concerns on the underlying justification of the new right, there are some concerns uh, on its design and uh, its uh, effect 
that should be considered within the national implementation processes and the following application and interpretation of uh, the rules. And in my opinion, uh, maybe three are the main uh, issue, issues. First of all, the uh, definition and the scope of the subject matter that is covered uh, by the right is uh, quite blurred. Indeed, the right covers the uh, press publications uh, defined in Article 2.4 uh, uh, as a collection composed mainly of uh, literary works of a journalistic nature, but which can also include other works uh, or other subject matter that constitute an individual item within a periodical angle uh, under a single title, has an informative purpose and uh, is published in any media under the initiative editorial responsibility and control of a service provider, with some uh, 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 known exclusions. And uh, the main concern is about the, I would say, the only threshold set for the, the, the directive of this uh, 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 protection. And indeed, it is excluded from the scope of the right, uh, individual roles or very short extract of uh, a press publication, whose definition is not provided by the directive, but according to the directive, it uh, must be uh, subject to a strict interpretation so as not to affect the effective effectiveness of the right, paving the way of, uh, to a risk of uh, overprotection and uh, eventually also legal uh, uncertainty because the uh, definition uh, of the uh, individual words or very short uh, extract of a, a press publication will be left to the national implementation or more likely to the interpretations of the national courts. And this task could involve a, a delicate exercise of uh, uh, balancing opposing rights and interests in delimiting the scope of the right. And because some member states may opt, might opt for a very a difficult, actually quantitative definition of a very short extract of a press publication, while others, like the French legislator, might prefer a, a qualitative uh, definition of, uh, of uh, uh, this notion. Probably the most uh, viable solution could be to combine the two criteria, so have uh, qualitative guidelines uh, uh, that respect, of course, the freedom of information coupled with uh, an open list of, uh, of examples. Then uh, a second issue is about uh, the possible double layering of, uh, of rights, despite uh, uh, some remedies provided by the directive, implying uh, a risk of uh, an overlap with uh, other forms of protection of works and other subject matter incorporated in, in a press publication, eventually causing uh, uncertainty in rights negotiation and especially in, in rights clearance for the uh, uh, um, uh, digital platform. And the last point, uh, which is uh, very relevant, concerns the workability of uh, this solution uh, in order to incentivize licensing uh, mechanism uh, and uh, the future scenarios that uh, lie uh, ahead. In France, indeed, the refusal to negotiate a remuneration from a a platform with a uh, market power with a uh, uh, dominant position after the national implementation of Article 15 has triggered the intervention of the, of the French Competition Authority to force a negotiation. While on the other hand, the general application of the right may eventually increase some transaction cost and raise um, some market entry barriers to the detriment of smaller, play, smaller players. So at the end, for this case, the future directions and 
the effects of the introduction of this right at the European Union level are still uncertain, I, I would say. So thank you for, for your attention. Thanks so much, Silvia. It is, uh, I would say, rather curious that the question of the waivability or a lack thereof of the right was not really addressed in the DSM directive, considering what had happened in Germany before. Um, and indeed, as you have outlined, the fact that the competition authority in France had to jump in is also quite telling about uh, uh, the rationale of the right, uh, the objectives, uh, and the fact that indeed having a, a para copyright tool uh, might not uh, be enough uh, to address all these points. I fully, I fully agree. Yes, because uh, of course, uh, and this is demonstrated also the fact that uh, other legal systems are considering uh, uh, different uh, solution for this problem, or for this problem that has for example, some regulatory nature, and uh, uh, they are not uh, designed as, uh, as uh, uh, related rights. Yes. Thank you very much, Silvia. Uh, conscious of the time, uh, we move on to the next uh, discussion concerning uh, the scope of protection and uh, prima facie liability. And there will be the opportunity to take in all the questions that are being asked in the QA box in the um, part dedicated to uh, this uh, exercise. So let's uh, move on now from the dimension of protectability to that of what you can do with the right that you are given. And uh, indeed, uh, we have now um, the authors of the chapters uh, detailing the scope uh, of protection of the main rights harmonized at the EU level, uh, reproduction, uh, distribution, and communication to the public. So I would like uh, to uh, start uh, asking uh, Caterina uh, about the right of reproduction. It is uh, what uh, one may think about uh, when you think about uh, copyright, uh, right to copy. Uh, so where we are with reproduction and what issues do you see uh, being raised in that field? Thank you, Caterina. Thanks a lot, Eleonora, for having me in both in the handbook and in this great conference. And good morning, everyone. I'm really delighted to be here with you today. But time is short. And uh, as Eleonora said, this is the beacon of, uh, of copyright. So uh, it's quite complicated to, uh, to keep it uh, short, but I will do my best. And I will provide you only with some snapshots of my chapter, which we can discuss eventually in the Q&A later on. Basically, my findings can be summarized in three basic points. So first, reproduction is a right that was very broadly worded, but in a slippery and born aged manner. Then compared to other exclusive rights, the Court of Justice managed to draw its boundaries in a relatively balanced normative manner, set aside some minor flaws. And three, today, especially vis-a-vis -vis AI, Reproduction represents, again, a potential threat for creativity and innovation, only partially tackled by new exceptions, but it calls again for a normative interpretation to prevent distortions. Let me start with setting the scene. In line with the software and the database directives, Article 2 InfoSoc provided a broad definition, covering temporary, partial, and also indirect reproductions in any manner or form. This provision in general was already born aged and problematic. It provided a take it all definition extended both to copyright and related rights and requested a broad interpretation. This over comprehensiveness was balanced by only one mandatory exception for transient reproductions, Article 5.1, which was meant to avoid unintended blocking effects on the internet and lawful digital users but it still meant that all temporary reproductions are reproductions. National courts started struggling on how to draw the scope of the right and tackle its overlaps with other exclusive rights, mostly because of the technical rather than normative approach to reproduction, which basically meant to extend the right to any conduct that entailed a copy, no matter how, no matter why, instead of focusing only on those conducts that might really impact on right holders' interest and threaten the Essential function of copyright. Commentators, of course, feared of the negative impact that such a rigidity might have on new technology and lawful users. 
But what happened instead was a partially different story because the Court of Justice managed to dispel some of these risks, shaping, shaping the scope of the right by looking at its essential function. Let me give you some examples. Temporary reproduction. The Court of Justice set the scope of Article 2 starting from the exception of Article 5.1, and in interpreting its five conditions, it took a normative rather than technical approach. Think to Football Association Premier League, where the court stated, in order to make Article 5.1 effective, that the requirement of no independent economic significance for, significance for transient reproduction should be interpreted only as not bringing economic advantages that go beyond those directly derived from uh, the reproduction. In this way, it practically excluded from right holders control acts that don't impact on their economic interest. That is the essential function of copyright to ensure that right holders get an appropriate remuneration from the exploitation of their work. Similarly, meltwater, the court excluded caching from the scope of Article 2, balancing the assessment of the five requirements of Article 5.1 with the consideration of the role played by cached copies from the proper functioning of the internet. It targeted basically that the legitimate interests of right holders were duly protected since website owners already obtain a proper authorization to publish from copyright holders. So there was no justification whatsoever to require internet users to pay for the same authorization once again. On the side of partial reproduction in InfoPack 1 and SAS Institute, the court clearly adopted a qualitative rather than quantitative approach to identify the smallest excerpt protected, looking at the impact of the reproduction on the market of the work and not at the mere technical art, act of copying. And then making a big step further, in Pelham, it departed from a literal interpretation of Article 2, which could have led to cover any sound sample of a phonogram, no matter how short, and used for the first time the notion of fair balance between copyright and fundamental rights to draw the scope of an exclusive right, to exclude from Article 2C samples used in a new work in a modified form are recognizable to the ear. It did it by arguing that preventing such samples would have not interfered with the producer's possibility to realize a satisfactory return on investment, while it would have constituted a disproportionate violation of a fundamental right. It's also true that this economic and functional approach led also to opposite results, like stretching the borders of the right of reproduction. Think of art and all posters, where the alteration of the medium is considered a reproduction and not adaptation, no distribution, even if the original got destroyed. This because it was considered as a new copy, different than the one that was originally placed into the market. And the court argued that not to prevent this conduct would have caused right holders to lose control on a potential market of their works and so not to obtain an appropriate reward, reasonable in relation to the economic value of the exploitation. The same is actually argued between the lines of Tom Cabinet in the field of digital exhaustion with regard to the reproduction necessary for the alienation of an ebook. The story is not all rosy, as you can see, we also have not only this plot, but also other flaws, such as the development, as you heard before from Article 2, of quite a slippery and uncertain notion of protected work. And while it is welcome, I would say, for legal certainty in the definition of the right, that finally the EU legislators started declaring mandatory the new exceptions to the right of reproduction introduced from the Orphan Work Directive onwards, the recent introduction of two exceptions also to the reproduction right in the field of text and data mining raises again alarms because it seems to confirm, uh, on the contrary, an absorbing and technical reading of the right of reproduction again vis-a-vis -vis new technologies. Someone else will tell you probably later on in the next panel more on the development of exceptions and limitations also to the right of reproduction and my time is almost over, as I can see. So uh, I stop here in terms of overview. Let me just conclude with a quick wrap up for the discussion. Where do we stand and where we are going? So differently than in the case of the rights of distribution and communication to the public, the definition of the scope of reproduction has not been really subject to unexpected stretches and overhaul. The risk of overprotection flagged after the InfoSoc harmonization was partially dispelled by the Court of Justice, which adopted a functional and teleological rather than technical approach to the definition of the scope of the right 
looking at the essential function of copyright. And this is particularly true in the field of temporary and partial reproduction, where the court has even launched for the first time a constitutionally oriented interpretation of the boundaries of exclusive rights. Some pitfalls, as we saw, still remain, but that's nothing compared to what you see in the field, for example, of communication to the public. Problems lie much more in, in recent legislative intervention, which by providing exceptions for activities which entail only a technical and not functionally meaningful reproduction, such as text and data mining, seems to suggest a return to a technical interpretation, which risks to pose, we know, several obstacles to creativity and technological developments, calling again for a rebalancing intervention. That's all what I wanted to tell you, and thanks a lot again for inviting me today. Uh I'm you know, impressed with your understatement. It's not uh, all you have to say because indeed, no, you said uh, many things uh, and uh, from your presentation, I think it is also apparent uh, that the apparent uh, simplicity of the right of reproduction that you know, um, intuitively we are all able to think of what a reproduction does entail, uh, unlike other uh, no, more esoteric types of exclusive rights, such as the right of communication to the public, shows that indeed this simplicity is not really there, and also determining what is indeed a reproduction is extremely challenging, and uh, I found it also very um, intriguing that you brought in this fair balancing exercise within the right of reproduction, and also the need that seems to emerge from CJU case law to draw distinctions between different situations. The Pelham case is quite telling. So if I might ask you uh, a, a very uh, quick question, is uh, how far you think Pelham can go and whether you think that its teachings can be applied in the field of other related rights and not just the phonogram producers' right? Because it seems to be quite a sui generis solution found there. Thanks a lot for your question, because it gives me the possibility to build a bit uh, on my last statement. I believe that the, uh, the teaching is fundamental now that we are uh, facing uh, uh, flourishing of related rights again, uh, and uh, the court really never uh, focused on this uh, matter as much as it did in general copyright law. What the, what the Pelham analysis does is to go back, as I said, to the essential function of copyright, depending on the type of right involved. So instead of giving a one-size-fits-all definition, it goes to the core of copyright and asks, what do we need this protection for? And on that basis, it states, okay, these are the borders. And it's not the same for all the rights. So for phonograms, uh, we look at the investment and on the basis of the investment, we need to draw the boundaries of the scope of the right, not precluding conducts uh, or copies or samples, which at the end of the day, don't really impact on this essential function. In bringing except not exceptions but fundamental rights from outside so the conflict between copyright and other rights it's just a uh, on top uh, guidance uh, in order to draw the boundaries which otherwise would simply um, look at copyright and exclusive and other uh, related rights as uh, potential absolute rights with no borders and everything else is just um, and everything else is just uh, uh, spectators. So we have really an approach to exclusive rights that is function based uh, and it's uh, once again based on incentives and goals uh, and not protection for the sake of protecting. That I think is the teaching of Pelham, which will be used also for other rights. Thank you very much. Let's uh, now pass on to consider the right of distribution and uh, its exhaustion, which has come under the spotlight, especially in connection to digital exploitations. Uh, and I would like uh, to ask Ole Andreas uh, to provide us uh, with an overview of where we are now with the construction of this exclusive right. Ole Andreas, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, I will uh, give, give a brief overview of, uh, of uh, current problems with, uh, with uh, the distribution right and the, uh, its uh, exhaustion. Um, and I can start with a comment on that as long as uh, copyrights, economic rights still uh, are organized in a bundle of sticks kind of way, 
uh, where the various rights related to a description of the kind of behavior in question, uh, the distribution right uh, finds its place as the stake that concerns the making available of copies uh, of the work uh, to the public. Uh, in many jurisdictions, an explicit dis distribution right did for long not exist in the bundle uh, as it was considered uh, implicit uh, in the, the uh, reproduction uh, right. But as a copy-related right, one, one could ask whether the understanding of the notion of a copy under the reproduction right should have consequences also for the distribution right. Uh, since it is uh, long uh, accepted that downloading is copying uh, that is covered uh, by the reproduction right and the distribution right historically is to be considered as an extension uh, of the reproduction right, uh, the logical step from this point of view would be to consider online downloading services as covered uh, by the uh, distribution right. Um, here, economic and functional arguments, not least related to the so-called exhaustion uh, of the distribution right, uh, kick in. Uh, and one important feature of the distribution right uh, is, of course, what uh, Eleonora also mentioned, the exhaustion rule, implying uh, that once a copy of a work or other protected subject matter is sold with the consent of the right holder, the distribution right concerning that specific copy is exhausted in the sense that resale of the copy is permitted. And in the late uh, 1990s, when the current international and EU copyright framework uh, were drafted, uh, the vision of a digital distribution right with pertaining uh, exhaustion rules uh, was inconceivable uh, outside the realm of uh, tangible uh, copies uh, because of the lack of scarcity that the dig digital uh, uh, technolo uh, technology would offer uh, at that stage. Uh, therefore, it's fair to say that the distribution right in EU copyright law um, is and was designed for the distribution of tangible copies. Uh, thus, the uh, Court of Justice relied to a large extent on uh, the legislative history of the InfoSoc Directive, along with the regulation uh, in the WIPO Copyright Tre uh, Treaty enacted in the same period, when it denied the application of the distribution right to digital uh, sale of e-books in the Tom Cabinet case, uh, decided in December 2019. Uh, at the same time, the consistency with the use of the decision decided seven and a half years earlier, where the Court of Justice held that exhaustion of the distribution right in the computer program directive applies to digital download services is question, uh, questionable, uh, despite the Court of Justice's effort to distinguish uh, the cases, I think. Uh, the result, nevertheless, seems to be that the distribution right in the InfoSoc directive is inapplicable to download services as it applies only to tangible copies, and instead the communication to the public and the reproduction rights apply in combination. However, it, it is still possible to claim that the rationale uh, of the distribution and exhaustion rules could be applicable in the digital digital realm uh, because of the evolving uh, technologies potential to create scarcity also in regard to digital uh, services. Uh, in that respect, I think uh, the Court of Justice had a point in used soft. On the other hand, the experience with that decision shows that the right holders may easily circumvent the result of applying the distribution right and, and its exhaustion to online uh, services by creating other uh, business models, for example, streaming instead of download uh, services, if it's not possible to control the downstream market uh, for the latter. 
so the question is, in any case, what would be gained by applying the distribution right to do downloading services uh, situations where the scarcity paradigm is uh, fulfilled? Uh, one should bear in mind that the situation will never be identical across uh, technologies. And also keep in mind that copyright cannot solve every problem. There may be, well be that problems in the downstream market are better resolved by other uh, legal instruments, contract law, consumer law, competition law. And uh, there are uh, possible, I will, Nevertheless, add that there are possible legal instruments to provide for exhaustion-like results under the current regime, like, for example, the treaty rules on free movement of services and also implied consent uh, doctrines. Um, in any case, and I will close uh, with that, um, we should not forget that there is still a tangible wo world out there to which the distribution right and its exhaustion applies. Uh, there are still uh, problems yet to be solved here, uh, like uh, whether the concept of public should be the same as under the communication right, uh, the applicability of exhaustion rule to amended uh, copies, um, and the mandatory nature of the exhaustion rule to mention something. Uh, these are problems uh, that are discussed in detail in the book that we are celebrating. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, just uh, to be clear, uh, in your view, uh, the Court of Justice in Tom Cabinet uh, completely shut the door uh, to the possibility of second-hand marketplaces that are not authorized, uh, or do you think uh, that it suggested there might be a way for you to be able to do that? <laughs> there, there is also uh, always a leeway, I think, in the case law of the Court of Justice. So it's possible to argue uh, that, okay, this applies to ebooks, then you get computer games, for example, and you can get, uh, get a way around. Uh, I still think that the um, legal arguments put forward in the top cabinet case uh, very heavily emphasized on the legislative history applies to the InfoSec directive as such. So uh, I wouldn't be surprised if the Court of Justice uh, extends the Tom Cabinet rats and alley to, to other uh, situations uh, covered by the, the InfoSec directive. Uh, then I think still think there is a, an inconsistency with uh, the interpretation of the computer uh, program directive. Uh, and as I said, there are also other possibilities to achieve exhaustion-like results, I think, within also the framework that we have. Thank you so much. And now, uh, moving on from Tom Cabinet, indeed, that is a case that shows how far-reaching the right of communication to the public has become, and uh, indeed, what uh, scope of protection it has uh, come to have. So I would like to ask Justin, who has written a, a book on the right of communication to the public, to comment on where we are, you seem rather unhappy with the current state of protection. So uh, let me ask you why and whether you think that a solution can be found. Justin, over to you. Thanks, Eleanor. Uh, good morning uh, or good afternoon, everyone. Um, in looking at the, the theme for today, the state of play and future directions, I think my chapter in the book really follows on directly from this. And it's seven minutes for me to discuss 15 years looking backward and probably the next two years looking forward. So I'm gonna get straight into it. And for those of you who've been following the communication to the public, I call it a saga because I mean, 15 years of, of case law, it's looking like a saga now. Um, I looked at Rafael Hotelis, the system and Sammy, because that was the, the most recent case at the time of writing. We had a few referrals at that point, but the general idea is to, we need to look backward at this point in order to really move forward with the communication to the public, right? Uh, so in looking at the evolution of the rights, uh, we can easily say that there are two sorts of phases or two halves of the development of CTP. Uh, you have the pre Svensson stage where you work primarily at broadcasting, you had Raphael Otellis setting out the core criteria that is an act of communication. 
made to a public and then introducing the new public criteria, which we'll discuss shortly. Uh, and then there's the second half or the sort of post fencing phase where we looked at, we started looking at online infringements. That's the on-demand element, bringing in the making available aspect. And more than that, also looking at platform liability. And because in the prior sort of pre fencing days, it's looking at primary liability of broadcasters or rebroadcasters. Whereas when we move to the online, the on-demand phase, we started looking at platform liability. We started looking at issues of user-generated content and situations like this. So, you know, this brought about a whole lot of changes into the communication to the public game. And I think it's really important to sort of isolate the key elements of the requirements for establishing an active communication to the public before we can even discuss, you know, the scope broadly of the right or the implications for this going forward. So. Uh, for those of us who are well aware of the case law, we know that you have to have an active communication. It must be made to a public. Uh, the ITV case then introduced the concept that if it's made, if it's a recommunication or subsequent communication, and it's made by different technical means, uh, that you would require fresh authorization regardless of the case. Um, if you don't have different technical means coming in, then you have to rely on the new public criteria. And that was a problem because when we saw it in Spencer, uh, the question of is there going to be possible exhaustion taking place by requiring the new public criterion in the online environment. And then this, this sort of sort of created a snowball effect of problems which the Court of Justice had to deal with. And in the next case, GS Media, what we saw happening is that the court introduced a knowledge criteria to try and stop this new public issue spiraling out of control. And in essence, if you knew about the uh, infringing content being uh, uploaded or used on your platform, chances are that you would be liable. So taking that into account, um, we really have five and a half criteria for communication to the public because the half element is what I call for profit. It wasn't necessarily new, it was there before, but post GS, or GS Media and onward, uh, we saw the for profit criterion coming in as a sort of tag along to the knowledge criterion, where if you had uh, your platform running for profit, for example, uh, there would be a rebuttable presumption that you had knowledge. And therefore I say five and a half criteria. Uh, so what's the issue with these criteria and why do I have so many problems with it? Uh, the first things first is the overbroad interpretation of the right. So for all of us who support the transmission approach, we are not going to be happy with the Court of Justice of the European Union's approach to communication to the public case law. So the, uh, the problem with the access approach is that more or less anything that facilitates access to work would probably lead to an act of communication uh, being established. And what's the problem here? Well, anything can potentially be uh, access to work. And we saw this really come to life in the film Spieler case where the court said, look, if you make access easier, that's going to be considered uh, an act of communication under, under the scope of the right. So overbroad interpretation, and that led us into all of the problems we have with new public and knowledge, et cetera. Uh, so taking new public and knowledge, well, we all know the, the history of new public and it being uh, dis disregarded at the beginning, but then coming back in at the EU stage, and then this led to knowledge, yeah? I don't want to spend too much time discussing all of this because we all, you know, for those of us who are aware of, of the criteria, we all know the problems. Um, you can always check out my book or anyone else who has read um, any written on this, this, this topic. So then we have issues of primary and secondary liability. And I know that uh, probably Christina might talk a bit more about that. So I won't, I won't get too much into that. Needless to say, the, the scope of the communication to the public right breeds a certain sense of uncertainty because the overbroad interpretation of the right. But something that I want to pick up on and maybe spend just about 30 seconds or so discussing is the idea that maybe we're asking the wrong questions at the, the EU level. And this is an idea that I uh, borrowed from uh, Rebecca Gibling and Jane Ginsburg in their article who state that, look, the court is looking at the wrong questions. And because of this, this is why we have so many problems with the communication to the public, right? So it's two questions being asked, or rather it should be two questions that should be asked. The question which is being focused on currently is the question of who, as in there's a presumption that there is an act of communication, that there is an actionable communication to the public. And the only question for us to answer is who is liable? When in reality, we should be taking it a step back and looking at why should there be an act of communication to the public? Should there be liability for this act? And that's the question that I think we need to spend more time focusing on. And if more emphasis is placed on that question, we might get better results. Uh, so what I did at the latter end of my chapter is really try to write a predictive piece, sort of interpreting the existing case law and trying to make a prediction as to what will happen next. 
Um, and I looked at four cases in particular. So I'll go, I'll go through them in reverse order because I think it's best to answer the easiest one first. The MICM uh, referral, which I think will be de decided in line with the Zigo case. It's about uh, the torrent seeds. That is the little elements that uh, contribute together to make the final uh, download product that you torrent. Um, I don't see any differences with this from the Zigo case. Uh, the only thing to discuss here is whether a torrent seed is de minimis and if taken together, that will constitute a substantial part of the entire work. Um, so I don't see any change happening in the MICM case. Uh, similarly, in this Stitching Brian, a new service case, this one dealt with the Usenet platform. Um, again, I'm predicting that this is going to be in line with Zigo, um, the Usenet platform. However, the one caveat here might be that unlike torrents where 99% of torrent platforms are used for illegitimate content, Usenet platforms do involve legitimate content and more so it's not necessarily always for profit. Um, so that might lead us to a more thorough discussion of the knowledge criteria, which will be well welcome um, under the scope of communication to the public. And then the big one, YouTube, right? So this is the one that we're expecting soon. Um, again, my initial prediction was that the decision would be in line with Zigo, but then the AG threw us a huge curveball in the opinion where more or less he accepted that the transmission approach should be applied. And moreover, citing my book, which I was super surprised about, because I didn't think anyone would take me on with the transmission approach while writing my PhD and going through, um, you know, looking at the idea that not only the transmission approach uh, should apply, but also just sort of utilizing that language of avoiding the access approach because of the overbroad interpretation that it led to. Um, so the question is, will that make a difference? Um, well, I honestly couldn't tell you because I, my idea was that, look, this is going to be decided in line with Zigo. They're going to say it's it's a liability, but we all understand the huge implications of uh, you know using the transmission approach or using the access approach. So ultimately, the question is, I think it's a 50-50 in the YouTube and the Pulse four cases now. Um, what's next? Well, we have to see what the DSM directive in its uh, national implementation holds for us. Given the uncertainties and the sort of crazy developments we've had with communication to the public, um, you know, we're not sure, well, I'm not sure what the next step is going to be, but we definitely know that the DSM was there to plug some of the gaps with Article 3 under the InfoSoft Directive. Uh, so I see my time has been up, um, so I'll end there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Justin. So on this uh, final note, uh, a debate that has emerged uh, is the one concerning the legal nature of the right of communication to the public in Article 17. Is it the same stuff as Article 3 of the InfoSoc Directive? Is it something different, uh, special right, uh, sui generis right? Uh, so in light uh, of the case law that you have analyzed uh, so thoroughly, what is your take? Do you think it is the same thing or something else? Uh, that's a really good question. I think probably need like five hours to answer it. Um, but I, I think really and truly what happened is that they started seeing the cracks emerging from the post Svensson period. And the idea of the Article 17 is to really plug those gaps. Um, I think what we might see happening is it sort of creates a sort of licensing approach to the right now where, to make an analogy, in many countries, libraries have to take licenses for reprographic uses of, of books. And there's also almost an assumption that there's infringement taking place. And perhaps Article 17 is sort of taking us down that route where the idea is, look, if you have a platform that involves user-generated content, you just need a license regardless of whether the content is legitimate or illegitimate, because there's a sort of presumption now that there's infringing works being used. Um, how does that play out? What is the sort of fairness element of it? Does it follow directly on from Article 3? Um, you know, I think that's going to be open to discussion depending on the implementation at the national level. Thank you very much. And now uh, let's uh, remain uh, within the scope of YouTube and the Advocate General Opinion, um, which uh, extensively discusses uh, the interplay between uh, formally harmonized primary liability and uh, unharmonized secondary liability. And uh, I would like uh, to ask uh, Christina indeed uh, to comment uh, on these developments that we are seeing uh, and whether you think uh, that the Court of Justice in a certain case law has gotten it right uh, or instead has uh, made a mess, uh, just to be blunt. Thank you, Christina. <laughs> Thank you, Eleonora, and uh, good morning. And um... 
thank you very much also for the invitation to participate in this excellent event, I should say. Um, it's a great honor to be here. So um, like you say, my assigned topic today and in your book is um, primary liability and accessory liability in EU copyright law. And so what I wanted to concentrate on for the purpose of this intervention was recent developments, like you point out, in the exclusive rights, not only of communication to the public, but also interestingly in the distribution right in the case law of the CJU and the impact which these have had on EU copyright law. So an initial observation here, of course, is that the traditional understanding has always been that the EU copyright directives harmonize primary liability for copyright infringement, but leave unaffected the law of accessory liability, which is therefore, therefore remains a matter for national law. But this theory, of course, has been challenged by the case law of the CJU, and this has taken what I think for many commentators is an unexpected turn that essentially harmonizes accessory liability through the vehicle of primary liability, which is quite, quite interesting. Um, so the story begins with the right of communication to the public, which Justin has just been talking about. And as Justin pointed out, and as many uh, in this conference will already know anyway, in its judgments, the CJU has developed what is, in many ways, a very controversial interpretation of this right. And it's done this by breaking down the right of communication to the public into two essential cumulative elements. So we have um, the uh, requirement of an act of communication on the one hand, and then also, on the other hand, the requirement of the existence of a public, and indeed specifically, of course, a new public, as the court has made clear. So this is sort of the basic framework, and it is on this basis that the CJU has moved its case law on communication to the public into the area essentially of accessory liability, what in many member states would have been termed accessory liability. So specifically, the CJU found in GS Media, which is the earliest, I think, of these cases, that providing a hyperlink to infringing content which, uh, content which somebody else, a third party, has uploaded onto the internet amounts to an act of communication. And then later in Spils this Film Speller, it also found that offering for sale, a multimedia player that contains add-ons which link to such websites, websites onto which third parties have uploaded infringing content is also an act of communication. And then in Zigo, it held that the operators of the infamous Pirate Bay were also engaging in acts of communication by essentially providing a framework, a platform that would be used by third parties in order to infringe. So what we see here is a case law that has expanded the reach of the communication right to cover acts which in many member states would have previously been viewed as forming the conduct element, not of primary, but of accessory liability. The behavior that is to say of somebody who is supportive of, but not themselves necessarily engaging in the material act of copyright infringement. And in fact, it is worth noting that in order to achieve this expansion, the CJU has had to change its own definition of the notion of an act of communication to cover not only indispensable interventions, which is what it had initially said was necessary in its case law, but also interventions without which the public would only have been able to enjoy the content with difficulty which is of course a very different standard. And this is the standard that emerges clearly, explicitly, finally in Zigo. Now, this being said, this expansion is not an uncontrolled one. Instead, what we see is that its effects are limited through the introduction of a new mental element. So in GS Media, the court declared that it is only the provider of a hyperlink who knows or who ought to have known that the content to which they are linking is infringing that will face liability. And in Film Spell, the court noted that the multimedia players in question were sold and advertised in full knowledge of the fact that the add-ons lead to infringing content. And finally, in Zigo, the court emphasized that the operators of the Pirate Bay not only knew that their platform was used for infringement, but also, in fact, encouraged users to infringe. Now, 
I think it's tempting to connect this mental element that was introduced in these three decisions to the CJU's definition of an act of communication, which the court has pre previously described as requiring an intervention done in full knowledge of the consequences. However, I would suggest that the better interpretation is that this knowledge is different. The knowledge mentioned in GS Media, in Filmspeller, in Ziggo is focused on the infringing nature of the content. And by contrast, in relation to the act of communication, the court talks about knowledge of the consequences. And this would suggest that the knowledge here is simply intended to exclude acts over which the defendant does not exercise control. So it's something quite different. Another option, of course, is that the court views the mental element as part of the element of a new public. However, it's not clear, at least to me, how the defendant's knowledge would influence the nature of the public that is reached by the act of communication. So this to me suggests that what we are dealing with here is a third, a new self-standing element of communication to the public that operates outside of the two established elements of an act of communication and a public, and which may or may not be relevant depending on the form which the act of communication takes. The court uses this mental element to achieve what can be described as essentially a causality leap that establishes liability in the case of acts which would not otherwise amount to acts of communication to the public, acts which are not indispensable interventions as the court had initially required, but without which access by users to the work would be made difficult. So, Interestingly, we can also sort of discern a similar evolution in relation to the distribution right. Um, in one of the earlier cases in Peek and Kloppenberg, the court saw the distribution right as requiring a transfer of ownership. However, subsequently in Donna and in Dimensione Direct, it expanded the right to cover acts preceding or following such a transfer of ownership, such as advertising or the delivery of goods. And more recently in Syed, the storage of goods that uh, contained protected works was seen as being covered as long as the stored goods were intended for sale. So this suggests that acts that do not involve a transfer of ownership themselves, but merely facilitate such a transfer, can be brought into the reach of the distribution right on the basis of their purpose to support such a transfer of ownership. So just to wind things down, because I see that I'm, I've run out of time, what I would suggest is that the ultimate result is a blending of the notions of primary and accessory liability and copyright and the emergence essentially of a hybrid regime. Now, this enables the creation of an EU accessory liability rule on the basis of the existing directives and the exclusive rights. At the same time, and I think very encouragingly, this hybrid regime appears to be one that respects the essential nature of accessory and primary liability by employing a mental element as a control mechanism for accessory, but not primary liability. So that's um, sort of a very brief introduction to my thoughts in this area. Uh, and of course, I'd be very interested to hear what other people think of these developments. Um, thank you very much. Thanks so much, uh, Christina. Just uh, you know, to link uh, what uh, you have discussed uh, to the predictions that Justin made, um, he argued that uh, the outcome of YouTube uh, is a 50-50 in one sense or another. So I would like to ask you whether uh, you uh, feel inclined to have uh, a response that goes more in one direction. So what do you think uh, uh, the Court of Justice will say? Um, that's a good question. Uh, I don't think I would presume to predict what the Court of Justice will say, because as we've all seen, the court can take very unexpected directions in its case law. Um, I think if I had to choose, I would be inclined to say that it will follow the advice of the Advocate General. And I think the reason for that is precisely because of the emphasis on the mental element. And I think there is a big difference between, well, okay, so I don't think it will follow the advice of the uh, Advocate General, unfortunately. So I don't think it will go back on its pre-existing case law and reinterpret the communication right as, in, as a requiring a transfer, even though I agree with Justin that that is the traditional and the correct interpretation. But I think what it will probably do is continue along this line of a hybrid regime, which however distinguishes, at least in terms of functionality between accessory and primary liability, 
even if it doesn't talk about accessory and primary liability in those terms. So I think it will probably rely heavily on the mental element and I'd be inclined to find, to, to suggest that it might rule that there is a big difference between YouTube versus the Pirate Bay because YouTube in many ways does its best, let's say, to not encourage um, copyright infringement but encourage the release of original sort of user created content on its platform, which is very different to the Pirate Bay, which as, as, as the court mentioned in the Zico case, was encouraging infringement, could not possibly not have known that its platform was being used for infringing purposes because of the large quantities of infringing content and had made clear, the operators had made it clear in interviews and on forums that they intended to infringe. So I think that is a material difference that the court will rely on, but I don't think it'll go back on, on its existing case slow and sort of redefine the act of communication. I think it will stick to this expanded definition. Excellent. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, let's now uh, move on uh, to the final presenter in this uh, session. Uh, last but not least, uh, Julienne, who has been working uh, for a long time on a very practical but also very obscure and mysterious question that is how to prove infringement of copyright. Uh, so what lessons can be learned from the CJU case law in this respect? Uh, Julienne, thank you very much for being with us and the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Eleonora. So uh, I'm sorry about the, 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 the background, but I put you a flower instead of the virtual background because it didn't work. But anyway, I'll still share with you some, some of my thoughts uh, on, on this issue of proving corporate protection and infringement at the EU level. So maybe some of you are familiar with the Swiss cheese. It goes like this. The more cheese you have, the more holes you have. The more holes you have, the less cheese you have. Thus, the more cheese you have, the less cheese you have. Y you certainly wonder why am I talking about Swiss cheese in a conference on EU copyright law? Well, that's what inspires me, the harmonization of copyright law in the EU, in particular in relation to the topic of my contribution, namely the issue of proving copyright protection and infringement. You just have to replace the word cheese with the word harmonization. Think about it a minute. With its decisions, in Infopack and Levola, the Court of Justice has harmonized the requirements for copyright protection at the EU level, which were supposedly left untouched by the Infosum Directive. Accordingly, we should now have more harmonization. But for any of you who has been trying to apply in practice these abstract concepts of originality stemming from the free and creative choices, or addressing the expression in a manner which makes it identifiable with sufficient precision and objectivity, then you probably had your own understanding of how you would prove this. Certainly, if you were to do so, you would frame your arguments within your national law of evidence, assuming that this is a matter entirely left to the procedural autonomy of member states following the seminal decision of HIVA from the Court of Justice. You probably would have a glance at the directive, but rapidly notice that nothing in this directive would help you addressing this issue. So you would come to the conclusion that with the harmonization of corporate protection requirements came no harmonization of the practical proof thereof. In other words, the more cheese you have, the more holes you have. You would go on and realize there is no harmonization. If there is no harmonization of that matter, it means that the very existence of copyright law is likely to be addressed in completely different ways all over the EU which runs contrary to the internal market rationale that underpins harmonization of copyright law. And you would think to yourself, the more holes you have, the less cheese you have. Then you would conclude in general terms, the more cheese, the less cheese, and the same goes with harmonization. That's the paradox. Actually, the Swiss cheese paradox, apparently logical, is entirely wrong because it conflates statements made in different contexts. And so is the conclusion I just brought on harmonization of the rules related to the proof of corporate protection and infringement, this time because it is not put into a broader context. Indeed, an inquiry into the Court of Justice case law evidences at least three elements that support an alternative conclusion, namely 
that those procedural rules might fall within the scope of harmonization. First, in the field of trademark and design, where EU law is equally silent on such rules, the Court of Justice explicitly stated in Class International, then in Gauge Coast Handel, that if the onus of proving the requirements for IP infringement were left to the national law of the member states, then the protection would vary according to the legal system concern, contrary to the objective for harmonization or uniformization. Furthermore, the court in Oberbank reached the same conclusion in relation to the issue of proving the distinctive character acquired through use, so the existence of trademark protection on the sole basis of the directive and therefore in connection with the national trademark. To some extent, the same reasoning could be transposed into copyright law. Second, from the outset, the court admitted that the procedural autonomy of the member states might be limited by the principle of effectiveness, which means that the exercise of the rights granted under EU law should not be rendered impossible in practice or extremely difficult. With the additional support of the right to effective protection enshrined in Article 47 of the Charter of Fundamental Rights, in Pushkar, the court did subject to judicial review the rules of evidence in the application of the rights to data protection. And in Koti, Germany and Bashte Lübe, the court connected the issue of proving copyright infringement, the right to an effective protection, and the fundamental right to intellectual property of Article 17.2 of the Charter. Here again, with the result of affecting the possibility to prove copyright infringement under national law in the specific facts of these cases. Which leads me to the third and decisive element namely the fair balance principle, which governs the interpretation of copyright law by the Court of Justice, at least since Free Music I, and arguably serves as a proxy for pushing further harmonization. As to the particular issue of proving copyright protection, you would remember that the requirements for protection were considered to be given an autonomous and uniform interpretation. You would also remember that they have been deduced from the provision of the Enforcer Directive on the reproduction right which following Spiegel Online, Funga Medium, and Pelham is to be considered fully harmonized and therefore fall entirely and exclusively within the scope of the charter. You might even have noticed some kind of proceduralization of the fair balance concept in decisions like UPC Telecable or Huawei. So you would end up connecting the dots and maybe share the following assumption of mine. My assumption is that the substantive requirements that trigger corporate protection will at some point be assessed by the Court of Justice in the light of the fair balance, since the originality and expression requirements are, are the, third place, the first place where you can address the delicate balance between exclusive property once deserved on the one hand and freedom of expression and information, as well as free competition, others shall enjoy on the other hand. Yet, this is not only true for substantive law, but for the law of evidence as well, since specific features of allocating the burden of the proof may actually have an impact on the rights and freedoms enjoyed by the alleged author and by others. So if you are curious to dig more into this and to see how an arguably balanced scheme for proving corporate protection would look, would look like, then I invite you to read my chapter in this fantastic book. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Julienne. Just you know, a quick question before uh, we uh, open uh, the floor for uh, Q&A. Um, um, you know, and it is about the legitimacy of, of what has been done uh, because uh, what you have discussed uh, Mm, seems to me quite intuitively something that should be done through legislation, not case law. So I would like to ask you whether you think that this work that has been done has been you know, somehow unavoidable, but don't you think that the legislator at some point should have or should step in and fill and complete all the gaps that have been left by this case law that is growing, but still is far from providing a complete picture. In my understanding, the issue of approving copyright protection and infringement before the EU stepped into the discussion was already something entirely left to the national jurisdictions, actually, because you have general rules on evidence in every national laws, obviously, but this is something very tricky to prove 
when should protection arise in, in one particular field? And, and actually there are a lot of presumptions that are, there are a lot of discussions on, on, on what kind of evidence you can bring uh, already in, 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 in the case law. So I've been studying my own case law, but could see these kind of things a little bit of everywhere. And, and, and just to mention one, one decision, which is in my opinion, particularly relevant to this discussion is the coach course handle uh, from the, the Court of Justice, which was uh, concerned with uh, unregistered community design. And the issue is proving copying because you know that unregistered community design is, is like to, to cooperate. It protects you only against copying. And the problem is proving copying because often you, you, you're not there when the infringer is actually copying. So it's 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 kind of difficult task. And in that particular case, the Court of Justice stated that, yeah, the German courts could rely on specific presumptions to alleviate and to the, the, the burden of proving copying because it is complicated. So in that particular situation, the extent of similarities was actually a hint that it was the result of a copying. And when you connect the similarities with the possibility to, for example, uh, have access, experiment, the, the work, the prior work, you, you are actually in one particular field of the law that is entirely dependent on the facts and therefore left to the national judges. So even though the, 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 the legislator could step in and, and define general rules, it will be highly depending on the facts and therefore um, to a certain extent left anyway to the national judges. Thank you very much. So uh, we have received some questions. I invite uh, all participants uh, to keep uh, raising their points, ask their questions using the Q&A box. And uh, the first question was raised by uh, Estelle uh, in relation to uh, Justine's thoughts regarding um, the um, subsistence of copyright protection. And uh, um, Estelle asked whether uh, you, Justine, think that the intention of the author does matter or should matter. Um, thank you. Thanks so much, Estelle. Um, yes, I think it, it should matter. I don't think it should be a strict criterion that a person create a work with the intention that it exists as a work, but I think for sure it should be relevant. So I, I guess my claims are twofold. And I should say they're premised on, on, on Kendall Walton's theory of art. So I haven't formulated my own theory of art here. The first claim is that works are constituted in part by their properties of form and in part by the history of their individual creation, explaining why, for example, a pile of bricks at the end of my driveway, to take an example from UK case law, is not a work of authorship, a work of art, while the same pile of bricks in the Tate Modern is one. So that's my first claim. And the second claim is that the question, the legal question, is X a work of authorship, is essentially, or should essentially, be a question of categorization. Does X, the subject matter, belong to one or other category of authorial work? And that to answer that question, we need to consider both the formal expressive properties of X and the history of its individual creation. So we need to consider, for example, the presence in X, our subject matter, of, um, of a relatively large number of formal features standard with respect to a particular category. Paint on a flat surface is likely to be indicative of the existence of a painting because it's standard to painting. We need to consider the fact that the work is better or more interesting when conceived in a certain category than not. So for example, sentences written in paint across a canvas are better when perceived as part of a painting than as one or more literary works, suggesting that it, well, that, that, that they're part of a painting. The fact that, and here's the relevance of the historical, including intentional properties of a work, the fact that the work is recognised by the relevant society in which it was created as falling within um, a particular category. So paint on the body is more likely to be recognised as, as painting as a work of authorship in certain Indigenous communities than in Britain, for example. And finally, on, in, on intention, uh, the fact that the author of the work did intend or expect uh, that the relevant subject matter would be perceived within the relevant category. So again, pile of bricks in the Tate Modern um, is indicative of an intention uh, that a work be perceived as a work of authorship and that supports our categorization of the subject matter as a work of authorship and it should do the same, I think, as a matter of law. 
that's quite a long answer, but I hope that I hope that answers Estelle. So not a strict criterion, but for sure relevant um, on the basis that works are constituted in part by their properties of form and in part by the history of their individual creation. Leonora, can I, can I ask a follow-up question just very quickly? <laughs> Don't you think that goes against Lebola's subjectivity requirement though? Um, the, the rule against the subjectivity requirement. Well, well no, I don't, I'm not aware of, of the existence of such a rule, but I guess I'm talking about, you know, what constitutes a work in fact, actually. And this goes to the idea, I guess, that, or, or the premise of this idea, is that categories of work, including statutory categories of work, um, they denote authorial traditions that evolve you know, uh, uh, that vary between different different social communities and that evolve over time. And if you're going to, um, if you accept that, then I think you have to look at the history of how work came into being in order to decide whether or not it actually objectively, if you like, um, has the status of a work of authorship. And as we know, intent can be conceived subject, subjectively or objectively. I mean, in contract law, for example, the basis of which is intention, we never actually try and climb into the mind of the particular person. We always construct their intention objectively. So, so my answer would be, well, I'm, I'm not sure exactly what that rule is, but, but no, if there's a rule against, against um, reliance on subjective considerations, then, then no, I don't think this, this theory does offend that. <laughs> Thank you very much. If the others uh, if, uh, want to uh, comment as well, uh, please uh, unmute yourselves. Uh, there is another question that was sent uh, through the chat uh, and asks about uh, AI creativity and whether uh, you, Justine, or the other speakers uh, believe that uh, the rise of the AI will prompt uh, some uh, changes uh, to how we understand who or what an author is. Uh, does anybody else want to come in? I'm happy to come in, but does anybody else want to answer that question? Okay. Then, you know, I think that the, the, this question links to another one that was raised in the Q&A and that uh, I think uh, might be answered together. And uh, uh, my personal take is that uh, when we think about uh, whether AI creativity should be protected by copyright, the, Basic question is why protection should be granted. So what purposes this legal regime does serve? And there is indeed a question that asks all the speakers to reflect on the function or aim of EU copyright law. And in particular, whether it is to narrow in focusing on the economic functionality alone. So, uh, well, I guess to, to respond to that and, and related to, to the other question, if I may say, I mean, I don't think in Europe, at least, that copyright does just protect any, you know, um, any, any object, the creation and dissemination of which we, th we, we, we think should be encouraged. So I don't think we do have that understanding of the purpose of copyright. And if we did have that understanding in Europe, I think we would be more likely to come to recognise or more open to the possibility um, or we should maybe be more open to the possibility of AI generated objects being regarded as works of authorship, because we might just decide as a matter of policy, um, however, to whatever extent AI generated objects do satisfy ordinary language understandings of works of authorship, that actually we want to encourage their creation and dissemination and copyright is our tool for doing that. So let's just recognize them as, as copyright protectable subject matter. In Europe, um, I mean, others may disagree, but but I don't think that we do have that understanding of copyright, and that we do we do um, we do approach copyright as a right of authors, by which I mean human beings. And you know, so if you have an AI generated object, I think you have an object that is by definition not not um, you know not an object of human creation, not something that's been created by a, a human being. And I would hope personally that faced with such an object, the courts will resist any, you know, policy driven inclination they might have to say, oh, well, it doesn't matter. Let's recognize it as a work of authorship nonetheless and, and grant it protection. If it merits protection, I would say, let's use a different, a different tool. <laughs> but that would be my view. <laughs> I, do, I just, may I just step in just one second. 
I, I, in, in connection with what I have been saying regarding the, the, the issue of proving copyright protection, this is going to be likely to give rise to, to very, very complicated issues. Uh, I've been advocating against the protection uh, afforded by copyright to AI generated uh, contents. So I won't discuss this here, but only the aspect of, of evidence would be problematic. And just to give you problem, uh, an idea of the problems you would have is you don't know exactly what happens and you don't know how you would forge evidences or pretend it has been created by, 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 by an AI, by a human and so on and discuss this. This is the Davis case, for example, in, in, in the field of patent, this is the ID. It's like not showing necessarily the same, uh, the same thing, who has been creating the, 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 the work. But, but the, the main problem probably with the AI would be the amount of works that would be confirmed. And currently under the specific law of evidence of at least my country, you have to prove copyright protection for every single work you are, uh, um, you are um, alleging copyright protection for. So it means that if we're talking about AI generated contents and maybe like copying of massive amounts of, of works in one particular case, for example, we would have like thousands of, or millions of works uh, where we should be, according to the national law of evidences of probably a lot of countries, we should be discussing every single works protection. And that's, that's, that's impossible. So we need to have at least this discussion, including the evidence of corporate protection, if we are to include uh, AI generated productions into the realm of copyrights. Thank you. There was also a question that uh, was answered uh, before, but I think it might be useful to have also a live answer uh, asking about uh, what role there is uh, for uh, unregistered design protection after COFML. Um, are they still uh, useful rights? Should one be concerned with them? Or uh, is uh, now a world in which uh, copyright uh, takes it all? Uh, so I would like to ask this uh, to Marianne. Uh, uh, Estelle was also worked extensively on uh, this interface between the copyright and design protection. Marianne, do you want to come in first since it was your speech? I don't know if she's there. Yeah, she's muted, I think. Yes, you but you to... are muted. <laughs> You're still muted. Still muted. So perhaps, you know, while Marianne unmutes herself, uh, oh, uh, I'm sorry, sorry, sorry. Oh, <laughs> I, I mean, this is a matter of age and inability in general. <laughs> sorry, I answered that question, which I thought was quite good. Uh, with the short writing where I said the, the unregistered design is actually um, an uh, unfair, it's harmonized unfair competition law or harmonized unfair copying law. And as such, of course, it, uh, it, it is useful. Um, I don't think, uh, I, I really don't think one should uh, think so much about whether it's copyright or whether the un, uh, un whether the unregistered designs are out or in. The unregistered designs came into the Max Planck Institute's proposal once because of my dissertation, because I had a, I made a very unsophisticated uh, survey on attitudes among uh, um, the creative industries in Sweden and asked whether they, uh, why they didn't use the uh, design rights and what was then problems. And then they said, oh, we need some lead time. We can't decide so quickly. We can't be so formal. Uh, and so I was aware of when I, I presented my thesis, which, and this is also part of my thesis, that there has to be um, some sort of unregistered design, whatever you do, because it, it, it will, if you want to promote new designs, uh, the unregistered design uh, is 
uh, a means. And then the length of the unregistered design is another question, I think. Uh, and then, of course, we had during the negotiations of the uh, of the directive, uh, there was a great interest from the clothing industry and from uh, the the textile industry. They wanted something short and uh, not so, uh, so so formalistic. So there, there have been interests in. Uh, in the unregistered design. And I don't think that has so much to do with copyright or not. I think this is, the, it is a simple means of protection. Uh, copyright is normally not so simple. And uh, if you go to court with copyright, uh, still I think there is a tradition that you have to prove. Even if the court of justice in Karen Millan has uh, got rid of most of the formal, formal um, the requirements on proving that uh, something also is protected. Uh, this changes, of course, and we haven't seen it uh, in action more in more than in that case. But, uh, I think it, it it is a simpler process as long as you have an unregistered design right to go via the unregistered design right and not start copyright infringement case. But maybe uh, this is optional and it will remain longer. But please, uh, Estelle. Thank, thanks, Marianne, for, for uh, kicking off the discussion. Yeah, that, it's a very, I mean, I could give a very long answer to this, but I won't because time is constrained. Um, there's two things. I mean, the, the joy of the unregistered design community, unregistered design right, is that you can transform it into a registered design right. You, if you get rid of it, it yeah. copyright can't do that. So there's a, a bit of a problem <laughs> because it, it has that that wonderful little uh, function. But I mean, we could, in my view, because of CoffeeMail, get rid of it and change copyright law to mimic some of the good aspects of the community unregistered design right and create that sort of um, uh, a 12 months period where you can transform your copyright into a, a, a registered design right. There's nothing that can pre that prevents the legislature from doing that because to some extent they overlap. And now with CoffeeMail, they overlap a lot and they conflict. So my problem is more of an overlap issue. Um, when you can use uh, your copyright to prevent, uh, you know, the the sort of rep repair, I think, must fit of must match, which exists in the uh, unregistered community design right, and also obviously in the registered legislation, which you don't have in copyright laws in in some countries because that uh, con that exception in uh, the uh, in full subjective is optional. So there there is a problem there of discrepancy, and hopefully the the new consultation that the DG Grow is launched as is going to, is going to do something about it. But I will stop there. <laughs> That's my view. The only thing, can I just add, the only thing with the, with the grace period, which you, of course, could, could have instead uh, until you get the registration, is that then you have no protection. The whole idea with the unregistered design was actually to build in a protection also when you were uh, unregistered, because that is the most vulnerable time for a new company or for a new product when you launch something. Uh, you need the protection, not necessarily a later. Uh, so uh, you can't lose that part of the unregistered design, but of course you could make it shorter. I, I, I thought it would have been sufficient for the shorter or the same uh, as the grace period. That is something else. Thank you very much. Uh, moving on uh, to the topic uh, of economic rights, um, we have a couple of questions uh, regarding uh, the right of communication to the public. Uh, one is asking uh, about the notion of indispensability of one's own intervention, uh, whether uh, it should be really only about something that is indispensable or also facilitation should be part of the test. And uh, a question uh, somehow related to that because it uh, concerns the scope of protection is whether there might be ways to control and uh, the person is saying curtailing the scope of the right of communication to the public. So I guess that this question is uh, for Christina and uh, Justin. Um. Thanks, Eleonora. Shall I uh, give my view, perhaps? Um, right. So, I mean, I, I think the question 
draws an analogy to the concept of editorial control in media law, I think certainly there would be similarities, but I think perhaps we shouldn't be focusing too much on an analogy to sort of a different area of law. I think what is more important is to try to sort of, as the other question actually suggests, uh, get a handle on what actually is an act of communication. And this is important because if we don't know what an act of communication is, then we can't have legal certainty. Uh, and I know that this makes me, you know, hopelessly reactionary <laughs> conservative, but I would tend to agree with what Justin said, that, I mean, defining an act of communication in the sense of primary liability as involving a transmission is actually quite important, otherwise things get completely uncontrolled. Now, expanding, as the court did, the concept of communication to the public to include acts of facilitation, where those are controlled through a mental element, does make a lot of sense to me, because then your, 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 um, um, respecting the functionality of these two different forms of liability, even if it does confuse the notion of an act of communication. I'm not entirely sure I see why this is something that is objectionable. I'm not quite sure I see why the modern digital environment makes a difference. I, yes, certainly it's easier to exploit works online, but if a platform is being used and it doesn't have knowledge of the fact that it's being used for, for infringement, why should we be holding it liable? That's not entirely clear to me, even though I know it's a very unpopular answer these days. Um, if I could just take a moment to point out a question which Justine also had, not in the Q&A, but in the chat. Um, she asked about the relationship between the concept of communication to the public in the CJU's case law and in Article 8. And she asked specifically whether hyperlinks are or are not pull technologies. And I think my my answer to Justine's question would be that no, hyperlinks should not be considered acts of communication because in fact they, uh, th they don't offer the option to pull anything. Before you can have pull technology, something has to be pushed online, even if it is pulled as the making available right requires at different times by different members of the audience. And hyperlinks simply refer people to content which is found elsewhere that has been pushed onto the internet so that it can be pulled by others elsewhere on a different website. And therefore Therefore, I wouldn't see that hyperlinks should be an act of communication, even though the question of whether hyperlink providers should be liable is a different matter. So perhaps they should be liable if they had knowledge. And of course, the CJU sort of packs this all into the notion of communication to the public. But that's a matter of presentation rather than a matter of substance, if that makes sense. Can I ask just a follow up question? I'm so sorry, I haven't worked out the, the technology sufficiently to distinguish between the Q&A section and the chat function. I've just <laughs> been firing questions via the chat function. My apologies. Thank you so much for answering my question, despite me not having posted in the right place. So, so I totally understand that. But isn't the premise there um, that, a, that a hyperlink provides just location information. It's just equivalent to, you know, a map saying you can find a bicycle, a bicycle over, you know, over in that park. Here's your map as to how to find it. Whereas, in fact, a hyperlink is a bit different because it, it's because of its clickability. Yeah. So if you click on it, then it does put in 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 train this sort of technical process for actually getting you the bike. Do do you, does that not um, yeah. have any significance in your view? I mean, I, I do see where the difficulty arises and I do see where the analogy to a footnote or a, a reference is different because, of course, you find a footnote in, in a document and then, you know, you have to make all your way to the library to, to your way, uh, your way to the all, all the way to the library to, you know, look up the, the, the content or whatever. So it is a bit different. But I think ultimately, and I think the court has hinted, uh, uh, has hinted at that in its case law uh, in GS Media and also more recently, um, in in um, VG Build Kunst uh, and in Renkoff, actually, it said the same thing when it uh, explained the difference between an upload versus a hyperlink. And I don't think the court is explaining it in a very good way, but I think this is what it comes down to for me, at least, if that makes sense. Um, and, and I think the difference is the matter of control. The hyperlink provider does not have control over the content. They are not, in fact, the person providing the content. Yes, you click on the link, but then if the, hype, if, if the content has been taken away or replaced
interspersed with other content by the person who actually uploaded it onto the internet, who is the person who is therefore making it available to the public, then that content is just not going to be found and there's nothing that the hyperlink provider can do about it. And with this in mind, I just don't see how we can say that the hyperlink is, the hyperlink provider is the person making the content available when they ha in actual fact have no control over the content and its availability. Thanks so much. Thank you. Justin, I don't know whether you want to add anything. I'll, I'll just add one, one extra bit to what Christina said, because I mean, I substantively agree that yes, the knowledge criterion in itself is not really, um, it, it can work, but it requires much more clarity. It also requires us to really ask that first question that again, that, that I referenced with uh, Giblin and Ginsburg. Should this technology, whatever it is we're talking about, be subject to communication to the public? I think if we ask that question and there's a deeper interrogation, we might get different answers, especially in regard to things like hyperlinks. But then we get more complicated with hyperlinks because there are different types of hyperlinks. So, for example, we get into the uh, discussion about embedded hyperlinks, etc. It's not so much about the technological function, but the sort of perception of that technology. How is the technology appear to the end user? And I think that makes a little bit of a difference in terms of not just clicking a link and getting to somewhere else, but rather the link is operating behind the scenes and the end user is actually seeing it on the screen. Um, so I think that makes a difference, but ultimately we need to ask, should something different happen? Or you know, what are the other possibilities? And in interrogating that, we might get a little bit more control, might get some different questions and answers, yeah. Great, thank you. I see that there are uh, two other comments regarding uh, whether different links should be treated differently. I guess that we might have different views in that regard, uh, but uh, it seems now that after the CJU decision in the VG Bill Kunst, that possibility is not there, or at least it's not there yet. And uh, the approach seems to be a technologically uniform one. So uh, I think that we have reached the end of uh, this morning's uh, part. So we will now take a break and we will be resuming at uh, 1340 CEAST. Um, so please uh, come back in 20 minutes or so for uh, the afternoon session. And thanks to all the speakers who have joined us uh, this morning. See you soon. Thank you. Hi everyone, uh, welcome back uh, for uh, the afternoon session of today's conference. Uh, it is now high time uh, to move away from the topic uh, of copyright subsistence and economic rights uh, to discuss exceptions and limitations uh, and see how they've been shaped in legislation and case law. Uh, we are joined uh, by a cast uh, of uh, brilliant researchers who have worked extensively in this field. Uh, their contribution to the handbook is just a glimpse of what they've done in, uh, the, in the field of exceptions and limitations. So I very much look forward to the discussion uh, this afternoon. I would like uh, to start uh, from Stavrula, who has uh, written her chapter on the topic of quotation. There is a, a quite an intensive uh, debate whether quotation is a right or is it instead an exception. So Stavrula, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Eleonore, and congratulations on a fantastic conference. Uh, so as uh, you said, my chapter is concerned with the exception uh, of quotations under European Union copyright law. Uh, this is a classic exception. Uh, it is available practically in every copyright system, and it also is one of the few uh, exceptions that are mentioned at the international level, uh, in particular in Article 10 of the Bern Convention. Uh, in the European Union, as um, you said, it is uh, listed as one of the exceptions in Article 5 of the Information Society Directive. And more recently, there is the debate as whether uh, this is a user right or, or whether it is merely a defense against allegations for copyright infringement. 
what my chapter does is to uh, explore the scope of the quotation exception as uh, um, discussed uh, by the Court of Justice in a trilogy of cases that were uh, all issued on July 2019. These are Pelham, uh, Funkemedian, and Spiegel Online, and it discusses the relationship between uh, copyright exceptions and user rights, not just the quotation exception, but also more broadly um, the um, copyright exceptions and fundamental rights, and also it investigates the legal nature of the quotation exception. And going beyond current scholarship, it also inquires the contextual framework and also legal implications of the recent affirmation by the Court of Justice uh, of the quotation exception and exceptions listed under Article 5 of the Information Society Directive as rights of the users of permitted works. So the Court of Justice in this trilogy of cases has affirmed that the quotation exception has a very broad scope, uh, in particular when it comes to the character and purpose of the use. Uh, the Court of Justice has affirmed that the concept of permissible quotation is um, uh, broad, that it can be carried out for practically any purpose and criticism and review are only indicative purposes for which um, uh, the quotation exception can be permissibly carried out. Uh, a, a broad range of other purposes uh, can be equally permissible, and that includes cross-referential use, it includes advancement of knowledge, advertisement, and so on. Uh, and in terms of the form that the quotation can take, the court has affirmed in Spiegel Online that the concept of permissible quotations under Article 5 of the Information Society Directive can also include hyperlinks that can be downloaded independently online. Uh, in addition, when it comes to the kinds of copyright protected works that can be quoted permissibly, the Information Society Directive uh, does not specify a specific kind of uh, protected works, and the only limitation that it imposes is that the subject matter uh, should have previously been made lawfully uh, available to the public, meaning that unpublished works cannot be quoted uh, lawfully. And uh, of course, the court has uh, also noted that the use in question should be carried out uh, in accordance with fair practices to the extent that is required by the specific purpose that um, uh, of this particular exception. Uh, and also, it should be uh, the, the quotation is permissible only if it relates to a work which has already been lawfully made available uh, to the public, as the directive also indicates. And when it comes to the portion of the work that can be uh, lawfully taken, the court has affirmed in Pelham that unauthorized samples, however short they might be, uh, they could infringe in principle the phonogram performance rights. However, uh, the concept of what can be uh, copied permissibly uh, is fairly broad. And finally, in terms of the scope of the uh, quotation exception as elaborated by the court, uh, an important condition of the exception is that permitted quotation should be in accordance with fair practice, and this is primarily a matter of reflecting on the permissibility of a given use in the light of the three-step test that is incorporated in Article 5.5 of the Information Society Directive. Uh, beyond the scope and meaning of the quotation exception under European Union copyright law, as discussed by the Court of Justice, uh, the chapter also moves on and unfolds the relationship between copyright um, uh, exceptions as fundamental rights and the fundamental rights underpinning them. Uh, this is something that the Court of Justice has discussed uh, by reference to the quotation exception and the fundamental rights um, of freedom of uh, press and freedom of arts. And it was held that defendants in cases of copyright infringement cannot rely uh, directly on the relevant fundamental rights on which copyright exceptions um, are premised. Uh, as um, uh, the court stressed, uh, copyright exceptions and limitations available under Article 5 of the Information Society Directive are specifically intended to ensure a fair balance on the rights and interests of the right holders and on the other hand, the rights and interests of users uh, of um, works uh, or other subject matter, which is a very important finding because it means that the copyright's internal balance between exclusive rights of the copyright holders and freedom of speech uh, is one that is realized via the copyright exceptions and limitations. Uh, 
uh, as uh, you most of you probably know, uh, the court adhered to the opinion of the Advocate General, and it affirmed that the external application of freedom of speech uh, is um, uh, not necessary, uh, despite, of course, uh, the undisputed relevance of fundamental rights within European Union copyright law. Uh, clearly, one of the natural unfoldings uh, and the implications of affirming uh, such a copyright balance uh, in these uh, cases on the quotation exception uh, is that uh, the, this concept of the balance uh, means uh, that uh, the copyright exceptions and limitations do hold an integral status uh, as user rights. Of course, in order for this to be uh, achieved, uh, the copyright balance requires obtaining just rewards for copyright holders, while at the same time promoting the public interest. Um, uh, this uh, is one of the groundbreaking insights uh, on the legal nature of exceptions and limitations. Uh, many members of this um, uh, panel have discussed about copyright exceptions as user rights, uh, not just uh, in the uh, edited volume in the Routledge Handbook on EU copyright law, but also in other publications. And there was a lot of uh, scholarly consensus about recognizing uh, a, the copyright exceptions as user rights, or at least um, uh, concerning them as mandatory against contractual uh, limitation by the copyright holders. Uh, this uh, affirmation from the Court of Justice uh, in uh, um, Von Comedian and Spiegel Online uh, follows earlier cases where there was some inclination from the Court of Justice uh, about affirming copyright exceptions as user rights, such as Telecabel or Techniske uh, Universitat Darmstadt, uh, where the court developed some, let's say, team insights uh, on the affirmation of copyright um, exceptions as user rights. And uh, now, uh, with this um, affirmation in, Fungen, uh, in Funke Median and Spiegel Online, we can say that the Court of uh, Justice has unequivocally declared copyright exceptions to be understood as rights of users uh, of uh, protected works. Uh, this is the equivalent of the CCH uh, uh, case of the Canadian um, Supreme Court. Uh, there is still a lot to explore and still a lot to discuss. And I am sure in terms of future directions uh, that the court will rule on the particular shape that uh, uh, user rights will take under European Union law, which until recently were deemed to be merely uh, as defenses against um, allegations for infringement, uh, whether this will be a case of considering uh, user rights as um, instances that are mandatory against contractual override, or whether these are positive rights that the users will have to bring uh, against copyright holders in case their ability to carry out one of the copyright exceptions um, is for some reason limited. Uh, this is yet to be seen. Uh, this is one of the issues that I'm sure there will be a referral uh, soon uh, to um, elaborate further on the legal nature of um, the uh, copyright exceptions and limitations. I understand that I'm running out of time. Uh, for those who are interested in uh, um, reading more about uh, some insights on the uh, copyright exceptions as user rights, especially with reference to the quotation exception, the Routledge Handbook <laughs> is one of the sources to read from. <laughs> Thank you, Eleonora. Thanks so much, Stavrula, also for uh, the kind uh, marketing push for the book. Um, indeed, uh, what you are uh, outlining uh, regarding, uh, you know, uh, the changing, I would say, or uh, the, you know, rediscovered nature of exceptions as rights uh, has also come under the spotlight uh, in the discussion uh, surrounding the implementation of the DSM Directive, uh, Article 17, indeed uh, does mandate member states to introduce, uh, among other things, uh, an exception for quotation in case they don't have it already, and uh, at least for uh, the um, activities covered by the provision. And uh, a lot of the discussion that has been taking place is regarding, uh, is that concerning ex ante uh, blocking and ex post review, and whether instead the user rights should be safeguarded more strongly and prevent uh, that uh, uh, legitimate uploads uh, are unduly blocked. So I would like uh, uh, to invite you to comment on that uh, if you think it is appropriate. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Eleonora. Indeed, the, the, the Digital Single Market Directive indicates some sort of inclination towards an understanding 
uh, of uh, exceptions as user rights first because it declares some of the exceptions and limitations listed in the directive as uh, imperative against contractual override but as well uh, as uh, it also stipulates that there are certain complaint and redress mechanisms uh, in terms of online content sharing providers which will have uh, uh, to be uh, there will have to be some reassurance that they will not um, prejudice the rights of users to have recourse to official judicial remedies. So this can be read as one of these possibilities um, uh, that the digital single market seems to be favorable towards an understanding of exceptions as user rights and one that will be uh, strongly related to uh, contractual um, uh, the, the issue of contractual override and the legal nature of um, exceptions respectively. Thanks so much. Uh, remaining on the topic uh, of uh, exceptions as uh, user rights uh, and embracing uh, a broader perspective beyond the quotation, I would like uh, to ask uh, Maurizio to illustrate uh, his uh, uh, research findings and uh, whether you agree that indeed this characterization is the correct one to make. Maurizio, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Leonora. Thanks for organizing this. And yes, the short answer is yes, but let me just uh, give you a brief summary of what uh, I'm saying in my chapter. So the language of user rights has been for a long time alien to EU copyright law, a sort of a foreign language, mainly spoken in academic circles, with the notable exception of Canadian jurisprudence, as Tavrula was just mentioning, the famous position taken by the Supreme Court of Canada in CCH and other cases that fair dealing and other exceptions are not just defenses, but user rights, so not to be interpreted restrictively. Now, the process of EU copyright harmonization, as we all know, has been mainly driven by very basic, I would say, mainstream economics, meaning the broader the st and stronger the property rights, the better for the economy. That is, is, the, is the, the justification behind uh, most of the uh, acquis, uh, acquis communautaire. So as a consequence, we have secondary legislation where exceptions are essentially derogations to the general rule. The general rule being ensuring high level of protection for rights holders. And correspondingly, a large body of jurisprudence of the ECJ that follows substantially the same path, extensive interpretation of the acquis, restrictive interpretation of exceptions. Now, this path culminated in 2000 with the elevation of IP rights to the status of fundamental rights in the notorious Article 17.2 of the EU Charter that entered into force in December 2009, which reads, intellectual property shall be protected. Now, this peak in the process of IP expansionism marked also a turning point in the ECJ jurisprudence by then rebranded CJEU. And uh, the story of the post-Lisbon Treaty jurisprudence that I, I, I try to tell in my chapter goes pretty much like this. Since copyright is now officially a fundamental right, then it must take on all the honors and burdens of this status, namely the fact of being balanced against other possibly conflicting fundamental rights. So uh, in a way, copyright is now playing uh, in the Premier League or if you want in the Serie A of rights and there are tougher games to play. Uh, schematically, this game involved three steps. First, the court was not particularly impressed by Article 17, too and said that nothing in the wording of this article suggests that IP rights are absolute and inviolable. And I think it repeated this uh, around six times in uh, copyright cases. Second, the court started interpreting copyright exceptions no longer as derogations to the declared goal of secondary legislation, high level of protection for rights holders, but as instruments to protect fundamental rights recognized by primary legislation, freedom of expression, information, press, freedom of the arts, and so on. And third, it balanced the two conflicting rights on equal footing based on the principle of proportionality. So this is in a nutshell the story of uh, uh, user rights in EU copyright and how the language of user rights entered 
officially into EU jurisprudence, as Stavrula was mentioning, uh, primarily in uh, Funke Median and Spiegel Online, where the court expressly says that copyright exceptions and limitations must be interpreted as, as uh, user rights. Now, uh, how about future directions? And I'd like to use my uh, three minutes to, point, to touch a point that uh, I discuss uh, only briefly in my chapter. Um, in the European civil law traditions, fundamental rights such as freedom of expression, information, freedom of the arts, typically belong to natural persons, not to corporate entities. Unlike in the US, where we know that First Amendment rights are very generously given to corporations. Now, corporations, in particular internet tech companies, have heavily relied on the exceptions and the other exemptions, both directly and indirectly, uh, namely by extracting value from uses made by their customers. This is the, the basic modus operandi of internet platforms. Now, we have already various examples of copyright cases where the European court has imposed limits to the scope of corporate interests vis-a-vis -vis rights of natural persons. Authors, film directors, performers, I'm thinking of cases like Hewlett Packard, Lucas Sun, uh, and the recent uh, uh, phonographic performance Ireland about performance rights. Now, in a similar vein, the court has construed certain exceptions, in particular private copy and quotation, as exclusive to natural persons. So making in a way more difficult for tech companies to extract value from these exceptions. And here I'm thinking Vcast for private copy and Spiegel Online for, uh, for quotation. And there is also um, um, a pending referral on private copy and cloud services, Austro Mechanica. So we will see soon whether my idea, my theory, my prediction is correct or not. So um, although uh, fundamental rights have no direct application uh, in uh, copyright cases, as Tavrula just explained, the personality element involved in fundamental rights that we have seen has played an important role in neighboring areas of law like data protection might determine future direction uh, in uh, copyright jurisprudence, in particular regarding uh, exceptions and limitations. So to conclude, I would say that copyright may become a tougher game for corporations on both sides of the copyright field. And this may not necessarily be a bad development. Thank you very much for your attention. Thanks so much, Maurizio. Uh, the perspective you bring in uh, is indeed uh, fascinating, and I think that uh, it also connects uh, quite nicely to what we were also discussing uh, before the break. That is indeed uh, what the rationale of protection is uh, and uh, who is deserving of uh, protection. Um, so indeed, uh, before uh, we... Um, I think that we can continue discussing the state of exceptions and limitations. You have uh, reviewed at length the fundamental rights angle, uh, but let me continue by asking Sabine uh, to elaborate on the fundamental rights dimension of exceptions and limitations, uh, which is indeed the topic of the chapter that uh, she authored. Uh, Sabine, the floor is yours. Thank you, Eleonora. Um, yes, indeed. So we're going to carry on speaking about uh, fundamental rights uh, for, for a little bit. So if, um, uh, as uh, previous panelists have mentioned, if for long, uh, actually, maybe um, national courts have refrained from engaging with arguments based on human rights consideration in copyright uh, exception cases, uh, this is actually uh, not true anymore uh, today. Um, and whilst uh, legislators have struck uh, a balance between copyright interests and uh, human rights directly in copyright legislation through internal uh, mechanisms such as exception and limitation, the rise of uh, supranational instruments and the work from the Court of Justice in this area certainly require national courts to also give more attention uh, to human rights in uh, copyright exception cases. Um, and this is actually not particularly uh, a, a new phenomenon. 
However, we see that there's uh, a, willing, um, a willingness, a uh, greater willingness today to hear uh, these, these arguments. Um, there's no denying that there is a strong commitment to respecting uh, fundamental rights uh, when applying copyright rules, but there seems to be a differences in approaches uh, adopted by the EU legislator and by the Court of Justice of the European Union. Uh, firstly, uh, the Court of Justice uh, relies increasingly on the human rights framework to uh, expand uh, the reach of copyright exceptions and elevates them uh, to users' rights, uh, as we've uh, mentioned. Uh, the Court of Justice relies on uh, this fundamental rights framework to establish interpretative uh, principles, but also to fine tune the scope uh, of the exceptions themselves by borrowing uh, factors which are well established in the freedom of expression cases under the ECHR, for example. Um, so some examples of, of this would be, um, well, the content of the expression, such in the Dechtman case in relation to parody, or the nature of the expression uh, in the three landmark cases from 2019, uh, Funke Medium, Pelham, and Spiegel 9. Um, so we see that uh, the fundamental rights framework is uh, relied upon for interpretative uh, principles. Uh, exceptions should not be uh, interpreted uh, restrictively, but uh, strictly. Um, that uh, the way we apply these uh, exceptions should also enable their uh, reali the realization of the underpinning uh, objectives. We see that fundamental rights also have uh, a role to play where um, the exception is actually not uh, embedded or rooted in uh, fundamental rights uh, considerations. Um, however, uh, we also noticed that the Court of Justice has been uh, extremely proactive and has also devised its own uh, factors. Uh, such as uh, in the Pelham case, by looking at the extent to which the defendants use, sorry, encroaches upon uh, copyright exclusive rights. Um, caution must be applied, uh, I believe, in this area that uh, one factor uh, will not be applicable across the board uh, to all uh, exceptions. Uh, for example, this uh, this latest. Um, factor might not be uh, the best in uh, parody uh, cases. Um, but uh, we see, therefore, that there is really um, a, a lot of progress that has been made in this area by the Court of Justice and that we are likely to see in uh, national uh, courts uh, as well. Um, the EU legislature um, has also recognized some exceptions as uh, users' rights in the uh, DSM directive, as we've already mentioned today. But the implementation of some of the provisions is actually likely to undermine the progress that has been done uh, by the Court of Justice in upholding fundamental rights um, and in shaping uh, these exceptions um, in copyright law. And here I'm, um, I'm referring to Article 17, which provides evidence uh, of this difference in approach, where it's likely to be very tricky to actually uh, safeguard um, these uh, fundamental rights and uh, copyright exceptions when uh, requesting um, private companies to come out with te technological tools that are more devised to uh, look for um, copyright infringement than to actually uh, safeguard uh, copyright exceptions. And here there's also uh, a, a problem that these technological uh, tools might not be uh, easy to, uh, to devise, even to consider uh, copyright exceptions. Thinking again about the parody exception, when we're looking at contextual use uh, as such, uh, this might be extremely uh, tricky. So this different of approach is likely also to trickle down um, a national level, where national courts um, are likely to maintain a cautious approach uh, favoring copyright owners until further guidance uh, from uh, the CGA uh, EU um, is actually um, given. Um, and we already have uh, snippets of this when we look at uh, the application of the parity exception, even in countries where there's a long history of applying this exception. So, for example, with the Maya de B case in Belgium, or the two most recent cases in France, Davidovici versus Jeff Koons, and the Mulasa case from two weeks ago. Um, so what does the future hold? Uh, well, first we have to see the implementation of uh, Article 17 and how actually we will be able to uh, safeguard uh, fundamental 
the rights and these um, these exceptions that are now uh, users' rights. But also, I would suggest that there's a greater role for uh, fundamental rights when shaping um, uh, copyright exception. And actually, these fundamental rights have a role to play directly into the assessment of um, of copyright uh, exceptions. So, uh, looking. As an example, again, uh, my favorite, uh, the parody exception. Uh, we know that Deckman requires uh, two uh, characteristics. First, evoking an existing work while being noticeably different from it. And secondly, uh, a humorous uh, character. And then as a second prong to the test, we have this proportionality test requiring to balance fundamental rights at, at play. And so some are seeing in this uh, a two-prong test where fundamental rights only have a role to play uh, in the second prong of the test. And perhaps there's no, another reading to this where actually fundamental rights can color um, the factors in order to establish whether these two uh, main requirements, so the first prong of the test, uh, are actually satisfied in particular situations. Um, this perhaps is the best way to make sure that the objectives of the exception is uh, are actually sorry um, realized, but equally uh, a way to ensure that harmonization is achieved throughout um, the union. So I'll stop here for now. Thank you. Thanks so much, Sabine. A question that I cannot resist from asking you or Maurizio is uh, one that, of course, uh, um, concerns Article 17. As you all know, uh, the Republic of Poland has lodged a, a CJU complaint regarding the very existence of the provision. There is an alleged breach of freedom of expression. So I would like to seek your view whether you think that this complaint has some merit and uh, how the Court of Justice should be deciding. So either you or Maurizio, um, please let us know what you think. Well, I'm not going to uh, pretend to, uh, to, to, to say what the Court of Justice is likely to, to, to decide, um, but for sure it does have some merit because one does wonder how harmonization can be uh, achieved. Um, so yes, it's, it's, it's a very uh, difficult uh, one. Uh, Maurizio, I don't know whether you also want to. Yeah, to I will take the risk because I, I I will bet ten pounds that the that the, the it will not be successful the the Poland argument. But I take I take the risk. Okay, I, I I'm betting on on this outcome. <laughs> I think that I tend to agree with you, but we shall be seeing. Uh, I think that now it is. A Time to move on to uh, another topic in the field of exceptions and limitations, uh, which uh, also uh, come up, uh, came up this morning at all in a different light, and is indeed the, uh, the relationship between uh, copyright and technology, and in particular the newly adopted tax and data mining exceptions, uh, which uh, were considered pivotal to machine learning exercises in Europe, the development of artificial intelligence, and also to allow the AI to be in a position to create. That is what we already addressed at the end of the morning session. So we are very happy to have uh, Alain and Rossana, who have explored this topic at length in the chapter, but also other works of theirs. So uh, welcome and I look forward to hearing your views. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Eleonora, for the invitation and good afternoon, everyone. Well, as uh, Eleonora was mentioning, uh, Alan Strowell and I have contributed uh, to, to the book with a chapter on the new tax and data mining exceptions. Uh, TDM is a topic dear to us since 2017, and uh, we crossed it uh, as uh, researchers first, and then well, later on as copyright scholars. At that time, in fact, I was working on a project for the automated analysis of terms and conditions on privacy policies of online platforms to spot potential unfair terms. And uh, the, uh, the, first, uh, um, the first step was precisely to mine the text of the legal documents available on those websites. We start by doing a very typical lawyerly thing. So we ask ourselves, can we do that? And uh, uh, we begin to explore the national, the national exceptions. 
and the framework was not particularly favorable, uh, but, the, but the directive on uh, copyright in the DSA was on the horizon and one of the, its main rationale was precisely to increase the legal certainty around the TDM. So we followed the evolution of the uh, proposal for the directive. We analyzed the final versions of articles thir three and four, and uh, we concluded that also the two new TDM exceptions presented several intrinsic and extrinsic limitations that in our opinion uh, don't unleash the potential of AI research and application. So in the first part of the, of the chapter, we deal precisely with this critical aspect. But in the second part, uh, there is, we offer the uh, parse construence, or as Alain will call it, a utopian, not so utopian proposal for a purposive interpretation of the rights of reproduction and extraction. And uh, uh, Alain, you're good to go. Thank you, Rosanna. Uh, sorry, I, I'm still speaking from my cave. I, I didn't receive the white light of IFIM, um, but it's a pleasure to be there. Um, yes, I, I think we can have quite a radical view uh, on the issue of TDM. Uh, I've been studying copyright for a long time, uh, and I never thought that copyright was there to block research and access to information. That cannot be true. Um, so I think uh, when we think about the reproduction right, uh, there are still a lot of things uh, to do. And uh, first of all, there are, I think, one argument that we explore in order to have a purposive interpretation of the reproduction right. And that is the distinction between uh, the scope of uh, copyright defined by the different rights and exceptions. That's one thing. But we forget, and especially as uh, academics, we forget that uh, the scope is as well defined through the infringement test. And as you know, there is nothing in EU legislation concerning copyright, concerning other rights. You have some criteria for infringement, like infringement of design. So we have there something we saw any constraint from uh, EU law, and I think there is still room uh, to develop a proper infringement test. Uh, and and there, as as you know, the notion is the notion of copying, which is close to the reproduction right. But the notion of copying within the infringement analysis, I think, requires uh, uh, something that is more. Uh, a purposive interpretation. Um, and, and that is what our, we have tried already to, to underline. Uh, in, in other articles uh, for a book uh, that was edited by Bernd Huguenos, uh, I, I pushed for the interpretation of the reproduction right or its, its infringement, like requiring that we have to use of a work as a work. And in the case of TDM, you don't have a use of the work as a work. When you are using a work just to extract information, to identify patterns, uh, to see new trends, you are not using a work as a work. You are just using it as uh, data, as a source of, of information. And basically, I think that should be outside the scope. And, and uh, you, you can have it outside the scope when you think about the infringement test. And there is maybe some similarity with the approach under trademark law, where you still have a requirement to use the trademark as a trademark. And we know in the keyword sale cases, I mean, the Google one, for instance, uh, that the court said that uh, you don't have a use of the trademark as a trademark, when it's only used within the system uh, to trigger uh, a sale of a keyword that is used for um, advertising on, on search engine pages. Uh, I think we, we could defend the same view in the field of copyright. So that is already one argument. A another argument is that I think we are wrong and we were wrong in defending, I think, uh, what might be called a mechanical interpretation of the reproduction right. Uh, we might find something of that in certain 
decisions of the Court of Justice when we think about InfoPAC and Premier League, but we could discuss that later uh, during the discussion. I'm even not sure there you will find this mechanical interpretation. Uh, but I think we have been captured by a technological view of copyright. Uh, and I think that the case law of the Court of Justice is starting now, but it's in the process of evolving, of distinguishing a purely mechanical notion of reproduction and a requirement to have a reproduction for the output to be visible, uh, to be recognizable for a human being. And we could start to think about uh, what the court said in Pelham, uh, where uh, it said that there is no reproduction if, I quote, uh, to work is unrecognizable to the hear in the case of music sampling. Um, I think we, we could develop that more and distinguish the more recent case, like Pelham, from maybe the older case, although even in InfoPAC and Premier League, I think a public was there uh, at the end of the process uh, in both the case of the uh, data capture process uh, leading to a printout and in the case of the copying uh, in the satellite decoder in Premier League. So I think we, we could rethink uh, the notion of reproduction. It's highly time and then the consequences is that uh, TDM, as long as there is no uh, reproduction of the elements used in the process, as long as they are not reproduced in the output of the TDM process, we are outside the scope of copyright. And I think we need to uh, go to that conclusion because the TDM exceptions uh, have a lot of flow still, and, and there are problems to make them compatible with other exceptions for research. I think copyright is not there to limit research. That's my view. That's all view. Thanks so much, uh, Alain and uh, Rossana. So just to be clear, uh, what would be your solution uh, to the TDM exceptions, uh, to delete them or to reform them? Well, I mean, uh, it would be good, but that's, uh, I mean, that's science fiction uh, to, to revise them. Uh, but first of all, it's not because there is an exception that necessarily uh, to write covers that, uh, that aspect. I think th to say that is, is probably something that looks uh, idiotic or um, I don't know, uh, but but I, I still think that you cannot derive the right from an exception. And uh, I think that through a, a correct analysis of the infringement test, we can exclude uh, other aspects or other cases of TDM, even if they don't fall under the exceptions. Uh, and I'm ready to plead that before a court. Excellent. Uh, thanks so much to the both of you. Uh, let's continue our overview of exceptions and limitations. Uh, and uh, now it is uh, my great pleasure to have the opportunity also of a comparative uh, take on parody, which uh, Sabine uh, already mentioned. Uh, and uh, it is uh, our pleasure to have uh, Bill Patry with us uh, looking at parody from uh, an American and uh, European perspective. Uh, Bill, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Eleonora. So I have to say, I'm quite self-conscious about being here uh, today for a number of reasons. First off, I'm an American, and therefore I'm what Edward Bulwer Lytton called the great unwashed, right? Maurizio may in fact have had that in mind when he expressed disagreement with our Supreme Court giving corporations certain First Amendment protections so the First Amendment concerns government suppressing speech. Um, I would hope that even in the EU, you don't want government suppressing speech, even by corporations. The problem in the case referred to was whether giving money to political campaigns is speech. I agree. It makes no sense to treat corporations giving money as speech. But we should be clear what the issue was. The issue was money not the expression of opinions. The uh, second reason I'm self-conscious is that I actually don't know anything about European law. And I pointed this out 
to Professor Rosati when long ago she asked me to contribute a, a chapter. One would think that, you know, ignorance is disqualifying, but Professor Rosati is a very generous person, so she, she allowed me to contribute and I'm thankful. Um, the other reason I'm a bit self-conscious is that unlike the other, you know, very illustrious panelists, uh, I'm not a scholar, you know, I'm, I'm just a lawyer who works for a company. Um, so you might be wondering, well, what could I possibly contribute to the discussion? And, and that's a good question. But I think what I'll try and contribute is what Professor Rosati mentioned, a sort of comparative look at how the U.S. treats these issues. Uh, so that's what I'll do. We handle the issues of parity and really limitations and exceptions um, in some different respects from the way I think things are handled in the EU. In the EU, I think it's a top-down approach. Recital 32 of the Information Society Directive um, was put in to ensure that member states don't have flexibility, at least as to the reproduction right and the right of communication to the public. Right? The recital does that by saying that Article 5's list of limitations and exceptions are, quote, exhaustive. So what's on the list is what you get, and that's it. And what's on the list has to be applied uniformly without regard to differences among EU member states. So humor may be different in EU member states, for example, Italy versus Germany, but the law can't be different for humor. In the Deckman case, of course, the CJEU said that the concept of parity is an autonomous concept in EU law, and it has to be given a uniform interpretation throughout the union. The court I think helpfully gave some guidance about what it thought the essential characteristics of parity uh, are, but whether a given use is to be deemed a protected parity uh, has to be determined by striking a fair balance uh, between the interests of the involved parties. That striking a fair balance stuff sounds quite similar to how we analyze fair use claims in the US, but in one important respect, I think we have a lot easier. So, for example, if it was not considered to be a parody for whatever reason, as the CJU defines parody, well, the defendant is out of luck. You know, he's not on the list of protected uh, exceptions, so too bad it's not, you know, it's an infringement. That's not the way we work. We really don't care what label you call something. You can call it a parody, a satire, burlesque doesn't matter to us. We don't even care if it's listed in section 107 as one of the potential fair uses, because that statute is drafted in a way to make the uses and the factors illustrative and not limited. Indeed, parity itself is not listed as one of the potential fair uses in the statute, but it doesn't matter to us. For a very long time, we've treated particular parodies as being fair use. And there are other you know, sort of uses that are considered fair use without being listed. Interoperability, checking student papers for plagiarism, comparative advertising. All of those we're happy to consider as fair use or not, and it doesn't matter to us whether it's in the statute. We believe that balance, the sort of balance that the CJU is talking about in Deckman, um, is inherently contextual, as, as I think they said too. Um, but for us, that means it's not something that legislators and their sort of all seeing wisdom can exhaustively lay out in a list, whether it's in a list in a directive or a list in a statute. We think that creativity is dynamic. That's part of why we love it, because it's changing, it's challenging, it's interesting, it's not exactly what you may have thought it was. And so if you're going to have laws in the field that's dynamic, it makes sense that the laws be dynamic too. Why would you want rigid laws that deal with a dynamic field? Um, I spent seven years in Washington, DC writing copyright laws. And the most important thing I learned in those seven years um, is to be modest. Now, I don't have answers to anything, uh, much less situations that haven't even occurred yet. So to me, it's better policy to agree on standards that are used contextually at least in a creative field like copyright, rather than to have rigid rules, which you would want, for example, 
you want to know how many taxes you need to pay. You want that to be pretty certain. <laughs> you don't want that to be up to subjective determination. So there are some things that should be rigid. There are some things that should be flexible. Our fair use provision, um, with its illustrative and not limitative uh, essence, is really born out of that modesty. It's born out of a belief that balances are always contextual and aren't capable of being fixed a priori. We tend to see our copyright law as a whole, and we don't see it as a set of discrete rights that have to be calibrated at the strongest possible level uh, for what I believe to be you know, empirically flawed ideological reasons. To say, oh, we need to have the strongest possible copyright law um, is, is you know, empirically nonsense, I think. You don't go to a doctor and say, give me the strongest possible medicine you have. You want the medicine that's going to work for what the problem is. So, you know, the idea that limitations on rights are begrudgingly given, they're exceptions, they sort of interfere with the natural order of the universe, um, doesn't make a lot of sense to me. I mean, the natural order of the universe is pretty hotly contested, I think. So whether you call something a user right or derogation from the natural order of the universe is to me, as a practicing lawyer, a procedural question, right? Who bears the burden of proof of showing whatever it is, whether it's infringement or whether it's a user right or whether in the case of, a of fair use it's an affirmative defense. But from the drafting standpoint, the policy standpoint, the question of whether it's a user right or a defense um, is to me harmful. Uh, what I learned in drafting laws is that you want to do as good a job as you can in drafting whatever the policy is. And if you do a good job, then what you want is for courts to interpret that law the way you drafted it. You don't want to put on top of that something that says, oh, well, this provision has to be, you know, uh, interpreted really narrowly. Uh, because why? Because we have this ideology that, you know, rights have to be at the strongest level. Uh, that makes no sense to me. <laughs> you know, draft something that's going to fulfill what you want the law to do. And if you did a good job, then interpret it the way it was meant to be drafted. Um, that's sort of the end of it. Now, you know, we have a lot of freedom because we don't really care in some ways with fair use how it's drafted because that's just an example. It's just a thing, you know? Uh, we have standards. So, you know, for us, it's sort of easy. And I'm not suggesting that the EU, of course, adopt fair use or any element of US law. We're the great unwashed, you know, we're off on our own, doing our own sort of crude things. We don't even have a culture, which is why we don't have the Ministry of Culture. Uh, maybe our culture is money to some, I don't know. Um, you have a civil law system, you have directives, you have the CJU, and that's quite a different legal system from ours. Um, while we have standards, what we do have, of course, is a precedential system. So we have over 200 years of case law on fair use, and that actually gives a lot of guidance. And I will say as an in-house lawyer, we deal with fair use all the time. And so do lawyers at media companies. And we can do it. We can do it every day. You know, if I go home at the end of the day, and my employer hasn't been sued, I've done a good job. You know, and that's how we sort of approach things. You know, we're sort of, we'll take the problem that's right there at hand. We're not ideologues. We just do it. We do a good job that I know I can go over a bike ride at the end of the day. And, and that's enough for me. So that's how we view things. So on this uh, bright note, uh, Bill, uh, let me ask you a question, um, and it has to do with method. Uh, you indeed highlighted uh, that uh, there is uh, this uh, rigid approach in the EU uh, to ensure uh, uniformity, that uh, harmonization actually does occur. And uh, since uh, you have uh, experience uh, in uh, lawmaking and uh, drafting of legislation, um, do you think that a big part of the problem might be the fact that in copyright law we have directives that leave member states free to choose how to implement them instead of regulations that might skip this part and ensure a greater uniformity and at the same time more flexibility? So is the issue of the choice of instrument something that you think might be relevant to this discourse? Sure. If your goal is uniformity, then have uniform laws. <laughs> if your goal is to have diversity, have diversity. If your goal is to have some uniformity and some diversity, 
then you're going to have a mix of things. And you're always going to have a conflict then between those things you want to be diverse and those things you want to be uniform. But another question, of course, is what is it you want to be uniform, right? Even in Deckman, Deckman said, of course, that parity is an autonomous concept. So for Italians, you're stuck perhaps with the German view of parity or vice versa or whatever it is the CJU thinks it should be. But that's at a very high level, right? The uniformity is at a very high level of what legal principles are. The actual dispute about whether that case was a protected parity or not can never be uniform. It, it can never be uniform because it's fact specific, as even the CJU said contextually. And if you look at many of the most important elements in both American and EU law, I think they can never be uniform, right? Who's an author? You can say an author is a human being, as we've discussed before, and it's not an ape or it's not an AI creation. Okay, that's fine. But whether this particular thing had enough originality to justify you being an author is something that will never be uniform. It's all fact specific. The same thing for dual morale. Does something violate someone's dual morale or not? You can say it at a high level and have uniformity at the highest level of principles, but you'll never achieve it at the fact level because all of these things are fact specific. And you know, the only thing I would say is that's fine. That's good. I mean, we talk about creativity, oh, copyright's really great, it's creative and people are creative. People are creative factually. And, and so because they're creative factually, we have to live with that uncertainty. Um, and we're fine with that. You know? That's totally okay. You know, decision making under uncertainty is the way lots of stuff works. We're okay with it. We don't want a top down approach. Thanks so much, uh, Bill. Uh, it is now the time uh, to discuss uh, something that all exceptions and limitations uh, need to comply with, uh, and that is the three-step test. Uh, so we are very happy to have uh, Daniel uh, discussing uh, this topic with us. Uh, he has uh, researched this issue for a long time. Uh, so Daniel, we look forward to hearing your thoughts. Uh, thank you. <laughs> well, thank you, Eleonora, and hello, everyone. Um, well, if we're talking about uncertainty, I think the three-step test is a, is a good a good subject. It's a, one that I think is intriguing as ever, because even after after 50 years, I think there's no uh, generally accepted understanding of, of what the test really entails. Um, and that's certainly also true about the test in, in European law, which is illustrated by the fact that the Court of Justice has not yet been able to settle on one particular understanding of, of the nature and content of, uh, of the EU test. I want to use my six minutes to make three observations or arguments about the, the nature of the test um, in EU law, maybe not so much about, about the content, but specifically focusing on the, na on the nature. And the first is uh, that the content of the test should be understood merely as a limit to discretion in, in order to ensure compliance with, uh, with international law. Uh, second, that it is that it makes little difference whether member states have chosen to implement the test or not. And third, that national courts should not have or not adopt a stricter uh, view of the test than is prescribed by, by EU law. So starting with this uh, first observation, that is that the EU test is principally intended to ensure compliance with the international legal obligations of the union. Um, this is most evident if you look at the earlier direct of the early directive, software directive and the database directive, which explicitly refer uh, in their text, the Berne Convention. But it's also true, I think, of the later incarnations of the test, most notably, most notably the Information Society Directive, um, which of course is, is, is notorious in that respect. And the only reason um, I feel that any doubt has, has uh, arisen as to the nature of the, of the information, of the three-step test in the Information Society Directive is, is what I would call the clumsy or unfortunate formulation in Article 5, which says that um, limitations and exceptions shall only be applied if they comply with the three-step test. And this has then given ri rise to um, extensive debates about who is the addressee of the test and does the test apply to specific acts or not. However, if you look at the legislative history, at the preamble, and also at the, uh, the purpose of the Information Society Directive as uh, in general, as an implementation of the obligations of the EU under the White Rock Internet Treaties, I think it, it, you can fairly convincingly argue that the three-step test in the Information Society Directive is also merely intended to ensure with um, a compliance with, with international law. 
As such, I think also that the legal uncertainty introduced by the test ought to be fairly minimal if you agree that the margin of discretion uh, that is inherent in the test is rather broad, which you can certainly argue from the perspective of international law, although that is, of course, a contentious uh, issue. Um, but I think it's also true in the context of EU law, um, although admittedly the Court of Justice, as I said, has um, not really been able to develop a, a coherent approach uh, in this respect. Regardless, what the three-step three test is not is uh, a norm uh, with which specific acts uh, must comply. Uh, now, unfortunately, uh, and I think erroneously, the Court of Justice has on some occasions suggested exactly that, but fortunately on later occasions and later decisions, the court has appeared to steer away from such an understanding of the test. Um, if we conceptualize the test as a norm with which specific acts must uh, uh, comply, uh, that risks transforming the test into uh, a more open standard, you could compare it then to, to a sort of fair use uh, standard almost on top of the existing limitations and exceptions. Um, and then you would create a sort of a worst case scenario of sorts in which uh, you have then the downside, the, 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 um, that you work with specific limitations and exceptions that are in, um, uh, on which on top you layer this open norm as uh, this was already pointed out by, by Martin Sandler more than a decade ago. So and instead, I would, I would conceptualize the three-step test in EU law as entailing more like a, a question of general justification. It focuses on whether an exception with a particular scope can be reasonably justified in general, of course, and within the peri perimeters of the, of the three-step test. Then to the second observation, uh, and that is that I think it makes little difference whether member states have transposed the test or not. Now, either way, national courts must interpret national law in a way that, um, that is consistent with EU law, including the obligation that the scope of limitations and exceptions uh, may not exceed the boundaries of the three-step test. And I think the only arguable difference between implementation and non-implementation may affect the applicability in concrete cases of provisions whose wording does not uh, permit a consistent interpretation without going uh, contra legem, although I think also this uh, in itself may be a rare occasion occurrence. Um, and I want, want to add to that uh, another argument, um, uh, specifically that the Court of Justice has been quite resourceful, I think, in the past, uh, specifically outside the area of copyright, in finding ways to circumvent the lack of horizontal direct effect of, uh, of directives, um, notably by relying on general principles of EU law, such as in Mongold, uh, and Kuchuk de Vesi, and more recently also um, by relying on the, on the EU charter. And this can then further dilute uh, the difference between implementation and non-implementation. Uh, in this regard, I would point to last year's uh, RAP decision, so recorded artists, uh, actors, performers by the Court of Justice, in which it suggested that any derogation from the level of protection guaranteed by secondary EU law invariably limits the fundamental right to property and that such a limitation must be provided by EU law, not by national law. Um, and this means that if the court can, can be persuaded to extend the horizontal direct effect of the charter to Article 17, um, then this might mean that courts may need to disapply limitations and exceptions to violate the three-step test, even it has not, if they have not, uh, the test has not been transposed into national law. Now, I think, personally, I think this would be a bridge too far in, in terms of lending a direct effect to the charter. Um, but as I said, the court has been creative in the past in circumventing this limitation of uh, horizontal direct effect of, or the lack of horizontal direct effect of directives. Um, then the third observation, which ties the previous two together, is that national courts should not adopt a stricter view of the test than uh, is prescribed by EU law. That would risk uh, transforming the nature of the test as a limit to discretion into this open norm uh, type uh, thing that, as I just uh, alluded to, um, with uh, an innate uh, right holder bias, uh, uh, even you could say. Uh, and that would then substantially increase uh, legal uncertainty. So instead, national courts must treat um, the three-step test for what it is, that is a limit to member state discretion, nothing more. And I say this in full awareness that they have not done so in the past. So this is maybe a push for a sort of a, 
uh, recalibration uh, of, of uh, the nature of the test. Um, and this means then that when they're in doubt as to whether national law exceeds the limit of the test, uh, a national court may, uh, in some cases, must refer questions uh, to the Court of Justice. And I think on, uh, on its part, the, co the Court of Justice should lay down a clear, what I would call standard of review, uh, permitting national courts to evaluate whether they should submit any reference. Now, what that standard of review should then look like, well, that is, um, yeah, that's the million, million euro, million dollar question. All right, thank you. I see you out of time. <laughs> Thanks so much. Uh, that was uh, extremely insightful. So just uh, to understand uh, a bit, uh, um, a bit further, you uh, are suggesting uh, that the primary addresses of the three-step test at the EU level are member states and not also national courts. So that when a court has a doubt, uh, should make a, a, a referral regarding the compatibility of that national law with EU law. Uh, do I understand it correctly? Yeah, if we're talking in, in terms of, of addressees, uh, I would say exactly exactly that. Uh, of course, national courts must interpret national law uh, in accordance with the three-step test insofar as possible. And so in that, ex to that, um, in that sense, they are also the addressee, but uh, the primary addressee is the legislature. Thanks so much for uh, the clarification. So I think that now it is time to open the uh, Q&A uh, part of uh, this session. I invite uh, all participants uh, to uh, raise uh, their comments and ask their questions by using the Q&A function. There is uh, already an interesting question that has been uh, asked and it is uh, addressed, uh, unlike the three-step test, at all panelists. And uh, it is uh, about the best options uh, that uh, can be uh, envisaged. And here I think uh, also at the level of national transpositions uh, of Article 17 uh, to ensure the possibility that users assert uh, the exceptions and limitations uh, that uh, they will be enjoying uh, under the provision. So what do you think should be the correct approach to the transposition of this part of Article 17? Anyone who wants to pick that, uh, that question? Well, I just can say briefly that in my view, this is mainly as, uh, as Bill, uh, was, uh, Bill was making this point, is mainly a, a procedural issue. So who has the burden of proof in a, in a copyright infringing cases? in the copyright infringement cases uh, concerning um, uh, right and uh, and uh, and an exception so i'm not sure this is something that can be part of um, um, of the legislation one one thing could could could, could possibly to yes to um, to make clear that uh, um, in the in the wording of the legislation that uh, um, a particular exception is uh, um, is a user right and so that uh, uh, this right could be potentially enforceable towards uh, third parties towards uh, uh, right holders and any third parties that uh, um, makes uh, the exercise of the uh, of the exception uh, impossible so um, but i think it's mainly a procedural I issue because uh, in, in practice, there are very, very few examples of, of uh, cases where um, uh, the issue of user right has been has been actually uh, discussed in courts as an, uh, uh, a, a case brought by. I think there is there is a private copy case. Stavrula knows more about this in France about anti copying devices that uh, were not allowing the making of private copies and and uh, a few others. Um, of these cases, but not is not a, a, a thing something that has, has been frequently litigated. Please, please, yes. 
uh, both in France and Belgium in the context of the private coping exception. And in both cases, it has been held that um, the exception cannot be used as a positive right in this sense. Uh, of course, I understand that the question now is about uh, out of court uh, dispute um, uh, cases. So um, it remains to be seen how the uh, the law is going to be shaped in this direction. Uh, clearly, uh, th there is a lot uh, uh, of uh, indication at the moment that we are moving towards a stronger uh, copyright exceptions, uh, but it is uh, to be seen. It, these are early days still uh, in European Union copyright law, and uh, the, the interpretation will evolve organically uh, with case law, I think. Thank you. But just uh, to be clear, if in uh, complying with its Article 17 obligation, a platform newly locks uh, an upload that instead should have been uh, gone through, there is you know, the, um, a dispute uh, mechanism that can be relied upon. And uh, let's assume that this lawful upload is not reinstated. So uh, there will be a case uh, to be raised against the platform. Uh, or do you think that it might go as far as uh, also targeting the right holder because uh, the platform complied with these obligations uh, to make sure that right holders copyrights will be protected. So how do you see this uh, playing out in practice? Uh, see, Alain, you have unmuted yourself. I don't know whether you wanted to, to make a comment. Eh? I think it's a bit early to respond to that. We, we shall see how member states uh, under Article 17.9 uh, put in place their effective and expeditious uh, complaint and redress mechanism and how it works. Uh, but I, I think that if users have a real problem, they should probably start with a complaint before that future redress mechanism and then uh, or in parallel uh, suit the platforms and the right orders if they think uh, their rights might be uh, infringed but uh, i don't think it will be an easy way uh, and the relation between uh, this redress mechanism and the judicial system uh, remains to be i think thought and and, uh, and experimented so i think it's difficult to respond to that question now Thank you. There is a, another question asking about the role of exceptions and whether the panelists think that exceptions and limitations can be used as a basis to push back against the expansive interpretation of economic rights, including the right of communication to the public. Well, I wouldn't comment about EU law, but the question sort of assumes a number of things that you don't have to assume. <laughs> it assumes that there is a problem and that the way to deal with the problem is to treat exceptions and limitations in a different way. Right? I think that's the supposition of the problem. If you view the law more holistically, <laughs> as something that is contextual, that seeks to achieve certain goals, recognizes that there can be conflicting interests, and then attempts in a factual way to figure out where the best balance is, you wouldn't worry about the sort of war metaphor. <laughs> you, know, um, you would an analyze things about whether in this particular case, uh, it makes sense to do this or that. Uh, this was always the debate in the United States, for example, between Justice O'Connor and Justice Scalia. Scalia was regarded as an ideologue, as someone who was rigid, who had you know sharp elbows, and Justice O'Connor was somebody who wasn't interested in ideological battles, but rather was interested in doing right in that particular case. That's fine for us because of our common law system, perhaps. But it's also a way of looking at the world that's different. Um, but you need to have the flexibility in your legal system to do that. 
So what I would say, and this ties into what I was trying to get at in my presentation, is that you want to give courts and you want to give legislatures the flexibility to do right. You don't want to tie them beforehand so that they can't do right. If they had that flexibility, the sort of push and pull and fight and stuff wouldn't be as exacerbated, I think. This is leaving aside, of course, that people like to have ideological battles because, you know, it makes them feel well about themselves. <laughs> but if you're not going to be an ideologue and you just want to do right, then give people the flexibility to do right. Um, we have that in fair use. Um, the, the other part of it too is that I didn't mention is that our statute is really not regarded as being the be all end all of what courts can do. You know, it's entirely possible for courts to come up with other sort of ways of dealing with things. So in terms of user rights, misuse, um, we have something called a misuse defense. If a copyright owner is abusing their copyright for non-copyright goals, you know, we, we have a misuse doctrine that can be applied. So that's how I would deal with it. I, I would look at the problem as a whole and on a on a case by case basis. Thank you, Bill. Uh, another question is asking about the interplay between uh, copyright enforcement and data protection. This is something uh, that uh, is uh, addressed uh, also in legislation. Article 17 and the DSM directive uh, contain express references in this sense. And it is also something that has come up uh, in a case law of the Court of Justice. So I would like to ask uh, uh, any of the speakers uh, what they think about this. Uh, and also the role that technology can play in enforcement. And I think that this also links to what Stavrula was mentioning earlier on about a contractual override that might make it more difficult or, or impossible even to enjoy an exceptional limitation. So your views are welcome on, on these points. Perhaps, Stavrula, you want to, to pick this uh, question from uh, Valentina? Uh, yes, uh, well, uh, in ter there is a lot uh, of work uh, currently happening in terms of technological uses of works that uh, uh, might have uh, might, might be infringing uh, or might be having some impact uh, both on copyright and data protection. Uh, at the same time, uh, in terms of a balancing test uh, between data protection and uh, privacy, um, uh, I, I can I think it is too early days uh, still uh, to. Um, have a, a concrete view uh, on the position that will be taken. And I think that this will be, again, very fact specific because technologies um, uh, vary and the way in which they impact on copyright and data protection as well vary. Thank you. Um, there is a, a, another question uh, regarding the implementation of Article 17. Eh? Um, which asks about the possibility to translate the use of content by user generated content platforms and their users into a new exception. I guess that the person who is asking this question is uh, thinking about uh, the possibility of a user generated content exception, which if I remember correctly, was flagged as an option for some time, eventually did not translate to any concrete proposals, but what is your take on these views? Well, I, I will say just a couple of things also, um, referring to the previous question about the role of, um, of exceptions in limiting the economic rights. I think that uh, we, we need to consider that the European system works differently than the American system in the sense that uh, exceptions do not work in the same way as fair use works, not just because of the flexibility, etc., but because, uh, um, for example, if you compare the communication to the public, the, the hyperlink cases in Europe and the very, fact, uh, very similar cases uh, in the US, well, in the US, they go with fair use. So it's whether it is a prima facie infringement and then uh, there is the fair use defense. 
Whereas in Europe, they are treated differently. They are treated as an internal limitation of the communication to the public right. So whether the, um, the act is a communication to the public or not. So there is not an exception uh, to, to, um, to, to this effect. So the, the, the logic is, is, is different. Which one is better? I don't know. This we, is something we can discuss with, uh, with Bill. Um, on, on this uh, uh, question, sorry, what was the, the last question about? On, uh, on uh, uh, having a, a UGC exception. Oh yeah, the UGC, yes. Yeah, the, the, I think, well, it's the same, the same approach. The UGC exception, again, is, uh, is something that uh, is this attempt to approximate the, the EU system of exceptions to, um, to, the fair, to a sort of fair use like uh, um, system. I think I and is is uh, is one of the example of the of the um, of the exceptions that are of course meant to 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 facilitate uh, um, existing business models of of internet platforms. So they they that that consist in in uh, in extracting value from 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 user generated content. So. Um, I, I, and I don't think that this uh, would fit well into the uh, into the current uh, uh, framework of uh, um, of EU uh, copyright exceptions, as um, inspired by reference to fundamental rights. But Eleanor, can I ask um, Rizzo a question? Because he made a great point. Um, so, in the US, for example. It's really a procedural issue, right? We used to have a right of uh, public performance, but the right was limited to for profit. So you had the right of public performance for profit. The copyright owner had the burden of proving that the performance was a performance, a public performance, and that it was for profit. If you showed that, then the exceptions came into play and the person claiming the exception had the burden of proving that the exception existed. I thought that, and so, you know, we, we had both a limitation on the right itself. <laughs> and then once you satisfied that as a copyright owner, the other party had the burden of proving that they were entitled to say fair use, right? I would have thought, for example, if someone's claiming, um, that there is a reproduction right violated because you quoted my work. Um, you show that the person copied it, you show that they quoted it, but the person claiming the quotation defense or right, whatever you want to call it, would then say, ah, yes, you made a prima facie case, but nevertheless, I get off the hook because I, you know, quoted for the right reasons. If that's the way it works, and it's actually the same way it works in the US too. It's not, a, it's not a limitation on the right itself. It's merely, you know, a, a burden shifting thing. Am I right about that or wrong? Um, yes, I, I need to think about it. Uh, yes, you, you, but the, 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 it seems to me that uh, specifically with communication to the public, the, the logic is, uh, is a bit different in the way uh, the EU law, EU law works. Um, because if you compare the, the hyperlinking cases, um, if, I, if I'm not wrong, in, in the US, they were decided on a, on a, based on a fair use analysis. Okay, so- Well, the, the other uh, thing is, is that we have a difference in secondary liability and primary liability. That's mm -hmm. another large difference between our systems. So we would treat hyperlinks as under secondary liability, but I think you would treat them as direct liability. No, but I think, for example, the the um, um, perfect ten and this uh, this line of cases, the first uh, uh, technological fair use cases. Okay, to, yes, to, yes. to be brief. So the reason the reason for that is this: that to be secondarily liable, there has to be a primary infringer. <laughs> if there's no primary infringer, you can't be secondarily liable. So that's why the court would look at what the primary infringer did and see whether it's fair use. That happened in our Sony Baymax case, of course. Sony didn't itself copy those movies. 
It was the individuals who bought the Sony. So fair use was an issue in the Sony case only because to prove Sony was secondarily liable by selling those machines, they had to prove that the consumers were infringing. If what the consumers did was fair use, then Sony got off the hook for secondary liability. But that's the reason it's treated that way with fair use. Thank you very much. Uh, Alain, I don't know whether you want to add anything. Oh, maybe, uh, I mean, to the last question that was raised, I think it's impossible with the existing framework to introduce, you know, uh, to consider that there is a, a, an exception for user generated content and I'm that we could have the, uh, a system a system of fair remuneration associated with, with it. I think that's uh, no more possible. Uh, but, but to come back on the discussion uh, we had on flexibility, I think the exceptions are not very flexible in uh, Europe, although th there, there is still some, some way to, to apply the, in, in different cases. But there is, I think, still quite a lot of flexibility in the scope of, of the rights. And I think the Court of Justice has shown how it could apply to communication to the public uh, in, in different sets of, of facts. Uh, it, it, it appears not as flexible for the reproduction right, but I think uh, there is more room that we might think there. So I would tackle the issue uh, through a, a discussion, that is what I, I try to do, uh, to a discussion about uh, the rights. And, and we see that for communication to the public, for instance, the intention to reach a certain public is important, including in uh, the hyperlinking case. And that leaves, I think, quite room for flexibility in the application of the right. So I, I, I would try to find more flexibility on that side in Europe. Thanks so much uh, to all the panelists. Uh, we have reached the an end of this uh, Q&A session. We will now be taking a 10 minute break. So we will be back uh, at uh, 10 past three to discuss uh, enforcement aspects. So thanks uh, to all the speakers and see you soon. Welcome back uh, everyone. Uh, thanks uh, for uh, taking part in today's conference. Uh, we have uh, reviewed already many issues in copyright law, uh, but there are still many more to come. And it is now high time to look at enforcement aspects, in particular focusing on uh, technological enforcement tools and uh, cross-border issues that arise, especially when the enforcement uh, concerns uh, online infringing activities. It is uh, my great pleasure to start this session by welcoming uh, Jan uh, Bernordeman uh, to discuss uh, website blocking, a topic that has grown in relevance over the past few years and uh, also has uh, changed the shape to uh, accommodate uh, changing uh, technology and infringing modalities. Jan, thanks for being with us. The floor is yours. Thank you so much, Eleonora, and uh, also thank you so much for inviting me. I'm quite humbled uh, uh, to uh, to be here and speak of uh, in front of so many, uh, at least digital uh, spectators. Yeah, the uh, as you mentioned already, Eleonora, the uh, the topic for today or my topic for today is website blocking under EU copyright law, and that's of course also the title of my little contribution for, for the handbook. Um, as you may all be aware, the internet is a blessing, but it can also be a curse sometimes. Uh, one of the curses of the internet is of course that uh, copyrighted content may be infringed easily and also very easily disseminated uh, fast to the entire world. Uh, all content areas are affected, films, music, games, eBooks, uh, scientific articles. And I'm quite sure, Eleonora, that the Rootledge Handbook will also be out illegally on the internet in a, few, in, a, in, in a few days time. I've already seen in the in in the, in the blog that uh, 
or in the chat that it's offered legitimately uh, for sale uh, for not even uh, 30 pounds. Um, but well, nevertheless, it's, I'm sure it will be available illegally on the internet. Um, there are sites out there that you call structurally copyright infringing websites, which are specialized on all content areas. And there are also sites out there that uh, specialize on academic publications, but also, as I said, on films, games, music, uh, you name it. One of the best known examples is the Pirate Bay. Uh, uh, who uh, actually made it even to the uh, CJU, although not as a party, but at least as an object of litigation. Uh, the CJU held that the Pirate Bay, uh, although they only facilitate uh, copyright um, infringements through users of the BitTorrent network, would directly infringe Article 3.1 of the Introsoc Directive. This decision was um, also mentioned earlier today already in, uh, in the conference. Uh, so what do you do against co uh, structurally copyright infringing websites? Um, actually, the operators, of course, stay unknown because they run illegal copyright business models. They never take a license. Uh, they, uh, uh, they commit criminal offenses under the respective copyright laws. So as an operator, I would also say to choose anonymous. So there's no way of going after the operators. The technical uh, service providers are also chosen carefully by, by the operators. Uh, uh, either they are in remote places where it is difficult to enforce uh, EU copyright law, examples like the Seychelles, or uh, East Ukraine, uh, where they have other problems at the moment, uh, you know, it's, it, it's part of my practice. And, uh, uh, or, you know, if they, if you get them to comply, these, uh, for example, the hosting providers of these sites, they are easily uh, exchangeable and they will be exchanged within minutes. Yeah, so there's no way really of going directly to the source and stopping the infringement there. Uh, but of course, as a right holder, you do not want to give up there. Uh, so you ask yourself, what else can you do? And, and the answer is ask the access providers to implement website blocks against these structurally copyright infringing websites which run an illegal business model under copyright law. Uh, this is a bit, I would always compare it with asking the truck driver um, to stop uh, importing uh, copyright infringing goods at the border. So it works on a very national level uh, where you ask your national access providers to block certain websites. The most common technical tool uh, to do this are DNS blocks, DNS blocks, uh, where the DNS server you use as an internet user can no longer match the domain name which you entered into your browser with the IP address of uh, the structurally copyright infringing site. These DNS blocks are pretty efficient. Empirical data says that uh, visits drop by 70%, traffic drops by 70% within three months, which is, as these DNS blocks are quite cheap to implement, uh, is, is, is a pretty good efficacy. Uh, so what is the legal basis, of course, we ask ourselves as lawyers. Uh, the legal basis is Article 8.3, the famous Article 8.3 of the InfoSoc Directive 2001-29, which says that right holders can apply for injunctions against intermediaries whose services are used to infringe copyright or related rights as well. Uh, the rationale behind this is kind of interesting, I think. Um, it is not that the access providers would have done anything wrong. Yeah, they have nothing to do with these uh, sites or business models. They, uh, they can be subject to injunction uh, uh, um, orders because 
they are in a good position to help. So they have helping duties. Uh, and of course, this only involves injunction claims and not damage claims. Uh, Martin Husovich has, uh, has called this uh, accountability without liability. And I think that says it all. So it's, they've done nothing wrong, but still they have to help. Uh, this helping duties, of course, bring in the fundamental rights of all actors involved. Um, uh, helping duties must be proportionate for everybody uh, affected, uh, must be proportionate for the right holders um, uh, under their fundamental right of intellectual property, but also for the access providers under their constitutional right of freedom to conduct the business. And the internet users are also on board with their fundamental right to uh, inform, uh, freedom to information. And you have to balance these uh, different in interests, which is done, for example, in the leading CJU case on website blocking, uh, UPC Telecable, uh, which was decided a few years ago. And just to give you one example on how that works with balancing of fundamental rights, is, is, is an evergreen subject uh, when it comes to website blocking. This is overblocking, overblocking of legal content because DNS blocks, for example, they block the entire site and they also block away legal content that may be on the site. So when, when is a, a, a website block proportionate? Uh, there's nothing clear yet from the CJU, but for example, from the German, uh, federal Supreme Court that said uh, illegal content must be de minimis, uh, must be so small that it's proportionate to, to block it in relation to the illegal stuff that is out there. And the rule of thumb would be probably 90% illegal, 10% uh, or less uh, legal would probably be fine and proportionate to block such a site. Um, so if you ask me for the outlook to come to the end of my little presentation, uh, I think Article 8.3 is a great tool. Yeah, uh, it works without liability and without, you know, blaming anybody uh, to have done anything wrong. Uh, obviously, intermediaries like access providers who are in a good position to help must help if this is proportionate. Um, and sometimes this helping duty, as I've, as I've shown you for, uh, for structurally copyright infringing sites, it is the only way to help even uh, to avoid copyright infringements. So Article 8.3 for website blocking has really um, worked very well. Uh, Denmark started to block websites almost 15 years ago uh, on the basis of Article 8.3. And uh, since then, more than half of the EU countries, for example, block the Pirate Bay. So it's kind of outspread in the EU. It's also uh, served as a precedent for other jurisdictions outside uh, the EU, for example, Australia, Singapore, India, at least to a certain extent. Uh, so it is kind of a role model, Article 8.3, in particular for site blocking. I think also site blocking is a must for copyright regimes like in the EU, which want to keep their local, uh, the, the, sorry, their, which want to keep their level of protection and not, uh, don't want to be caught into a race to the bottom. Uh, without site blank blocking, likely copyright enforcement uh, would have to be at the level of the Seychelles or uh, at the level of the East Ukraines. Uh, if you allow me without, uh, you know, without insulting these company, uh, the, these countries to name them as examples. Site blocking, if you want to put it like that, helps to renationalize copyright enforcement on the internet and to keep uh, copyright enforcement within the borders of the EU. So my outlook would be, do not touch Article 8.3. It shines beyond Europe and uh, it is necessary to keep our copyright sovereignty. Uh, thank you. <laughs> Thanks so much, Jan. That was uh, very insightful. We shall return 
uh, on this topic uh, also later on uh, to ask you after painting uh, such a rosy picture whether you think uh, that uh, some changes are needed. Let's now continue our discussion uh, by engaging uh, Sebastian, uh, who has been uh, working uh, really at uh, the cross uh, between uh, IP and IT law. He has, uh, you know, a uh, uh, very um, an excellent background, uh, also from a technological standpoint. Uh, so we want to know more about uh, these types of orders uh, and hear your perspective on those, uh, Sebastian. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Elnora, for the kind introduction. I hope I can live up to that promise. I'm not so sure. I hope you can hear me well. Um, I uh, am here to tell you a little about the state of play and future direction regarding copyright content moderation. And bear in mind, we always talk about platforms, content moderation at platforms. And I want to shed a little light on copyright content moderation at non-content layers. So looking at the infrastructure and technical service providers. As a background, I should briefly disclose that I was involved in the preparatory works to the Digital Services Act. I'm main author of one of the background studies uh, on the role of non-hosting intermediaries. I'm gonna touch on the DSA, so just that as a background. Um, and well, what can we say? So when we look at the role of intermediaries broadly, traditionally platforms and internet access service providers have been primarily in the focus. However, not completely off the radar are other um, intermediaries that might be of interest in this respect also uh, continuing on a, where, where Jan just uh, gave an introduction to website blocking. To briefly kind of give you a framework for that, uh, maybe it's helpful to think in different layers of regulation. Um, so there's a legislative framework in form of liability rules, uh, copyright, et cetera. The available injunctions uh, that Jan has just um, uh, been into and the liability exemptions and their conditions, for example, the notice and action regime we know from hosting and from platforms. And this is, I think, kind of the basic room for operations on how uh, illegal content is enforced on the Internet. This, however, is complemented by a second strain of more or less binding rules, uh, industry self-regulation, as well as regulation on the corporate level, for example, through terms and conditions uh, or terms of services. Now, when we look at the DNS, where, which I focus on in, in my chapter, the DNS, basically, it's a distributed database and turns the numeric IP addresses, really hard to remember for us, into user-friendly domain names. Uh, so it's a road sign of the internet. And in this, there's a variety of functions and service providers involved, registries, um, uh, but also DNS resolvers, where there has been a huge development in the market uh, over recent years. In the DNS landscape, um, it's important to remember that there is, in fact, no information or the information we're interested in is not transmitted. This is really merely a road sign showing you where to look. Uh, nonetheless, in the DNS landscape, um, measures on interfering with information have been discussed under mostly the lens of technical abuse. So basically responding to cybersecurity threats, for example, distributed denial of service attacks, or also historically as combating spam, email spam. Um, if we look at copyright, there are IP rights more broadly. There are, of course, established mechanisms relating to domain names as such. Uh, the ICANN's Uniform Dispute Resolution Policy, UDRP, as one example. Um, but when we look at what we're interested in here, the content and the relation of a domain name to that content, the picture is a little more complex. As Jan just uh, mentioned, this is a really appealing um, place to adjust and to enforce content, but it's also highly problematic uh, at the infrastructure level. I have argued elsewhere that um, DNS uh, in, uh, engaging in DNS blocking is in a way a toothless tiger, because on the one hand, it makes it really hard to access, but doesn't make it impossible to access, and the illegal information will still be available on a server somewhere. In my, in my uh, contribution, I briefly explore um, this idea of uh, drawing parallels between domain names and the DNS as a case of linking, and I won't go, in, go into that here. Instead, let me focus on the relation of the liability exemptions. And the liability exemptions, the e-commerce directive, most notably Article 12 and 13 on mere conduit and caching, could become relevant in this context. As a matter of fact, we don't have any clarification on this. 
Um, uh, there has been, of course, the SMB React case before the Court of Justice, notably issued without an opinion of the Advocate General, um, which has been interpreted by some as uh, addressing uh, red domain registrars. As a matter of fact, as I understand the case and the, um, the Estonian case uh, that it stems from, it's really regarding the provider of an IP address rental service and a registration service that allows domain names to be used anonymously. In any case, the Court of Justice says basically, well, if these intermediaries fulfill the criteria, the conditions for being considered in quotation marks as an e-commerce directive mere conduit, uh, uh, caching or hosting functions, then they can benefit from the liability exemption, however, without really providing us much more uh, details. Also, content delivery networks are more and more of interest in copyright enforcement. Um, and they have a relation to the DNS because the DNS is basically used as a hack to distribute requests by users to the nearest, uh, to the nearest server. In Germany and in Italy, uh, Cloudflare, one of the biggest uh, content delivery networks relied on by very many websites, both legal and uh, some illegal, um, uh, has been subject to uh, preliminary injunction cases where the role of uh, these uh, providers in also relation to the liability exemptions was uh, analyzed somehow. But long story short, it's kind of difficult to grasp where they really fall into. And why is this important? I think this is important because the liability exemptions are part of defining the role that an internet intermediary takes in enforcing online content. This becomes a little more um, uh, apparent, I think, if we turn towards voluntary arrangements at these layers. Um, trusted notifiers, which I'm sure many of you know, the European Commission defines as an individual or an entity which is considered to have particular expertise and responsibilities when taking illegal content. And is based on the assumption that notices by these parties will lead to higher quality notices and faster takedowns. Interestingly, of course, this is something that comes from the traditional notice and takedown regime, which we know from hosting, from platforms. Nonetheless, um, you see emerging similar arrangements at the non-content, non-hosting uh, or the infrastructure layer. There are several examples of generic top-level domain registries or country code top level domain registries, as well as the CDN uh, provider Cloudflare that have uh, a trusted notifier program, for example, with the Recording Industry Association of America. The risk, of course, with this, I've argued this elsewhere, with these trusted notifier arrangements is, is there a risk of rubber stamping? Um, it all depends on the quality of these notices. And of course, bear in mind, this is a voluntary notice and takedown regime induced at a layer where the law wouldn't require a notice and action mechanism. And we're not talking about injunctions, we're talking about the other part. Now, briefly to conclude, um, in my uh, paper, I suggest, well, first of all, there's a good reason for why the infrastructure layer is not so topical in copyright enforcement, and maybe it should stay that way. At the same time, however, we see that there are emerging trends and needs, um, but there's also some questions to be answered. The Digital Services Act addresses some of these actors um, uh, uh, of this location layer in a recital, however, without really clarifying whether they fall under mere conduit caching or hosting. The importance comes here. The Digital Services Act also proposes to introduce certain due diligence obligations on these service providers. They include, for example, transparency in terms of terms and conditions. What kind of practices exist? How do they work? In the field of platforms and online hosting um, redress mechanisms, and similar. And I wonder whether the Digital Services Act wouldn't be the right place then also to take a broader look um, at the non-hosting landscape and at least for those actors that voluntarily engage in these things that resemble content moderation and resemble the moderation by hosting platforms or uh, other hosting service providers uh, also should apply to these non-hosting actors. Um, this is, I think my time is up. So this is all I had to uh, contribute for now. I look very much forward to the discussion. I hope you read my chapter and I look forward to the rest of this event. Thanks so much, Sebastian. Uh, I think that uh, you did an excellent job at uh, outlining also that the DSA does matter for copyright as well, even if uh, 
formally it is stated that it is without prejudice to the legislative framework in the copyright field. Actually, it is a piece of, uh, of legislation that will come into force and will have a significant effect on shaping copyright enforcement, but also the application of some provisions such as uh, Article 17 of the DSM Directive itself. So I look forward to uh, discussing this further in the Q&A part. Uh, thanks so much uh, for uh, uh, your uh, um, talk. Uh, let's now move on uh, to the enforcement in court of uh, copyright claims. Uh, we are very happy to have uh, an expert in uh, private international law, Lydia, uh, with us today. Uh, so Lydia, the floor is yours uh, to guide us uh, through the very uh, difficult and obscure at times uh, treatment of jurisdiction in uh, cross-border disputes. Thank you, Lydia. Thank you very much, Eleonora, and thank you very much also for inviting me to participate in this book project. It's been really interesting and an honor to me among these great scholars. I've been listening today and I've learned a lot, how much I don't know. But um, the chapter of my book, or my uh, chapter is entitled Jurisdiction and Ch Choice of Law in Online Copyright Cases. And in the chapter, I describe the European rules on jurisdiction and choice of law and how they've been interpreted by the Court of Justice with respect to online copyright cases and whether these interpretations fulfill the objectives of private international law. If I begin by describing the state of play with regard to jurisdiction, as many of you know, under the Brussels 1A regulation, um, a defendant domiciled in a member state can be sued in its member state of domicile. However, in, a, in addition, there are some special rules on jurisdiction, which give the plaintiff an option. And what's interesting here is Article 7.2, which allows a defendant to be sued with, with regard to matters relating to torts in the member state at the place where the harmful event occurred. And the Court of Justice has interpreted this rule to mean either where the event giving rise to the damage occurred or where the damage occurs. So the first jurisdictional issue that arises when con uh, copyright content is exploited on the internet is of course, where does the damage occur when the content is accessible in all the member states? And the court of justice has uh, applied an accessibility approach. It's held that the damage arises or occurs in every member state where the copyright is protected and in whose territory the content is accessible, for example, being accessible on an internet web page. And the court reasoned that copyright, like national trademarks, is subject to the principle of territoriality. And this means that a copyright in a work can, is capable of being infringed in every member state in accordance with the applicable copyright law in that member state. And therefore, the each of those member states is best placed to rule on copyright infringements taking place within its own territory. Now this accessibility approach has been criticized because it leads to, of course, every member state being competent to rule on copyright. So it could be hard for a defendant to foresee in which member state it could be sued. And it also gives the plaintiff a wide scope for form shopping. A second jurisdictional issue that arises when it comes to copyright infringement on the internet is the question of extraterritorial infringement, extraterritorial, extraterritorial jurisdiction, excuse me. Obviously, if copyright is ex exploited on the internet, it has the potential to infringe in every member state and every country around the world. And of course, a right holder would be interested in obtaining global relief before one court. Now, as you know, the Brussels 1A regulation does not have any subject matter limitations with, with regard to copyright. So this means, of course, that a defendant could be sued at the defendant's domicile and the court could award relief for the whole world. However, what's interesting is the Court of Justice has held that in addition to that, or as an alternative, one could also bring the case where in the member state where the harmful act occurred. That is where the harmful act occurred that leads to copyright infringements taking place in other countries. 
Now, this basis of jurisdiction has long been doubted because of the principle of territoriality, which of course states that it's not possible for an infringing act in one country to give rise to damage in another country. But that's a principle of substantive intellectual property law. When it comes to localizing the harmful act for the purpose of jurisdiction, the court of justice is looking at the sound administration of justice with respect to the ease of gathering evidence. Moving on to the state of play with regard to choice of law, the applicable choice of law rule is in Article 8.1 of the Rome II regulation on non-contractual obligations, and it leads to the law of the country for which protection is claimed, lex protectionis. Now, the Court of Justice has not yet had the opportunity to interpret exactly what this com concept means, but it's understood to refer or to be a subjective connecting factor that allows the plaintiff a, a great deal of freedom to choose the applicable law by the way it formulates its claim. Under the Lex Protectionist rule, there's no minimum uh, connection that's required for the law to be applicable. This minimum connection occurs on the level of substantive law. The Court of Justice has ruled when interpreting substantive intellectual property law that in order for a member state to localize an act of infringement within its territory, the web page must have targeted that member state. Now the Lex Loci Protectionist rule can give rise to difficulties if a right holder should claim protection for the territory of a third state that claims a wide scope of protection. For example, if the third state should um, claim protection under its copyright law based on the mere accessibility of a website within its territory. And in the most extreme cases, one might have to resort to order public. Lastly, an important issue, of course, with, with regard to copyright infringement on the internet is the question of ubiquitous infringements. Of course, content on, the web page, on a web page has the possibility to infringe in every country. And the Lex Protectionist rule could lead to the application of a multitude of copyright laws on a distributed basis. Under Article 8, the parties are not allowed to choose the applicable law there's no escape clause, and there's no single law solution built into Article 8. So one question that remains for the future is whether the EU uh, legislator or even the Court of Justice will try to step in and solve this. I think I'll stop here, and I look forward to discussing this further on future directions later on in the day. Thank you. Thanks so much, uh, Lydia. Uh, the picture that you've painted uh, is a, a complex one. Uh, and indeed, uh, it seems that many question marks uh, remain outstanding. Uh, the DSA, from a different perspective, uh, seems to be embracing uh, a targeting approach. Uh, so the question that uh, I would like to ask you is uh, whether you think that targeting uh, is uh, a um, kind of panacea to solve uh, uh, jurisdiction problems, uh, or do you see any issues connected with that? Mm -hmm. Um, I think the targeting approach might be a good idea to solve jurisdictional issues. Um, one thing I've seen is the uh, accessibility approach has been criticized widely, and many advocate generals have suggested eliminating it altogether, which might make sense for other kind of torts on the internet, such as personality rights, which the Court of Justice has now introduced center of interests. So for those torts, we don't need, you know, the damage head of jurisdiction. But for IP, I still think as long as we have you know, protection on a territorial basis, it's, a, it's important to have the damage head of jurisdiction. But to make it more foreseeable for users, for you know, people who are using copyrighted works, I think it might be a good idea to have some kind of targeting approach. Thank you so much. We shall return on the, the topic of the DSA because uh, uh, indeed, uh, as uh, uh, highlighted by you all, uh, it is clear that this forthcoming piece of EU legislation will be of great relevance also to copyright application and enforcement. Uh, but we, before we do that, we are very happy to have Giancarlo Prosio with us. 
uh, is an expert in uh, all things uh, online uh, copyright and uh, uh, for us today he will be exploring the possibility of global enforcement of copyright as a territorial right. Giancarlo, thanks uh, for uh, participating. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Eleonora. And apologies to everybody if I'm not here for the entire conference, but I'm teaching on a, on a master this uh, very same time. So, but I wanted to be here to celebrate this great achievement and great book and, and, and offer my, my, my view here. So my chapter is discussing enforcement of European rights on a global scale. So here the point is that the global extraterritorial enforcement of miscellaneous rights, not only IP rights or copyright, has emerged as a consistent trend in recent online regulation, both at international and EU level. Now, extraterritorial enforcement will refer to the uh, exercise of jurisdiction by a state over activities or occurring outside its borders. In particular, then global enforcement would imply that an act of enforcement by one jurisdiction has effects on all jurisdictions worldwide. On the internet, global enforcement applies to generic top level do domain such as .com rather than regional or uh, uh, um, country code top level uh, domains such as .eu, .it, .press. So in practice, a French court or administrative authority ordering uh, to enforce the rights on .com rather than on, on .france will be presumptively issuing an extraterritorial global enforcement order. Now this type of enforcement has become increasingly relevant in the context of online intermediaries obligation. So a major question that looms over the internet today is, is whether it is enough to enforce allegedly infringing content in a geographically segmented way, or whether global difference, uh, differencing, blocking, and, and, and takedown orders are needed uh, to fully guarantee the rights of injured parties. Now, actually, there is an increasing number of cases against intermediaries to remove a block or the list content globally. Uh, this is also nothing new under the sun as global enforcement and the conflicts that the global enforcement brought about started about 20 years ago with LICRA versus Yahoo, with Yahoo being ordered by, at that point, a French court to block third party selling Nazi memorabilia on its platform worldwide. The, first, the French court claimed universal competence and shortly thereafter, a, a California district court uh, granted Yahoo uh, request and declared that enforcement of the French decision would have infringed on the First Amendment. Then, although the Ninth Circuit reversed that decision, meanwhile, uh, Yahoo adopted a new policy prohibiting auction of items and classified advertisement. The conflict uh, became moot uh, and, uh, and the conflict on law, the question became moot and the conflict uh, of law put at rest. However, recently, what I say, uh, a kraken, the kraken that can break the internet has, has awoken again. And global enforcement have been re-emerging everywhere, starting from the Aegis Tech uh, uh, versus Google case in Canada, with Google being ordered by a Canadian, so the Canadian Supreme Court here to the list worldwide a website infringing Aegis Tech IP rights in Canada. And then Google, like in the LICRA case, obtaining a temporary injunction, uh, blocking enforcement of the Canadian Supreme, Canadian Supreme Court order by a district court of North Carolina in, 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 in San Jose, actually a few kilometers away from Google's headquarters. And then finally, when Google returned back to the British uh, Columbia uh, judiciary, seeking modification of the order and the global injunction in light of the US decision, the Supreme Court of British Columbia uh, uh, refused the modification with more complexity than now we have no time to get it. Similar decisions have been issued by more courts in Canada, by courts in Australia, Hong Kong, India, and the United States, although there, this decision has been reversed later on First Amendment uh, uh, grounds. Um, and then this debate then has been reaching the uh, EU uh, uh, recently as well. In two decisions, Google versus uh, CNIL and uh, uh, Glassdoor versus Facebook, and, and, and these cases dealt respectively with the global delisting of search entries infringing the right to be forgotten, sought by the French private authority against Google, and the global takedown of defamatory uh, post uh, sought by an Austrian politician against Facebook. In sum, here, the Court of Justice concluded that EU law does not impose or preclude worldwide measures. Instead, it is up to national court to decide whether extraterritorial delisting should be imposed according to their own balancing of fundamental rights and application of international norms, including comedy, which in turn 
means that global orders can be enforced by EU national courts if the necessary requirements are in place. So global, global enforcement is potentially well alive in EU member states. Also, setting the question of territoriality outside the scope of EU law probably runs counter to the goal of harmonization that often the Court of Justice endorsed with full force. And the Court of Justice approach in this case might show multiple inconsistent standards at national level that might multiply according to the subject matter to be uh, enforced. There is the potential here for different results based on whether the request are reside, which could also lead to forum shopping, both for the injured parties and platforms that instead might like to establish themselves where no global enforcement is allowed. To conclude, what to do to limit conflict and promoting international uh, coexistence? So, uh, of course, the concerns here are very real that such a global extraterritorial effect allows certain jurisdiction to erase information they perceive as irrelevant or illegitimate based on their own set of values, while promoting one culture's value over uh, other cultures' value. But also, on the other side, national courts must uh, provide redress to the infringement of their citizens' rights, if that is the case under their balancing of rights, constitutional balancing of rights. So, uh, the conclusion could be here in very general terms that uh, the power to issue extraterritorial, extraterritorial injunction must be exercised cautiously, and such injunctions should be granted only as a last resort. However, while global scope of jurisdiction cannot be the default approach, um, it is necessary in some circumstances. Now, last 30 seconds, I hope to be able to tell you to, to lay down a number of principles. In order to decide when, so first, the scope of jurisdiction should be context dependent. For example, global copyright enforcement would apparently be less of an issue when compared to, well, with the right to be forgotten because there is international consensus of what constitutes copyright infringement. For example, here we might argue that only manifest infringing content should be enforced globally. Second, the effective protection principle offer some support to global enforcement, which actually should be applied if not doing so would compromise effectiveness and effective and complete protection of fundamental rights and freedoms of natural person. Third, and I'm done, the, jurisdiction, the jurisdictional principle of reasonableness can be useful. The principle here required that state, uh, requires states to balance their policy objectives with the principle of non-interference with other states. And this principle should be implemented using the concept of so-called interest balance by applying a number of factors, such as the interest of other states in the content, harmonization among states on the norm to be enforced, presence of connecting factors to the territory of the forum state, and likelihood in particular of adverse impact of uh, if the listing or any other global enforcement is confined to local search results. Now, this uh, brings me to an end and, and I'm happy to, uh, to take questions or we're gonna have a Q&A later. So this will be all on my side, thank you. Thanks so much, Giancarlo. Uh, I guess that in, in the overview that you provided, uh, you indeed highlighted how these uh, copyright and other IP rights uh, are still formally described as territorial, but indeed have the potential to be uh, quite expansive in application. And uh, this uh, leads me to open the Q&A part of this session. There is a question in the box that is uh, primarily addressed at Lydia, but I guess that also you uh, are, uh, um, uh, are in a position to answer that. So to the both of you, uh, the person is asking, uh, uh, what you think about this erosion of territoriality for copyright torts uh, and uh, what uh, standard uh, you would recommend uh, to, uh, for courts uh, to apply to ensure that different uh, rights and interests uh, are appropriately safeguarded? Uh, if, if very briefly, I think the standard I mentioned, I mean, it, it's obviously true. Uh, global platforms are enforcing uh, copyright uh, globally, and they do that on a voluntary basis very often. I think that uh, a manifest infringing content approach could be 
could be an option there in order to uh, protect as much as possible fair use is exception limitation and, uh, and, uh, and, and still tackling uh, infringement and violation of uh, property as a fundamental rights there, which is, which is uh, the delicate balance to, to do. And I let Lydia to go ahead and say something else. Thank you. Um, yes, thank you for the question. It's a very difficult question. So there's really no easy answer. Um, but clearly the territorial approach to copyright litigation is not very practical or foreseeable or achieves the principle of legal certainty. So some kind of single law approach would be beneficial. Of course, though, as I think the question alluded to, um, one needs to protect the rights of the users as well. I listened earlier today, talked about users' rights, fundamental rights. Um, they have to be protected. And maybe this could be done through uh, mandatory rules, which the forum state has to apply. Um, I think I discussed in my chapter that there are a number of soft law, soft law guidelines that have been developed. And very recently, the International Law Association has published guidelines. These can be, um, you know, not perfect solutions, but, you know, something to work with. Thanks so much. I see that Jan has raised his hand. Yes, thanks, Eleonora. I just wanted to, to add something to the discussion. Of course, it is correct that it's uh, complicated to litigate cross, cross borders and copyright, uh, especially if, if you have a tort, uh, copyright tort that reaches uh, across borders. But isn't one of the issues in the EU that we have all these 27 different copyright acts and we would be far better off in uh, uh, enforcing cross-border if we had only one uh, copyright code within Europe, um, uh, within the EU, yeah, at least, which is, of course, Europe is bigger than the EU, but uh, that, that would solve many, many problems already, I suppose, and that's another reason, I think, why it should be a good idea to work for a, uh, for a uniform copyright uh, act. Thanks so much uh, for uh, this uh, comment, Jan. Uh, let me elaborate a bit more on that. Uh, so to link back to your presentation, uh, you um, indeed uh, um, portrayed quite well how Article 83 can be used, how it has been used, how useful it is. Uh, but it is also a provision that leaves uh, significant discretion to member states uh, because the InfoSoc Directive states that the modalities and conditions of these injunctions uh, are a matter of national law. Uh, and so the question that I would like to ask you, since uh, you are also a practitioner, is whether you think that having so much discretion is something that is useful, should be preserved, or whether instead greater guidance, more rigidity also, if you wish, should be uh, introduced. Um, yes, I mean, already my uh, thank you for, for, for this good question, Eleonora. And you may already guess with my last comment that uh, I'm not too much in favor of too much room for national member states. Um, uh, and as you uh, pointed out uh, rightly, uh, the recital 59, I think it is, uh, of, of the InfoSoc Directive, which speaks. Uh, um, of uh, that the you know modalities and the procedures to implement Article 8.3 are left to the member states. This, for example, has um, uh, also has an effect on, uh, on on certain issues that that should be within material law because this uh, this exception is used, for example, by the German Federal Supreme Court as an excuse. Uh, to also do a different proportionality test than the rest of uh, the EU countries. For example, when it comes to the subsidiarity rule uh, for, uh, for website blocking. Uh, so so under, German, under the German implementation of Article 8.3, you can only ask for website blocking if it's the last resort and you've, you, you've, you've ousted all other possibilities to dry out the infringement at the source. Why, for example, the Austrians, which are, you know, our direct neighbors say, you know, we don't have such a subsidiarity rule, such a last resort rule. And the UK 
as long as they were still in the EU, also had no subsidiarity rule and just an efficacy rule. So there you go. I think if you if you really invite member states to do it differently, you get they will do it, and it's it's not a good idea, uh, especially because website blocking. As I said, there are um, there are uh, portal sites out there like the Pirate Bay that that really cover the entire EU. You must have a, a consistent enforcement regime uh, on the EU level. Thank you so much. There is another interesting question, which uh, I guess raises a point uh, that uh, has come to the surface of all your presentations. And uh, it is the fact that copyright, unlike other IP rights, is a non-registered right. So uh, the person who's raising this question is whether uh, having a system of registration might be a way to make life easier. Uh, as you all know, there is a prohibition of formalities uh, at the international level in the Bern Convention. Um, there have been you know, some attempts uh, to circumvent uh, this prohibition uh, or uh, to try and play with the scope of the prohibition. For instance, there was uh, uh, um, an, an exercise on the side of the US Copyright Office to suggest uh, that uh, you can have a uh, no formalities rule for life plus 50, which is the duration of uh, protection under the Bern Convention, but you can have a registration system for the remaining 20 years. So I would like to ask the uh, speakers to comment on this uh, suggestion that indeed the registration might be something that is useful in this regard. Thank you. Anyone wants to address this point? Well, I can just very briefly maybe say something before the, my, my co-speakers think of their much more clever responses. Uh, but of course, I mean, the, the fact uh, and the beauty maybe of uh, copyright being a non-registered right is, uh, is, uh, is, is coming with many issues. If you look at the copyright data quality, for example, um, that is relevant both in relation to automated content moderation for the use of algorithms, it's relevant for Spotify, etc. Uh, for other uh, online platforms uh, that allow for user uploads. So, so definitely there is um, uh, transaction costs <laughs> that are increased by uh, the fact that those rights are not necessarily registered. Um, there is also, or there has been some impetus, I think the German uh, government in its statement accompanying the council vote uh, on the CDMS, uh, CDSM directive mentioned this in uh, specific in the context of Article 17 in terms of uh, rights databases. Um, so uh, I think especially in relation to data quality, this can be quite interesting. But maybe my co-speakers have much more clever thoughts. Maybe a point that we can raise is that maybe a, a catch-all approach uh, is not what we want. The debate went in that direction. We probably want to have multiple routes, uh, maybe maintaining the no-formality system for professional uh, uh, works and having a formality system in place for user-generated content for non-professional works in order to uh, unticken the deep soup of uh, uh, licensing obligation that exists online. This is obviously it's not so me saying this. We had plenty of scholars proposing this uh, this uh, this uh, double route uh, in reintroducing formalities only for certain works, those with less uh, uh, market value. Thank you very much. In the remaining time, I would really like to pick up on the DSA and what is being proposed. I know that you, Sebastian, have recently completed a very interesting co-authored article on the relationship between copyright rules and the DSA. Uh, so I think that it will be very useful also for those uh, who are um, participating in today's conference uh, to get an understanding of why the DSA does matter for copyright lawyers. Uh, so I, I don't know whether you want to take this question, uh, Jan, Giancarlo or Lydia. Well, I can, I can maybe again give it a start, and 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 then uh, Jan, Giancarlo, and Lydia want to want to supplement. Um, so, um, uh, uh, João, uh, Pedro Quintais, and myself just published two weeks or three weeks ago uh, a working paper on on this question in relation of the Article 17 context, which is very obvious because the DSA, especially 
both I mean, in relation to the liability exemptions, but most interestingly, in relation to this new second leg that is being introduced that is completely or almost completely separate from the liability exemptions, the due diligence obligations. So the question of redress mechanisms, the question of um, uh, right to explanation, the question of more the procedural things. Uh, and this is indeed a really interesting question because Article 17 addresses some of them, but not necessarily exhaustively. So there is a question of where even within Article 17, um, the DSA's due diligence obligations might, as the horizontal background rules, um, fill the gaps. Uh, furthermore, since our panel is, is more on um, the non-platform aspects, um, maybe just also briefly commenting on that, of course, apart from our online content sharing service providers, the DSA's rules will be highly relevant for copyright, both for hosting, but also these other mentioned actors, uh, whether it's mere conduit uh, or caching. And in that point, just recalling one of my, my, my points on that is that uh, I think the interesting question when we talk about these due diligence obligations, I would argue that they have very little to do with substantive copyright because they often only come in once the right is already enforced. So this is something or the, the initial infringement is already taken down. So many of these provisions come in more as an ex post corrective, either for users to get content reinstated, to get an explanation, or to have transparency into the moderation processes, which is something that I think both for rights holders and users alike is of high interest and relevance. Um, and again, these rules might be relevant not only for platforms uh, where the most of the attention is, but also the other actors. Yeah, let me second, uh, Sebastian, what, what you said. I think uh, the DSA will be highly relevant for copyright. Um, although Article 17 DSM directive may have some, you know, their own liability, its own liability uh, regime and own liability rules, not all uh, providers out there, all, although we may think after the discussion about Article 17 that, you know, all providers are caught. It's not the case. You know, by far not the case. There are the OCSSP is quite a narrow definition. Uh, there are a lot of hosting providers even that are not caught by the uh, OCSSP definition. And for those, uh, we still need uh, the uh, of, you know the e-commerce directive, articles twelve to fifteen still apply, and uh, and then. You know, the, these rules in uh, these, the mirror rules, the sister rules in the DSA will apply. So, uh, so I think highly relevant. Also, said uh, what Sebastian said the redress mechanism and, and everything that's linked to it will be very relevant. So, so I think copyright lawyers should take a good look at the DSA and what happens there. Thank you very much. Uh, I think that we have reached an end to this enforcement focused session. We shall now be taking a 10 minute break and we shall be resuming at 4.15 to discuss policy and legislative aspects. Thanks so much to all the speakers and see you soon. Welcome back everyone. Thanks again for taking part in today's conference. It is uh, my great pleasure now to move on to consider a different dimension of EU copyright uh, by looking at the policy and legislative dimension and then uh, going uh, into the protagonist of CJU case law, that is the actual people who have contributed to making it, advocates general, member states, lawyers representing member states. And uh, of course, uh, we are very pleased uh, to be joined uh, by uh, very uh, interesting and engaged speakers for uh, this session. So let's start uh, from the legislative and policy dimension. Uh, we are happy to uh, have Anna Ramalo with us today. Uh, she has uh, researched the topic of copyright harmonization for a long time. She is the author of a book on the topic of EU competence in uh, the uh, copyright field. So, Anna, uh, the floor is yours, and uh, we are curious to know what this internal market lens does actually mean. Thank you. Uh, we, we cannot hear you. I think that there is a problem with uh, the connection. No, it is uh, so.
uh, it seems that uh, Anna has uh, uh, problems with her Wi-Fi, so we shall uh, get back to her as soon as this is fixed. Uh, so let's uh, move on uh, to Tito. We are very happy to have him. Uh, Tito is uh, an expert uh, in uh, copyright law. He has written uh, an excellent uh, PhD thesis and book uh, on the topic uh, of uh, exceptions and limitations in copyright law and uh, uh, you are now a professor in Portugal and uh, we would like uh, to build upon the perspective that Sabine has presented as uh, that is the growing relevance of fundamental rights. She has looked at that uh, from uh, the exceptions and limitations uh, point of view and uh, we want to know more uh, uh, about what these fundamental rights do mean for copyright at large. Tito, thanks for accepting the invite. The floor is yours. Thank you, Eleonora, for the very kind uh, invitation and congratulations again on the excellent editing work. I'm sure you have heard this approximately 20 times today, but once more uh, will certainly not hurt. So thank you very much. Uh, so going straight to the point, yes, I will be talking about fundamental rights, uh, which for the non-lawyers in the room are the kind of rights that are entrenched in national constitutions and in supranational treaties. So in hierarchically superior legislative instruments. And as most people in the room will know, uh, and as has already been and mentioned, there is a growing reference to uh, fundamental rights in EU copyright law, and especially in the judgments of the CJU. The reference to fundamental rights in CJU case law has sharply increased after the coming into force of the Treaty of Lisbon, which gave uh, legally binding character to the Charter of Fundamental Rights of the EU. The Charter in 2009 was granted the same legal status as the founding EU treaties and has since become the main fundamental rights instrument in uh, CJU case law. So this growing use of fundamental rights has led some scholars to speak of a trend towards the constitutionalization of uh, copyright law. And at the same time, we have also numerous scholars uh, that are very critical of the references to fundamental rights in the case law of uh, the CJU. They say that these references are uh, inconsistent, incoherent, selective, window dressing, just to give you a few examples of the critical remarks that have been made, and I largely agree uh, with uh, this view. Anyway, in taking this into account, what I've tried to do in my chapter was to map the role that fundamental rights have been playing in EU copyright law with a focus on the case law of the CJU. So I've started by uh, pinpointing the different functions that fundamental rights have been playing uh, in the copyright case law of the CJU. And uh, the first function is that even if only occasionally, uh, fundamental rights have been used by the court to assess the validity of copyright provisions in the Aki. This has been the case in uh, the metronome music, uh, ruling on Article 1 of the Rental and Lending Rights Directive, and also on the Laser Diskin case, on the interpretation and validity of the regional exhaustion rule in Article 4, Paragraph 2 of the InfoSoc Directive. In both cases, the validity of these copyright provisions was uh, confirmed, uh, even though with very superficial reasoning. And as has already been mentioned uh, here too, um, pending before the CJU is uh, uh, an action filed by Poland seeking to uh, annul the controversial Article 17 of uh, the DSM directive. So this is the first function. The second function um, has, has been the following one. The CJU has recurrently stated that member states' legislatures are bound by fundamental rights in implementing EU copyright directives. Of course, this is not really an extraordinary statement because the charter itself states that its provisions are addressed at member states when they are implementing union law. So this is Article 51 of the charter, so nothing extraordinary here. The third and most remarkable function uh, that fundamental rights have been playing relates to the effects of these rights in private legal disputes. So in its case law, the CJU has actually gone one step further. It has confirmed that fundamental rights have horizontal effects. So they apply 
in private legal disputes. And the court has added that copyright provisions must be interpreted in light of the charter and in a way that expresses a fair balance between the relevant competing rights. What this means is that courts, when they are construing copyright law, they are under a duty to seek guidance in the fundamental rights protected by uh, the charter. Um, so in, in the jargon of uh, constitutional theory, we would say that fundamental rights have indirect horizontal effects in copyright law. So the doctrine of indirect horizontal effect entails that courts must construe the relevant ordinary law, so the infra-constitutional law, in accordance with fundamental rights standards. So uh, when deciding, when courts are deciding a concrete copyright case, their starting point is to look for the solution in a copyright provision, and then in interpreting and applying that provision, they must take into account the values that are embodied in the fundamental rights, and they must uh, strike a fair balance between these values. Now, um, in evaluating this uh, legendary fair balance, the court has been weighing uh, a number of fundamental rights that are protected by the Charter. On the one hand, we have copyright itself, which as a category of IP right, and as has already been mentioned here too, uh, is safeguarded by the fundamental right to property that is enshrined in Article 17 of the Charter. And on the other hand, the CGU has been increasingly relying on users' fundamental rights to uh, serve as counterweights to the proprietary interests of right holders. So the charter rights that have been, that, that have been affording weight to the user side of the scale include uh, first and foremost, and quite obviously freedom of expression and information, but also other fundamental rights and freedoms like the right to the protection of personal data, freedom of the arts, the right to education and the freedom to conduct a business. And those rights have been employed by the CJU mainly in relation to three areas of copyright law. The first area is ownership and scope of protection. Um, and in what regards this area, fundamental rights have been used, for instance, to impose limits on the scope of exclusivity through the definition of the contours of specific economic rights. This has happened in the GS Media case, in the Rankoff case, and in the Pelham case, for instance. The second area is the area of uh, exceptions, which, uh, which I cherish a lot. So fundamental rights have been used in the field of exceptions, for instance, to determine the relative importance of clashing canons of interpretation. So to decide whether we should go for a strict or for a purposive interpretation of exceptions, fundamental rights are also useful. The third area is the area of enforcement measures. Fundamental rights have been invoked by the CJU to scrutinize enforcement measures in concrete copyright cases, in concrete copyright disputes. So these rulings have essentially concerned two types of measures, disclosure injunctions and also blocking and filtering injunctions that have been discussed in the previous panel. So what I tried to do in my chapter was to provide a sketch of the influence that fundamental rights have had in these three main areas. And um, the fundamental conclusion that I reached is that um, despite this rising trend in the CJU case law of uh, analyzing horizontal copyright disputes from the angle of fundamental rights, uh, the role that these rights play in uh, EU copyright law remains rather superficial, and not least because uh, of the court's typically minimalist and some would say Cartesian uh, style of reasoning. More often than not, the court just identifies the fundamental rights that are in need of reconciliation, that are in need of balancing, but then it fails to shed sufficient light on the normative criteria that should guide uh, this balancing exercise. So in most of the cases, the balancing that the CJU performs is very, very shallow. Having said this, and uh, to end with a more uh, positive note, change seems to be uh, in the air. Um, fundamental rights uh, are increasingly employed as important argumentative anchors in the reasoning of uh, the CJU. And in some cases, they appear to have been truly decisive for the outcome reached by uh, the CJU. So uh, while the court's cryptic style of reasoning is not expected to change uh, anytime soon, its interpretation of the copyright aki will certainly be dominated more and more by fundamental rights more and more by the fair balance paradigm and uh, hopefully in a more sophisticated way than until now. So thank you. I will be looking forward to the discussion.
Thanks so much, uh, Tito. This was a very comprehensive and thoughtful uh, overview that you gave. Just a quick question uh, on the reasoning of the CGU. Do you think uh, that uh, allowing uh, for a system of dissenting opinions, dissenting judgments uh, might help uh, improve uh, the quality or reduce uh, the conciseness of the reasoning of the court? It's uh, Eleonora, uh, allow me to say this, a truly brilliant question because this is exactly what I think. So I read, I read, and, and, and I'm, I'm guilty of this sin uh, too. We scholars, copyright scholars, tend to create these conceptual maps about the use of fundamental rights in CJU case law and proposing alternative frameworks. But actually, I think that the single most important change uh, that would lead to better reasoning by the CGU and better reasoning in copyright cases that involve fundamental rights has actually nothing to do with copyright law. It's an issue of judicial reform. And that is uh, allowing for the publication of dissenting opinions, because as everyone knows, uh, CJU decisions are published as unanimous decisions, even though they are far from being unanimous. So readers do not have access to the judicial dialogue that takes place within the chambers of, uh, of the court. And if that judicial dialogue was uh, allowed, if, that, or if it was uh, published, I'm sure that the reasoning of the CJU, which is more often than not very opaque, would be more transparent and would take into greater account the counter arguments and answer those counter arguments. So I definitely think that that's um, the single most important change in what regards the quality of the reasoning of the CJU as well in the copyright case law. Excellent, thank you so much. So we shall return on this topic. Now, Anna has been able to rejoin the webinar. Welcome, Anna. We look forward to hearing your perspective on the lens that has guided the harmonization efforts. Thank you. Can you hear me now? Great, I'm joining from my phone. I'm very sorry, but my internet decided to not work so well today. So I'm having some technical challenges. Um, thank you uh, also for the kind introduction, Eleonora, and um, and also for for your uh, invitation. As you mentioned before, my chapter was about uh, uh, the copyright harmonization, law and policy, competence and rationale uh, for this harmonization. And let me start by uh, saying, and, and as a spoiler, that. Um, that the the rationale and the justification haven't really changed. Um, and this is the static uh, view of EU competence. But I would also like to talk a bit about the dynamic view, which is the use of that competence by certain EU institutions. So starting with the static view, there's nothing um, much new there. We have formal basis for um, EU actions, which are to a greater or lesser extent, the internal market needs of the EU. And what this basis do is that is allowing for the harmonization of uh, national laws if those harmonization measures have uh, as their object the establishment and functioning of the internal market. Now, in a, in a nutshell, the problem with this is that the internal market norms as such are devoid of normative character in the sense that they don't give any guidance as to what the substantive content of the harmonization measures should be meaning that the treaties grant the EU the powers to, to legislate in order to achieve this objective, which is uh, in our case, uh, mostly the establishment and the functioning of the internal market, but they also leave the substantive choices to the legislator's discretion. So this is the first point I wanted to make. The second point, and I think this is also important for uh, discussions on EU competence, is the leeway that uh, that member states have when implementing directives, which are uh, usually the most common form uh, of act in the field of copyright. And this leeway is often ruled by the directive itself. As, as a rule of thumb, uh, let's say, the more harmonization we have, the higher uh, degree uh, of approximation of national laws, and the more uniform the market, the internal market. But minimum harmonization, on the other hand, has the benefit of enabling uh, the consensus necessary to actually enact the legislation. I'm sorry, <laughs> this is not being an easy day today. This is my dog. Um, but uh, uh, the, in the long run, um, my point is that 
the minimum harmonization may lead uh, to, to more barriers to cross-border trade should the member states adopt very different standards within the leeway that is allowed by the harmonization measure. So against this uh, backdrop of the static view of, um, of uh, competence, we have the actual exercise of competence which implies the participation of several EU institutions. And today I'm going to focus in two. Uh, on the one hand, uh, the EU Commission, which has the right of legislative initiative, and on the other hand, on uh, the court, which already, uh, even though uh, it's not a legislative organ, but has played some role in, in the regulation of, of the copyright field. Now, first regarding the Commission, I would argue that it has tightened the grip on copyright regulation through a number of significant initiatives. And um, I, would, I would highlight one of those initiatives, which is its communication from 2020 on identifying and addressing the barriers to the single market. And here the Commission has recognized that minimum harmonization measures may lead to different rules across the EU across the member states, which would in turn would impose certain burdens on market actors. And this is the so-called gold plating, which occurs when member states, uh, when implementing EU acts, impose additional requirements or additional obligations or standards to the addresses of, um, of the legislation. Now, uh, these, these standards that are imposed at national level are usually not foreseen um, in, in the EU Act. And therefore, there can be some uh, regulatory overburden that derives uh, from there. And in, in that regard, in the communication, the Commission has, um, has clarified that these additional national requirements, if they exist, they must be justified by a, an overriding reason of public interest. They must be non-discriminatory, they must be proportionate. So there's, there's a, a lot of requirements that these additional uh, national measures, uh, let's say, should, should comply with. But more importantly, even when they are compliant with these rules, member states should still keep differences to a minimum in light of single market objectives. And I'm paraphrasing the, the commission here. So for example, um, a member state that decides to introduce mandatory collective management for the newly created press publisher rights, for example, which is Article 15 of the DSM Directive, um, this would seem to amount to a classic uh, uh, case of gold plating that the Commission should rightly want to avoid. And this is um, something that is not foreseen by the DSM Directive and which is likely unjustified uh, and or um, disproportionate. And it might also give rise to disorganization since other member states might not include this mandatory collective management. So this is, would be an example uh, of this exercise of competence beyond uh, what's, uh, what's in the Directive. Regarding the court, um, it has used certain formulas that have pushed for further harmonization. And even though the court does not formally have a binding system of precedent, we can actually argue that it substantially does. Um, and this is because the use of certain formulas in, in the court's decisions have been reinforced this idea of precedent, and I'm using uh, air quotes here, it's, it's the case, for example, of the notion of autonomous concepts of EU law, for instance, under which the, the court has fleshed out certain notions contained in directives that ought to be interpreted uniformly throughout the EU. And this pushes for further integration. Now, by resorting to these autonomous concepts of EU law, the court harmonizes certain notions and gives them presidential strength. And in the end, um, when referring to, to these autonomous concepts, the court monopolizes the definition to the detriment of national interpretations, of course. And this is then solidified, if I uh, may say so, through self-preference using the formulas that we all know, such as, for instance, um, uh, according to established case law or as the court has consistently held. So in sum, the court has an institutional actor enjoys a broad margin of uh, discretion. And then in this, uh, this, these decisions, if they are not binding in a formal sense, they, are, they have a rather persuasive force, including before the commission, 
which has the power to initiate le legislation and thus the circle uh, um, uh, finishes. My two cents, and these are my uh, final thoughts, um, that the EU institutions have the ability to shape uh, the future of EU copyright law, sometimes in ways that are perhaps not foreseen by the political and the legislative compromise um, that is inherent to directives or to other EU secondary law. And while this may give rise to um, concerns of democratic legitimacy, one possible solution to counteract this, and this ties in very nicely to what Tito um, was saying, and it's my final thought, the one solution is to, to take the respect of fundamental rights, which has constitutional status in the EU, as a yardstick. And I will stop here and look forward to the discussion. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Anna. A fascinating uh, talk that you have delivered, which shows indeed the complexity of building uh, copyright uh, at the EU level. Uh, we shall now focus a bit more on what the Court of Justice does, uh, not really by looking at the case law, which we have already discussed at some length, but indeed looking at uh, the people making CJU case law. Uh, so indeed, uh, we will be started by hearing from Estelle, who has conducted a study on uh, the influence of advocates general and uh, people working closely with them. So Estelle, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Eleonora, and congratulations on the publication of this great book. Um, my uh, talk indeed today will look at uh, the advocates general influence on the copyright uh, case law. And this is only a chat snapshot, obviously, because I don't have much time. So for example, I won't have the time to delve into the methodology, but of course, people can ask me questions at the break, not this uh, discussion, during the discussion. So it's obvious to say that the Court of Justice has had a, an influence uh, and still has an enormous influence in on new copyright law, and that the court is itself influenced by several sources, not to mention the judge's professional background and, and other things. But this chapter here examines the influence of the advocates general on the court. Why? Because they have more time to research. Their task is actually to convince the court and this previous research has been done and that shows that they have a strong influence that in 70 to 90 percent of EU case law in general, not just not uh, IP case law, um, the, the court actually follows the, uh, the advocates general opinions. So this chapter is actually examining also the extent to which the advocates general are influenced by the literature that they cite because they cite us, <laughs> as everybody knows, um, the legal secretaries that work for them and the languages that both they speak, the advocate general and the legal secretaries. And in fact, obviously, the court is going to be indirectly influenced by all this uh, together. So why look at the literature and why look at the languages, you would think? Because the language is spoken by the advocates general and the legal secretaries influence their opinions. There is a tendency for legal secretaries to search in their mother tongue and the languages that they can easily read. It's extremely rare for advocates general uh, to request a translation of an article, uh, uh, an article of literature, as they have already no time to read in the languages they know. And the court's working language is in French. Yeah, you know that, surely. And that reduces the candidate's pool, as those knowing French have an obvious advantage. And that's on, not only for the advocates general, but also the legal secretaries. So there's previous research that has shown that there's about 79%, if not more, legal secretaries who speak French or are trained in the French legal tradition. And the majority of the advocates general over time, about 70, sorry, 57.8% or so, um, are also trained in the legal uh, uh, French legal tradition. So the legal, the secretaries, also, if the advocate general does not have uh, a, a French legal background or, or um, is not trained in the late French legal tradition, have a lot of influence. Um, those legal secretaries who know French have a lot of influence on the advocate general. So what are the findings or some of the findings are in the chapter? First of all, on this issue about the court uh, uh, following the advocates general. In the uh, sample of copyright cases that I have looked at, uh, in 36.1% of the cases, the court actually follows the advocate general results so or the outcome, uh, you know, the little this, um, ruling at the end that they proposes this, the court to uh, accept, but also all the argumentation on all the points that have been raised. So that's 36.1%. And in 50 5.3% of the cases, the court follows the advocates general only in part. So if you combine those two percentages, you get to 91.4%. Uh, now, there is definitely a de facto in court specialization of the advocates general, as everybody would have imagined. Four out of 18 of the advocates general who delivered opinions in the copyright cases um, had 49.3% of the cases. That's four out of 18. 
Uh, but these advocates general have not been more followed, whether in full or in part, than other advocates general, as far as I could, you know, because I've read all the cases and coded them. And the same can be said for any uh, advocate general, actually. But therefore, it cannot be said that some advocates general are more persuasive than others. But even if you say that, then it's obvious that in recent years, if you're following the uh, the case law very closely, Advocate General Spooner has had a big, big share of the opinions, almost a lion's share. And in all of the cases where he cited literature, so in the cases where he cites literature in his opinions, he was followed either in full or in part. And when he was followed in part, it was on most questions, he was actually followed in full. In full, I mean the argumentation and the outcome. That's what I mean by in full. Now, what about the literature? Obviously, you can only look at the citations, and the citations are on your proxy because Advocate General are also obviously influenced by what they've read from the party submissions and their general sort of knowledge, but they might not cite that. So you can only look at the citations in, the, in their opinions. But the advocate general cite the literature in about 62.7% of the cases and rely on it in 80.8% of the cases. So it's obvious that the literature's uh, influence is quite easy. Now, what are the languages that the advocate general rely on in terms of the academic literature that they cite? Well, funnily enough, or strangely enough, I was quite surprised it's only seven languages. English, German, French, Spanish, Italian, Dutch, and Polish. And there's no literature cited in the other languages. So 84.8% .8 of the literature which is cited is in English, in German, or in French. And it's the language of the source, not the language of the author's nationality, but the match is, is, is very close. So most references, most references that the Advocate General cite are not in the mother tongue. And even more notably, none of the Advocate General are originating from small member states cite literature in the mother tongue. And there's a perfect match virtually each time between the languages spoken by the legal secretaries and the advocate general and the languages of the sources that they cite. So that confirms the hypothesis that languages spoken by advocate general and legal secretaries influence sources on which they rely. So that's the state of play. What's the conclusion? The state of play now is that no advocate general dominates in terms of being more followed than others over the period for the copyright cases. Uh, but the background and the languages of the advocate general and the legal secretaries clearly exert some influence on the result of the opinion. And then the decisions as the court follows the advocate general in, all, in, in many cases. And all cabinet in the sample, all the cabinets of the Advocate General had at least one legal secretary and often more who knew French. And French is also the third most frequent language in the literature cited by the Advocate General. And the first when the court actually follows the opinions in full. So it seems quite clear that the French uh, legal tradition dominates. And that can be a problem because previous research has shown that the French legal tradition, it may not be a problem so much for EU copyright case law, but in general for EU case law, because the, the, the tradition favors the state rather than individual liberty and tends to provide less secure property rights protection to investors. And there could be other issues with the French uh, legal tradition. Anyway, it shouldn't be that it dominates in my view, it should be more diverse. So it's also a problem if an advocate general stays a long time at the court and specializes in a specific area, like in copyright law, um, and the court often follows him or her, it's a problem if the advocate general cites the literature in only a few languages. So what are the, the future directions? So I think what can be remedied? Um, I think that the thing that we can do that's easy to fix is that the researchers for, um, from other member states should write in English or in French if they can. And if they can't, please use automated translation tools and publish your research to, 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 to translate from, say, I don't know, Swedish into English or into French. And they're very good <laughs> nowadays. Um, and publish their research in open access so that the legal secretaries and the advocate general read literature from scholars from uh, more member states as that can only improve the quality of the, in, uh, the in arguments uh, by the Advocate General and the court, obviously, and there's uh, hopefully less dominance of, of the French tradition, and hopefully that should lead to better solutions in EU copyright cases, but of course it's more generally in EU case law, because I imagine the trend would be similar in other areas of EU law than copyright case law, and I look forward to the discussion. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Estelle. Very interesting and intriguing at the same time. I guess that one side effect of your proposal will be also to enhance access to scholarship from member states in which many inter interesting things do happen, but because of language barriers, it is difficult to access commentaries, etc. So I guess that uh, your uh, um, proposal, if implemented, would be beneficial uh, on uh, all uh, levels. 
Uh, let's now move on uh, to a very original perspective uh, that is that uh, of member states uh, pleading uh, their case before the Court of Justice of the European Union. And uh, we are very fortunate to have uh, Daniel Seguan with us today. He used uh, to represent France before the Court of Justice in a copyright case law. Uh, so, uh, Daniel, we are very interested to hear about your experience and also why you are no longer uh, pleading before the CGU you in copyright matters. Thank you. Uh, yeah, first of all, uh, good afternoon, everyone. And, and thanks a lot, Eleonora, for the invitation um, and, and for your work. To be fair, like I think the book, uh, the blog, everything like uh, uh, for practitioners like, like myself, like it's been really of great use. Um, as you said, like I'm going to provide the, the perspective, which is the perspective I had as uh, an agent representing the French government in the copyright case. Um, I'm still working as a, as a litigation lawyer, um, but in another field, like uh, representing the European Central Bank. So, but um, as Estelle mentioned, I think you have actually a lot of uh, parallel between the different fields of EU law. So I think it, it can still be relevant for, for the discussion. But what I would like to focus on here is really those five years that I spent uh, representing the, the French government in copyright case. Um, and, and my starting point was um, a study and actually a great study from the University of Bournemouth um, explaining which country influence um, and, and how they do influence the European Court of Justice in copyright case. And in this study, um, you see that actually the most influential party before the European Court of Justice in copyright is the European Commission, which comes as no surprise because the European Commission is actually um, in all copyright cases because uh, they intervene in all uh, preliminary references. But then uh, we, we were um, uh, France uh, number two. And what was interesting, like beyond the numbers, I think was that the perspective that we take is just completely the opposite of the one from the European Commission. So the European Commission would be what we refer here as pro users, or I don't know, a more free market. I don't know if it's the correct word, but then the French government was more in favor of like a strong protection of, of the right holders. And this, this divergence um, is something that I experienced uh, a lot, like in most of the cases where uh, we've been very active uh, pretty much all the time <laughs> against the European Commission and, and quite often against um, other government, especially the British government back then. And over this period of time, nonetheless, we've seen that, um, at least from the perspective of the, of the French government, like the, the, the case law of the court has been, uh, and the result has been quite, quite satisfactory when you look at, uh, at the solution in many of the cases uh, that you've been discussing a lot today. Um, it's been for us uh, quite positive. So my point here would be to try to explain a bit what have been um, the, the strategy that we tried to implement over, over the, this, those, those years and how it has, um, in my opinion, influenced the European Court of Justice, but also what are the challenges that we see developing for the years to come when it comes to, to copyright litigation. So already, what I think is important is to is first to focus on, on, on the subfield of copyright. And, and for us, it's a bit how we design our litigation strategy. So I would say four, sub, so four major subfields um, have been um, all focused. So first, communication to the public, of course, uh, number one thing. Um, then private copy, compensation for private copying. Um, third, liability and injunction enforce um, the division of competence in uh, matters related to copyright. And I mentioned this one because I think it's been to a large extent overlooked uh, when you look at the academic literature. And actually one of the, one of the person who, who drafted a lot on the matter and really interesting thing is uh, Anna Ramelo that we just talked, we just spoke a few, a few minutes ago. But I think it's been overlooked in the sense that the focus um, has been on one or two cases. Whereas if you take the perspective of the division of competence in matters related, for instance, to trade, and you look at what is referred to in the treaty as um, the um, commercial aspect of intellectual property, you see that you have a lot of discussion uh, potentially in, in the field of copyright. Uh, it has given the opportunity of the court to discuss those cases a lot in uh, the Marrakesh Treaty, but also in Opinion 215. Um, and as myself, I covered both trade and intellectual property. I saw how the two fields can actually have a lot in common and how the issue of the division of competence can bring a lot of uh, 
um, I would say, argument for you if you litigate at the same time in, in the field of copyright, because it explains very clearly where does EU law stop when it comes to uh, IP and, uh, and copyright in particular. So I think this is something to be, uh, to be reminded because it is of interest um, to, to delineate the, the scope of EU law in, in this field. Once, once we've said this, um, I think when you work for the government, you, you've had, you have different set of challenges. Like um, one growing challenges that I see, uh, it's in the field of copyright, but also in other fields, is that you have a lot of ruling coming from a lot of different sources. So uh, you have ruling from your, from your constitutional court, you have ruling from the European Court of Justice, from the European Court of Human Rights. And this is something that we had quite a bit in, uh, in copyright, like I would mention two cases that I'm sure you're familiar with, like uh, um, this um, Soulier and Doc case, but also the most recent Spedidam case. And in those two cases, we've had um, a statute under French law uh, that set up like a very specific scheme either to protect um, or to uh, license out of commerce books, for instance, or um, to set up a very specific scheme to for the, of, uh, um, the, case of, uh, of the National Institute for uh, Audiovisual Work. And in those particular cases, clearly uh, you, you got those statutes that got cleared by the French Constitutional Court, but then the matter got litigated in front of the French court, eventually reaching uh, other Supreme Court and being referred to the European Court of Justice. And here you see the difficulties that you have where you want a case before the Constitutional Court based on a set of arguments. Sometimes those arguments, you see them in the final ruling of the Constitutional Court, and then you go to the European Court of Justice and it's completely different. The assumption is different, the way the reasoning is different, and therefore uh, you need to, to find the right balance between the two, and it's not so easy for you as the litigators, but it's also very difficult for your clients, for the other department you're working for, to understand why a scheme that got approved by the Constitutional Court is then being uh, threatened by the European Court of Justice. So this is something that, that has happened in those two cases, but it happens in other fields of, of EU law, I would say. Then from a more, I would say, strategic perspective, what's, what sometimes is, um, is also a challenge is like, you might have cases that uh, you just dislike for one reason or the other. You think this line of case law is just not consistent with the view of your government, or this is just wrong, so on and so forth. And in such case, sometimes it's not so easy because you see, and it's been really well documented by, by the academic literature that you are very often the same advocate general, you are very often the same judge reporter. And it's a bit difficult then to ask a judge to, in a way, reverse what has been a consistent line of case law that he embraced in previous cases. So we had this situation in, uh, in, uh, after the ruling in the Del Corso case, um, like uh, related to um, like protection of copyright in, uh, in, in the dentist offices. Um, and in this case, like the court made some, I would say a bit weird uh, comments on uh, the profit making nature of the communication to the public, so on and so forth. And it was understood as now the profit making nature of the communication to the public is maybe a, almost a self-standing criteria or to be understood as such. This was something that we've been against. And um, instead of just uh, taking the opportunity of the next uh, reference to, to discuss the matter again with the same judge, maybe and the same advocate general, we asked the court to refer the case to the Great Chamber. And that's the reason why in the RIA training case that I'm sure you're very familiar with, the court decided to sit in Great Chamber. It's because it was the French government asking for it and you have the right as a government or as member state to ask for the court to sit in Great Chamber. And eventually when the court sat in Great Chamber, um, I think it really provided, uh, it was much clearer than the Del Corso case, the final ruling regarding the profit making nature of and, uh, and communication to the public. So in a way we managed to achieve our result by having the Great Chamber, by having the president of the European Court of Justice being involved. Um, and that's a way I would say for member states to, um, to, to, to try to, to, to influence the court to, to reconsider certain solution that they agreed on in the past. So it is something you cannot use for all, all cases, but that is really a very useful tool that you have in, in the rules of procedure, I would say. 
Finally, and I think that's the last point, which is sometimes a bit of a challenge, is how do you find the right balance between on the one hand the power of the member states and the competence enjoyed by the member states and the harmonization and the new role. So we've discussed, and you, dis and you all know very well this, like the um, notion of the autonomous concept under EU law, it is something that you have in pretty much all court cases before the European Court of Justice. It is something that is great use if you want to harmonize the internal market. But at the same time, it is also something that has detrimental consequence on uh, the, the, the competence of the member states or the room for member of, the, of, the, of the member state. And a clear example of this, I would say, is all the court cases you have regarding the compensation for private copying, where the court first said, here we are in a matter that, uh, and, and in, in, we're having a concept that is an, an autonomous concept under EU law. So it is to be defined at the EU level by the European Court of Justice, but we leave some room for one another at the national level to set the parameters of this. So this balance, I think, was always important for the member states and, and, and for the French government. And therefore, in most of the case, you will see that um, uh, actually we were defending the fact that we have the right to set up our own parameters, to set up our own criteria when it comes to the implementation of this uh, compensation for private copying. At the same time, and that's the interesting part, you need to balance it with the need to harmonize. And I think it's also in the interest of member states, and at least it was in the interest of the French government, to have more harmonization in the field of copyright. So for instance, when you have like a scheme under national law that you feel is threatening a bit the core of the uh, compensation for private copying, you will try to intervene to um, explain to the court that this is not admissible under EU law. And a very good example of this is the um, uh, EGEDA case. Uh, it's, it's a case, um, it's a Spanish um, uh, reference. And in, in that case, what was at stake was the Spanish scheme where you would have the compensation for private copying that would be um, uh, in a way uh, related or um, financed through the Spanish budget. And this was for us very different from the philosophy of uh, private copying and the compensation for private copying. And more importantly, it was something that would potentially put at risk uh, the, the, the actual compensation, because if tomorrow you have the vote of the budget, as we all know, it can change, you can decide one year to the other that you won't give as much money as should be uh, uh, allowed or afforded to uh, the right holders. So this, this was like a very good example where we've been like, okay, here, the margin of manager is just going too far. It is something that can actually threaten the philosophy of the system we set up in the first place. So we're gonna try to intervene to challenge this uh, in front of the court. And um, I mean, eventually the result was, was positive for us, but that shows how uh, you need to find the, the right balance between your margin of maneuver and the need to harmonize the internal market based on your own um, political goal, I would say. Uh, last point, because I don't want to take a lot of uh, your time before, before the questions. Uh, it's more like the, the challenges ahead. Uh, and I think, uh, of course, you have many challenges ahead, uh, new text, new directives, everything. But uh, one thing that I find interesting is like, uh, what could be the role of international law in the years to come in the field of copyright? Uh, as you know, it's something that you see in a lot of the rulings reference to the Ben Convention, reference to the WIPO Convention. But also you have those reference to uh, the guide of the Bern Convention. And this is something that is um, taking a lot of space, I think. It's really when you go to the hearing, you have a lot of debates on, those, on this guide, which I find uh, personally very interesting. But also it's a bit questionable from the perspective of the legitimacy of this guide, because like the, the member state and the signatory states of the Bern Convention never agreed on the content of this guide in the first place. And you've seen that the court is having difficulties to find the right formula for this. So when you look at the uh, FGAA case, uh, they are referring to it as like a tool to interpret EU law. But then when you look at the Levola case, where I remember we discussed a lot uh, the, what the content of the guide during the hearing, you have nothing in the final ruling referring to the guide, whereas the, the, the solution is the one that uh, is um, actually advocated in the guide in the first place. So here you, you, you can see that you have a difficulties, which is more broadly a difficulties for you law to deal with software instruments. 
but I think it's something maybe to factor in, maybe to consider uh, in terms maybe of a, um, from an academic perspective and also from a practical perspective, what should be the legal value and the legal nature of, uh, of this guide. And last point, and I stop here, moral rights. Uh, I've been talking a bit earlier about the division of competence and like one clear limits has been moral right is uh, beyond the scope of EU law uh, when it comes to uh, the uh, international agreement, but also when it comes to the, to the directive itself. But when you look at the very interesting conclusion of Advocate General Spuna, uh, he's actually explaining that moral rights should be something to be considered uh, when the member states have to implement an exception. And this I find is interesting because it's a way to um, make a balance between one right that is enshrined in EU law, under EU law, an exception, and one other right beyond the scope of EU law. And this debate about the limits of EU law and how do we take into consideration what is in and what is out is very interesting, I think, for the future of copyright, but also for the future of EU law more generally speaking. So I'm probably also something to be, to be looked after in the years to come. I will stop here. I'm sorry, it's been a bit long. <laughs> Thanks again. Well, uh, thanks so much, uh, Daniele. It was, you know, a very fascinating uh, analysis that you performed. Uh, and thanks also for being uh, so straightforward uh, in uh, naming cases uh, and uh, with outlining uh, where you thought uh, and the French government thought that there were issues uh, to, to consider. So we, sh we shall return on uh, those topics during the Q&A. Now I will give the floor uh, to uh, Frederick Blox, uh, who is uh, a judge in Belgium, and uh, he has authored for the handbook uh, a very interesting chapter comparing uh, the approach of the Court of Justice in copyright matters to that of the US Supreme Court. Uh, Frederick, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Eleonora. Um, I will try to, uh, to keep it as brief as possible. Um, I invite you, of course, to, uh, to read uh, uh, this chapter and all the chapters in, in, in the book. Um, but um, doing so, you will see that um, my findings are um, um, with a lot of, of, of statistics and, and, um, and charts and tables, which is, of course, uh, very hard to, uh, to summarize here. Um, I will um, briefly try to um, share my screen um, to uh, show you um, how um, what was the, the methodology. So I identified from from the literature um, ten um, means of interpretation, basically, and the um, um, advantage of this list is that um, it is applicable basically regardless of the the system um, that is being studied. Um, for instance, if you look at uh, the literature about um, American um, constitutional uh, interpretation um, doing similar things, you will see that a list of, uh, of methods they, um, they identify and use um, is often um, very much linked to the particular subject matter, and so it's uh, more difficult to transpose. Um, so in this case, I use this list, um, and of course, you you find an, a number of, of of classics like like textual arguments and and teleological arguments, etc. Um, precedent um, and uh, some more um, intricate that that basically fill the gaps uh, between um, uh, the the famous um, um, categories. Um, Short, uh, the, 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 the bottom line is basically that um, the differences that you would expect between um, the two courts and their use of, of those methods is not as large as you would expect. Um, for instance, um, precedent, um, which is probably the, the main differentiating uh, feature bet between common law and um, uh, European continental law, um, is actually being used in a fairly uh, similar way um, by uh, both courts. Um, that's one point that is, that's, uh, I should say, the, the, the substance of um, 
of uh, the um, chapter. Um, I would make two little side points um, and basically uh, building on um, things that Estelle and, and Danielle already uh, uh, mentioned um, earlier. Um, in doing so, I, of course, collected uh, all kinds of uh, metrics and, and, and statistics about the case themselves. And one thing that is really salient um, when you look at the Court of Justice is the authorship of the judgment and who, who the, the uh, juge rapporteur was um, in each case. And if you see that um, Judge Malinowski, who, who retired uh, last year, um, really had the lion's share of the um, of the work in in this matter, um, and um, his um, his influence and the influence of his cabinet is uh, is uh, really uh, beyond any uh, any measure. Um, the strangest uh, thing is that um, when um, he retired. Um, there was a, a fifth shrift uh, um, presented to him, a very, uh, very thick volume, um, with all kind of uh, of contributions from from scholars about EU law, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, you will find nothing about copyright law, which is very surprising to me, um, um, giving um, this constatation. Second uh, point in the same line, you see um, Judge uh, Ilicic um, as a, a clear second. Um, when you look at the um, chronology, you see here the, 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 the dots are uh, each case uh, in copyright law. Um, the red dots are opinion um, where um, Judge Malinowski was a uh, uh, juge rapporteur. The blue ones are the ones who were um, um, Judge Ilicic uh, is a brother, and um, if I'm not mistaken, um, virtually all the copyright cases that are still in the pipeline um, are um, being elaborated in his cabinet, um, which I, I find very striking, uh, knowing that um, the court used to have eight uh, to twenty-eight, now twenty-seven uh, judges. Um, of course, we, we all see uh, the same names uh, appearing on the opinions, but uh, seeing this like that, uh, I find it very striking. And um, um, th there are a lot of... Uh, yeah, well, sorry for being me. Go ahead. A lot of uh, um, observations that could be made on a, also on a, on a, um, um, a level of... Uh, uh, I would say management of the uh, of, of the court or how you how you deal with with assigning case. Um, so yeah, those are the the main uh, features that I wanted to uh, to spot. Um, resuming, we heard from Estelle that uh, Eleonora, if you want to promote this book and that this book would be quoted from uh, in the opinions of the uh, uh, Advocate General, you need to send a copy to um, Advocate General Spooner's uh, cabinet if you want. Actually, to influence uh, EU copyright law, you need to send a copy to Judge Ilicic's cabinet. Thank you. Thanks so much, Frederick, and also for the advice, which I shall take on board. Uh, so we now move on to considering something that has been in the air, I guess, in many of the presentations that we have listened to uh, this afternoon. And it is uh, indeed uh, this dream, as the Commission itself called it, uh, of uh, copyright unification in Europe. So uh, I would like uh, to invite Tatiana to share her thoughts uh, as to whether you think it is uh, the unavoidable or right idea to uh, endorse. Tatiana, the floor is yours. Uh, good afternoon to all, uh, Leonora. Many thanks for the invitation to contribute to this excellent uh, volume, and also many thanks for the invitation to contribute to this uh, conference. The topic of my presentation, which is based on the book chapter, is on the desirability of the European copyright law unification, and I must admit that uh, European copyright law unification is rather a provocative idea, especially nowadays where unionist ideals are put under serious doubt. 
copyright law, thanks or due to its dual economic and cultural dimension, could be seen as a kind of a legal oxymoron, as a kind of a legal janus. Even though cultural and economic uh, uh, dimensions and objectives do not often coincide, as I will show in this very short presentation, and I know that I am a last uh, speaker, uh, that it is remarkable that they both militate in favor of the European copyright law unification. First of all, the unification of uh, copyright law is justified by EU internal market values and uh, uh, the dogma of the internal market has led to an intense effort of harmonization of national copyright laws and we have a significant European copyright law acquis. At the same time, the principle of copyright law territoriality has not been challenged. So national copyright laws present significant differences. For example, the same work can be protected in one member state, but not in another. And different copyright exceptions apply within the whole territory of the EU. So this is a flow that impends the internal market to become a single and multiparty a unified market. This one European copyright law approach is also in line with the cultural dimension, the cultural identity of copyright law. The copyright law of each country has a unique link with the culture of the country. Paradoxically, this unique link of copyright law with uh, culture could be seen also as one of the main reasons for the harmonization of copyright law systems, since cultures have the vocation to be communicated and to cross the borders. So if culture is seen as a liberating power which has the vocation to be communicated, then the principle of copyright law territoriality appears ill-fitting. Uh, certainly, there is not any at the EU level now, there is not any recognition of any right of the European citizens to access the cultures of other member states. However, under the light of the growing significance of fundamental rights within the EU legal order, accessing copyright protected works under the same mandatory exceptions could be seen as a kind of a concrete form of a European citizen's rights to access cultural goods under the same conditions within the whole territory of the EU. This growing importance of uh, the claim to the uniform access to uh, culture uh, has also taken uh, a concrete legislative expression in the portability regulation. Here we have the portability uh, right. This right, of course, has some uh, uh, consumer law, strong consumer law orientation and roots. However, its cultural function shall not be underestimated. So I believe that the grains of the copyright law unification are there, that they are constantly uh, evolving and growing. And uh, first of all, there is a significant European uh, copyright law legislative key. This could be used as a basis for the creation of an EU single copyright law rule. Uh, this sense of the Europeanization of uh, copyright law uh, has been also amplified by the activist and often creative role of the court. We have a lot to say about this role, but uh, a lot of case law has emerged. And for the sake of the legal certainty, which has not be found in a dispersed and often anarchic collection of law and case law, copyright law, European copyright law has become much complex. Uh, I think that the time has come to consider seriously about the creation of an EU single copyright law rule. In this context, paradoxically, and I know that copyright law is full of paradoxes, uh, two unfortunate events uh, could facilitate this process. I'm referring to Brexit and I'm referring also to the dominance of uh, GAFAM. First of all, Brexit is certainly a tragedy for Europe. Apart from this, in the field of copyright law, uh, it could be seen, and it could, could be never seen as an occasion uh, to move towards a deeper integration in some core copyright law issues, since the absence of a major player of the UK could facilitate the emergence of more uniform norms. Uh, second, the heated discussions about the value gap in uh, the Digital Single Market Directive have set the light also to another problematic of uh, copyright law policy making. 
An EU member state alone is not strong enough to impose its national copyright law agenda to the powerful actors of the internet. In this context, uh, the directive has established two new mechanisms, uh, very controversial mechanisms, Article uh, 15 and Article 17. We have a lot to say about them. However, we cannot neglect that they are uh, two innovative mechanisms which has been established at the European level for one reason. What is this reason? What was, why was a European action and intervention uh, was deemed to be necessary in this field? The answer, I think, is uh, both um, uh, easy, simple, and difficult to admit. In the global village, the internet protagonists, the intermediaries, have gained an enormous negotiating power uh, through lobbying, but also through threats sometimes. So uh, I believe that the time has come. I know that uh, this endeavor uh, will be a monumental endeavor. So all uh, the drafters of such uh, an EU rule it will have the form of a European copyright law code. A lot has been written about this, should think proactively. They should be in mind that the EU single rule will be seen internationally also as a regional rule. And finally, I think, and most importantly, the conceptual identity of such a EU single rule cannot be based on a monolithic and mechanistic perception of copyright law as a property tool, but also to take into account that copyright protected works are cultural goods and to highlight their importance also as cultural goods. So this is uh, the end of my short presentation. I, I know that this is a huge topic. We have a lot to discuss, and I'm looking forward to your comments. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Tatiana. That was a very insightful. Uh, we have received uh, some questions in the Q&A box. Please uh, uh, continue uh, proposing your questions. There is one for Tito uh, regarding uh, uh, your point uh, on uh, dissenting opinions uh, that uh, might help enhance uh, the quality of uh, CJU uh, decisions reasoning. And uh, the question asks uh, what you think about making public the submissions of member states. I know that uh, they can be accessed through freedom of information request, and the same goes uh, for the legal service of the commission. So I guess uh, the question will be uh, about making them public by default. Thank you. Thank you, Eleonora, and thank you, Alina, for uh, the great question. Uh, I would be all in favor of making them public especially after the court proceedings end. So I know there is a regulation, it's not exactly my uh, area of research, but I know there is a regulation on the public access of uh, documents held by the commission, the parliament and the council. And there are some exceptions uh, that apply to the court of justice. Um, the exceptions are intended to protect the integrity of uh, the court proceedings, but at the same time, there is a relatively recent, I think, uh, decision by uh, the CJU uh, holding that the commission cannot refuse access to member state uh, submissions just by invoking that exception that the documents relate to court proceedings. If the access to the documents does not threaten the integrity of the court proceedings, so namely, if the proceedings are not currently pending, uh, then I think that people should have access to those, to those documents. Um, what I don't think is that uh, that would increase, I think that would uh, obviously increase transparency. It would not necessarily increase uh, the quality uh, of the CJU's uh, reasoning. I definitely think that uh, dissenting opinions would have that effect access to member state submissions would simply increase transparency. It would not necessarily uh, make the CGU more transparent uh, in its reasoning. Thank you. Uh, then there is a, a question, uh, I think, uh, concerning Estelle's uh, uh, presentation. And the question is asking uh, what uh, uh, you think uh, about the relations between uh, the literature cited by Advocate General and what uh, the judges actually read. Thanks. I think, uh, Martin, you, thank you for asking this question. Um, the, the short answer is I don't know, but I think that judges in general are busy. The Advocate General is really concentrating on the case uh, full blown because it's his, it's his job. He, has, he, he or she has more time, so they have more time to read. And it's, it is clear that the uh, load of the Court of Justice has increased dramatically since 2017, and they have even less time to read. So I think that 
that is why the advocates general have such an influence because the judges, even probably the judge, judge or rapporteur doesn't have that much time to read. Now, literature in general on the case. Now I cannot vouch for this. You would have to probably interview quite a few people inside the court. Maybe Frederick has an idea because he, he was a referral there at some point there. He might uh, want to say something or not. I don't want to put you on the spot, Frederick. Uh, but it, it is clear from the, the interviews that I had only two interviews with a previous, you know, former advocate general and a referral there at the court that uh, they have no time. Uh, and so basically the proxy is probably, you know, we, you'll never know the definite answer to that. It's probably uh, good in the sense that they don't, they don't have the time to read and whatever they read will be probably less than what the advocate general reads, but I, can, I cannot be certain of this. So you would have to interview more people at the court, I think. Um, if I can pick up on, on what Estelle said, um, just to correct one thing, I was not referral there, but I was, uh, I was uh, basically in a fellowship at the, uh, at the cabinet sorry, sorry, uh, uh, for, for, for uh, half a year. Um, no, so I did not have the, the same, uh, the same uh, uh, task as a referral there. Um, it's a bit difficult for me to, to comment because I only saw the, what was happening um, uh, in the cabinet where I was uh, involved. Um, but I don't think you can gen generalize that the judges don't read. That's not it. That, that's, that's, too, that's going too far. Um, of course, the, the, the groundwork is, is done by the referral there. Um, and they will they will do all the uh, the research and all, um, but certainly if it's a, a subject uh, where the uh, judges has some some personal interests or or is triggered by by an aspect or whatever, um, they they certainly will do will do some reading uh, by themselves. There we go. Thank you. Uh, there is another question, uh, I guess, addressed uh, at uh, Daniele. Uh, asking uh, you to comment uh, on how member states uh, get uh, to a certain position and their broader outlook uh, on specific issues. Uh, how do you get uh, to the point of defining what your approach should be? Um, yes, I am. Yeah. Uh, that, that, that's a very good question. I mean, I can explain briefly how it works in like that. And of course, in each country, I think it's slightly different, but for us, um, when I go to the court, um, I go as the lawyer and I go with an expert, which is often the case for other member states. The expert is coming from the department that is in charge of uh, copyright policy. So in, so in the French uh, system, it is the Ministry of Culture that is in charge of such policy. And what we do is that before the beginning of the proceedings, we have a meeting um, in um, the, uh, the prime minister office, you have like an EU division where you have a meeting before um, the beginning of any case um, that is referred to the European Court of Justice. And in this meeting, you have like all the stakeholders, all the people interested within the French government that comes to discuss, okay, here we would be doing this instead of that, this instead of that. So for instance, when it comes to copyright, of course, the Ministry of Culture is often the lead department, I would say. But you can have, for instance, the Ministry of Justice, uh, when it comes, especially when it comes to injunction, fundamental rights, anything linked to the power of national court, for instance, to the Ministry of Justice. Then you have sometimes the Ministry of Economics, because there is like um, part of this ministry that is in charge of the digital economy. So they come as well to discuss matters related, like, as you know, G GS Media, hyperlinks, this kind of thing. And we all come together and uh, usually you have different views around the table. Um, clearly, I would say like the, the those in, that are coming from the digital economy ministries are more uh, in favor of a more, I would say, liberal or open uh, views on copyright, whereas um, the Ministry of Culture is more in favor of defending the rights of, of the right holders. But all in all, we, we come together and then eventually when you have disagreements, it's like a member of the, the, the office of the prime minister that is making the call. That being said, this is the theory, I would say. In practice, um, I think the French stance has been consistent for quite a lot of time. Uh, before I took over and still now, it's pretty much the same. And I think it's going more towards the direction of the Ministry of Culture. 
Thank you so much, Daniele. If I'm not mistaken, also you, Tito, have had you know, involvement in uh, representing member states before the Court of Justice. You have acted on behalf of Portugal. So uh, it would be really interesting to have your first-hand experience of what it means for a member state to plead before the CJU. So I've actually, I have actually never um, uh, pleaded orally before uh, the CJU. I have filed, I've written and filed uh, written submissions on uh, behalf of Portugal. Um, so there is, um, I've had good and bad uh, experiences. Uh, the best and the worst experience, just to give you an example, the best and the worst experience uh, that I have had is uh, the GS Media case, simultaneously the best and uh, the worst. The best because um, the, the, the Portuguese submission had uh, an important influence in the advocate general opinion in that case, which I think uh, would be the right way forward. The worst because, and I learned that lesson uh, then, um, the, the, the lesson that I've learned in interacting with the CJU is um, never bet on the outcome of a CJU case, because the last time I made a bet on the outcome of a CJU case concerning copyright was the GS Media case, uh, and you can see where that went. So uh, the worst experience was the fact that uh, the judgment by, by the court was actually radically different and revamped the case law on the communication to the public and on the hyperlinking uh, specifically. And I uh, personally think it created quite a bit of uh, chaos. So uh, just to give you uh, an example. Thank you so much. Um... I don't know if uh, the other panelists wish to add uh, anything uh, to the discussion that we've had in this session. Uh, Eleonora, yes, if I, I may, just a, a word. It is to be very short, but like I, I um, actually one very interesting question on uh, uh, horizontal direct effect. Um, you, oh, I think it's frozen. Yes, I think that there are some problems with uh, your Wi-Fi connection. Uh, yeah. Okay. So now, now, it works. now we can hear you. Yes. Okay. I'm sorry. Like uh, now, just because like there is one question in the in part of the chat on uh, a very interesting point that I tried to tackle. I think in in, in a recent art in an article that I wrote a while ago on the horizontal direct effect of um, uh, EU law and especially of EU directive. And that's really interesting. And I think um, especially for the field of copyright because for a long period of time, uh, this horizontal direct effect, it was completely denied. But with more recent case law, uh, especially there is one case called Farel, um, the court has a bit changed its approach and it has widened a bit the scope of this horizontal direct effect especially for what we refer to as emanation of the state. So they change a bit the definition of emanation of the state so that even if you are a private body, if you fulfill some mission of general interest, you can, con you can be considered as such. And when you look at this new definition, you, you have the feeling that for instance, collecting society might be covered by horizontal direct effects uh, in the future. So I think that's something that would be interesting because the court refused it in the OSA ruling. But here with this new case law, that is something maybe to reconsider and, um, and something to be aware of. So, I mean, one question in the chat was like, okay, what might be the future regarding horizontal direct effect? I would suggest really to look at this Farrell case uh, and look at what was uh, the, the, the opinion of the court in OSA a few years ago, because I think things are changing and it might change the, the legal regime of collecting society. Uh, that is uh, really interesting. Uh, thanks so much. Uh, we've reached the end of this session. We shall now be having a 10 minute break. And after that, it will be an opportunity for uh, the participants to raise uh, any questions that uh, have emerged during uh, today's discussion and for the panelists uh, to attempt some predictions as to what the next big issues in copyright law might be. So uh, see you all in 10 minutes from now. Thank you. Hi everyone, welcome back for the final part of today's conference. It's now the time to try and look into the future and to this end I've asked all the speakers of today's event to pick an issue, a topic, a problem 
that they think uh, will be the next big thing in new copyright law or that they would like to see feature higher in the agenda of uh, lawmakers, uh, litigators, uh, courts, etc. cetera. Uh, so it is really an exercise of pure freedom. Uh, feel free to jump in at any point. Uh, and I would also like uh, to see comments from uh, the participants uh, as to what they think uh, is uh, the next big thing in copyright law. So it is really about uh, looking into the future and trying to see how we can improve uh, this area of intellectual property. Uh, so let's get started. I would like uh, to uh, invite the speakers to share their thoughts uh, in the order in which they've uh, spoken today. So I shall start uh, from uh, Justine uh, to share her views. Right, so I, sorry, should we stick to stay in our lane as it were and stick to the topics on which we were asked to present? <laughs> you are completely free, so you can pick any topic you think is deserving of attention. Well, I think, you know, to stay in my lane, I mean, there are so many, so many issues that one could highlight and so many areas um, in which we need further jurisprudence from the Court of Justice and, and which I expect we'll get it um, uh, following many more preliminary references. But I think, yeah, on the topic on which I spoke, the, the big issue would be the one that I mentioned, which is we just need further clarification as to, uh, firstly, the types of categories of work that are inherently unprotectable um, in virtue of their inherent lack of originality and secondly um, and in a way going to this issue of equality of protection you know to what extent I mean different types of works it's recognized afford different a different scope scopes for formative freedom and to what extent does the scope afforded by a particular type of work uh, affect the expectation of the person who created it in terms of, um, if you like, original contribution um, and, and, the, and, and to what extent does it influence the, the, the degree of originality that is acquire, required for a finding of copyright protection. So I think we can hope for more guidance uh, from the Court of Justice on those two issues. We can also expect it and we can also hope, as I suggested, for a reconception in the course of, uh, of the Court of Justice offering that guidance or, um, of, of what is an authorial work. Thank you, <laughs> Eleonora. Thank you so much. Uh, now let's move on uh, to ask Silvia. Thank you very much. Uh, it is actually not an easy task. Uh, and, uh, in addition to what uh, has been already underlined and what I assume it will be underlined by, by other speakers, I would like just to raise a point that uh, um, stems from the subject of my chapter, but is actually linked uh, to other issues that I am also currently considering in, in my research. And uh, it is actually the attempt of the European Union legislator to rebalance the bargaining power of the players and to remedy uh, in some way, some gaps uh, in the distribution of the value that is generated by the uses and the flows of protected contents. And although we might discuss uh, whether Article 15 is, dri is driven by this, uh, this uh, rationale, such a focus on uh, the fairness of uh, the copyright focus markets, because uh, here we are talking about the, fair the fairness of the markets, uh, for example, in the Copyright Digital Single Market Directive, is uh, the core also of the fair, proportionate, and appropriate remuneration for authors and, uh, and performance vis-a-vis -vis their counterparties. And uh, I think maybe that this direct recognition of, uh, of this rationale uh, by the European Union legislator is an interesting perspective to consider for the uh, evolution of the copyright and, uh, and related right uh, system. And this brings us also to a final relevant point that is uh, a progressive shift in the consideration of uh, European Union copyright uh, as a system, I would say, as uh, it has been done ultimately in this uh, conference and, uh, and in the book that you, you edited. So this is my, my point. Thanks so much, Silvia. Indeed, today we have not discussed the issue of authors and performers' uh, contracts, uh, but uh, 
This is likely to be uh, indeed a very relevant topic, uh, not only for what has been done, uh, because uh, harmonizing uh, contract law is not easy. And uh, uh, we shall see how member states transpose these provisions. Uh, the, the directive itself leaves uh, significant discretion. Uh, so <laughs> whether there will be a level playing field in the end, I guess, uh, remains uh, to be seen. Thanks so much, uh, Silvia. Um, Caterina, the floor is yours. Thank you, Eleonora. Well, after all the inputs that we received today and after all what the speakers already added, uh, it's indeed very hard. And uh, one may also risk to uh, just repeat what was already heard. But I believe that we reached the point of no return, meaning that also the decisions of the Court of Justice show that the um, it's not anymore the time to have ad hoc interventions on problems as the EU is doing, but it's time to make a full overall of certain basic concepts. We have problem in the subject and uh, EU legislator will be forced sooner or later to face the question of AI generated work, but that will be probably the point to define who an author might be for EU copyright law. And that's not something that can be done by the Court of Justice. It's the legislator who should do it. Second thing, general definition of the object. Uh, from level up onwards, we got another requirement on top of originality, which is expression, but it's still a patchwork of uh, requirements that very much recall what the Court of Justice is doing with Article 3, figuring out new and new requirements to be clearer. It's not enough. We need one word, one. We have it at the national level. That's time also. It's big time to have it also at the EU level. And uh, I'm just dropping it there, like food for thoughts. I believe that Tom Cabinet told us once forever that the, be, the boundaries between Article 3 and 4 of the InfoSoc Directive are not clear. And Paragraph 69 on Tom Cabinet is actually telling us that there is a gray zone between the two rights. The Court of Justice itself doesn't know how to fill up. And this means that the InfoSoc Directive needs to be adjusted again to new business models. So we need to rethink exclusive rights in their boundaries. Probably the, for the definition, we can rely in specification by the Court of Justice, but in terms of boundaries, that cannot be the court doing it at all. And Tom, in Tom Cabinet, they said it's not up to us. Two last points, reversion rights. There is a huge debate ongoing on that. Probably it would be high time to think about that because maybe this would make our copyright system more efficient, not just for authors, but also for, for users. And last but not least, copyright data. So probably we would need to intervene and that stakeholders would thank us a lot. Uh, we would need to intervene on cleaning a bit the uh, copyright metadata environment, providing obligations about that. And that would facilitate enforcement, that would facilitate licensing, that would, was, would facilitate the protection of public domain. Enough on my side. Thank you very much once again for the wonderful event. No, thanks so much, uh, Caterina, to you. Uh, just you know, to react very quickly to the points that you've raised uh, in relation uh, to data and copyright. Uh, I don't know if all the participants are aware, but uh, there is uh, a review of the database directive in the pipeline. And it seems that a proposal in this sense uh, might be unveiled before the summer break. Uh, so let's see what comes out of that. And in relation to your point about authorship, uh, 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 you mentioned that it is not for the CJU to undertake this task, but don't think that if the CJU was asked by a national court what or who an author is, it will do exactly as it did in Levola Angle for work. It would say that it is something that does not make reference to national law. It is an autonomous concept of EU law. And then what comes after that, it will be for the court to say. <laughs> That might be indeed the case, but we saw what was the end with Levola Angelo. And I wouldn't like to see the same for artificial intelligence, honestly, because the consequence might be even worse. Thank you. And indeed, in authorship, there is another big topic that is that of joint authorship. We have so many different tests at the national level, so it would be good to have some uniformity also there. So thanks so much. Uh, Ole Andreas. Well, first of all, thank you uh, so much and congratulations, uh, Eleanor, on this uh, great, uh, great uh, seminar and the book project. Uh, I will uh, just uh, at the end here 
uh, raise a more general question uh, that I also have uh, addressed before uh, about the usefulness of the current bundle structure uh, of the uh, uh, economic rights. That also goes a little bit to, to, to what uh, Katarina addressed, uh, because there's a bundle structure that leads us to a classification problem that easily uh, distract and uh, uh, alienate us from the functional and uh, economic uh, and also uh, moral uh, problems at stake. Uh, there are numerous uh, examples uh, of that, which are well uh, documented in the book and also discussed in this uh, seminar. Uh, is this and that communication to the public? Is it distribution? Is it reproduction? Whatever. Uh, I think it's time to abandon uh, this uh, this uh, this uh, structure. Um, it could be illustrated by using um, the, the the hot topic or NFT. Uh, Oleandras, you have uh, you have muted yourself. Sorry, <laughs> uh, it, it it could be uh, used. Uh, um, it, it could be illustrated by using the hot topic of, of NFT art as an example. Um, the, the classification problem according to classical copyright law would be, does the sale of a, a NFT to which a digital work is attached involve the distribution right? And as a matter of law, um, it may be so if we are to follow Tom Cabinet, uh, because the, the dissemination of the artwork as such represents an act, act of communication to the public and reproduction and not distribution. Um, and then the question um, uh, comes, does it really matter uh, if the value lies in the NFT and not, not so much in the underlying work as such? Uh, what matters here could be that the, 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 the contract terms imposed upon the, the, the purchaser. Uh, and I think that future copyright law uh, I, I think that uh, maybe we'll be concentrated more on contract copyright interface than these uh, classification uh, uh, problem. I have written about the need for restructuring economic rights uh, elsewhere. Uh, this was just to prove the point. Thanks so much. Uh, very intriguing uh, as a proposal uh, that you are making. Uh, let's uh, now move on to hear from Justin, uh, if he's uh, uh, connected. He's online, but I think he's on the move. So we shall return to him uh, if he's able uh, to, to join us. Um, Julien, what is your take? So uh, I'll say, first, thank you so much for this incredible conference. There's a lot of very interesting talks today. So I'm very happy to be part of, of, of this conference. I, I take two things related to the topic of mine, which was really, which was like proving corporate uh, protection and infringement. The first thing is that it will come at some point before the court of justice. If you have a look at the last question referred to the Court of Justice in Levola, it was exactly about what I was talking about. So I just read it loud, how the court in infringement proceedings determine whether the taste of the defendant's food product corresponds to such an extent to the, to, to, to the taste of the applicant's food uh, product that it constitutes an infringement of copyright. Is a determining factor here that the overall impressions of the two tastes are the same? So basically the question of how you would prove infringement was the question before the court. It's just the court did not have to answer it because it stated that the taste is actually not protected by copyright at the EU level. But this question at some point will be raised before the court. The, the second point, which is more probably uh, problematic and would, that is already out there, is how you would prove that something has been or not been copied from what's it is out in the internet because in the practice, when you want to prove originality or when you want to contest originality, you actually use things that are out there and you put it before the judge stating basically that it has been copied or not by the other party. And the problem now is that you've got a lot of prior art that you can find on the internet. It's quite easy because you just use like the search engines and you, you want to find something that looks so like the works of the defendant, you just put it as a query 
into Google images and you'll find similar images. So the problem is here. How would you deal with that? How would you consider it has been copied or not? It had a pos the, the defendant had the possibility to access or not this work has been experiencing this previous work or not. So that question is already out there. It's in the practice. There is already some case law uh, in US copyright case law. You got the same issue in design and patent and you already have case law, but we do not really have this thing in the field of copyright law. And it's, it's, I think it's gonna come up at some point, uh, if not before the court of justice, before lots of national jurisdictions. And in the end, probably you would have to deal with it at the EU level. Thanks so much, uh, Julienne. Uh, very interesting and uh, original perspective and also very uh, relevant from a practical standpoint. Uh, Maurizio, uh, it's your turn. Yeah, I think the next big thing, big thing in your copyright would be to see the EU legislator resisting pressures from powerful stakeholders to extend property rights in uh, uh, in the remaining corners of, uh, of the EU economy where property rights have not yet been, uh, um, been applied. And I, I'm thinking in particular data, algorithms, and I've seen a comment from, from, uh, from a participant from um, um, Alina Trapova, who says, uh, hopefully not to see a copyright protection for AI generated works, that's exactly uh, something I, I would totally agree. So uh, I, I, we have seen uh, some concerning uh, signs, unfortunately, in, uh, in the trade agreements that have been now um, under um, uh, negotiations between the UK and other countries in view of this global Britain uh, uh, mythology and where, where, where um, um, property, rights, property protection for algorithms is, uh, um, is included. So we hope uh, we won't see this trend uh, uh, at European level. Thanks so much, Maurizio. Uh, Alain, if you are connected, the floor is yours. Uh, it seems uh, you are not. Then uh, Daniel, uh, if you are uh, also on, on the call? It seems not. Then, uh, um, I, yeah. I, I have a, a <laughs> <one> that wants <laughs> attention continually, so <laughs> I am not sure I'm the best person right now to, uh, to contribute. <laughs> no problem at all. Uh, Jan, I don't know if you can hear us. Uh, oh yes, I can hear you, but you cannot see me, so I hope that's fine and you can you can hear me properly. Um, uh, so, so I, I would like to uh, uh, to say uh, what is the next big thing at uh, at Brussels and copyright policy. Um, I hope that it will be uh, the EU copyright title, uh, which uh, we discussed. Uh, you know, in enforcement, uh, I, I think we need a, a uniform copyright title in the EU. Uh, uh, also to, to maybe solve all the issues we've been discussing and who are sometimes only very, uh, let's say, uh, roughly regulated so far in the directives. Um, I think on a minor level, probably um, uh, in, in Brussels policy-wise, regulating copyright and AI could be an interesting thing. And here I mean, not, not probably not copyright protection as a genuine copyright, but rather related right protection, because we already have to a certain extent related right protection for AI results, and maybe we need a more sound system here. Uh, in, uh, in Luxembourg, on the uh, CJU court level in, in copyright, I think probably the next big thing will be copyright contract law. That's my guess, because that has been newly introduced into uh, EU copyright law and because uh, before the DSM directive it was it was national of course uh, and and I expect a lot of references and uh, I think you know this uh, this entire regulation is probably a great employment program for lawyers uh, in the national member states 
Uh, and uh, the second big issue, my guess, is in copyright law is calculation of damages because the, the level of harmonization should be, well, at least 80 or 90 percent through the enforcement directive. But so far, we have very, very uh, diverse uh, laws in the national member states. So that's definitely a field damages, copyright damages. So that's a field for CJU to further harmonize like they did, for example, in the communication to the public or in the area of subject matter, etc. cetera. So uh, that's all for me. Thank you for the great conference. It's been really a pleasure to be part of it. Thanks so much, Jan. You've also given us uh, more good news uh, that indeed uh, there is plenty to research, uh, working in the copyright field uh, for years to come uh, due to the growing complexity of legislation and case law itself. I see that uh, Alain is uh, now uh, visible. So Alain, the floor is yours. Back, yeah. Um, I, I, I don't understand the exercise, but uh, I'm not sure I can anticipate the future, but um, we are doing a study on AI and issues arise in relation to the input issue, uh, not the protection of the output. Uh, that's not a, a real issue. I don't know whether that will lead uh, to some um, draft. The Commission has no appetite right now in the short time because they were quite busy uh, with the 2019 uh, directive. Uh, the copyright title is something for the future that uh, I'm pleading uh, for, definitely, but I don't think there is an appetite uh, from the legislator, at least from the Commission, uh, to tackle with that. Uh, concerning the case law, well, I would like to see something on the analysis of the infringement, and I follow Julien on that. I think that's a missing piece. Um, the practical issue of data management is very important. That's part of the study we are doing for the Commission as well. Uh, I'm not sure it will lead to legislative uh, measures. Uh, that might be some, something else. So I'm not sure there will be a lot on the legislative side. Of course, uh, a lot at the level of the court and maybe on the infringement analysis and maybe some other measures for practical issues like data management. Thank you so much, uh, Sebastian. Yeah, thank you so much. And thank you so much for this fantastic day. Um, I uh, Let me come with a biased prediction regarding intermediaries and a wish regarding substantive copyright. So regarding intermediaries, I think the topic of content moderation also recommender systems um, will uh, definitely be of interest in the future. Content moderation across the stack. So not only looking at platforms, but also what is happening in other intermediaries. Regarding content moderation and platforms, <clears throat> we see this new regime, which is basically moving from matching algorithms, which is fairly straightforward, to context-driven, a computational context-driven algorithmic approach to material copyright, which is fantastic because if algorithms actually get good at identifying whether something is uh, a parody or not, uh, maybe there's less work for copyright scholarship. No, that wouldn't be good, but you see my point. So I think this is an interesting uh, topic in the future. I also hope that in this context, or um, uh, I don't know whether that's a wish or whether that is something I predict, but at least some more compartmentalizing of issues, it, fixing copyright issues in copyright law, fixing platform issues in other aspects. Um, power platform questions of copyright are not restricted to copyright. And I think it's an interesting question to ask where the special place of copyright is vis-a-vis -vis other rights um, uh, and these platforms. And lastly, um, my wish. So what is my wish? Katerina spoke about the point of no return. Um, and Jan just mentioned the uh, employment program. Jan, it's not only for lawyers, but also for scholars, which is excellent for me. I'm still young. I still need to research a lot. But at the same time, I really, really hope for uh, some way of minimizing complexity. Um, that might be involve pushing back the influence of the Court of Justice and more legislative proposals. I don't know. Um, that would be my, my wish, uh, less complexity back to first principles of copyright law. Thank you so much for this fantastic day. Thanks so much, Sebastian. It's been great having you. Uh, now it's the turn of Lydia. Yes, hello. Thank you so much. I think this is not a prediction, but in the long run, the European Union needs to decide how to deal with the principle of territoriality. 
um, and the limitations of the principle on online copyright exploitation. Whether these solutions are going to be found at the level of private international law or at the level of substantive copyright law. Um, I agree with Jan, if we had a uniform EU title that would eliminate a lot of the problems, at least within the European Union. Of course, we still have the rest of the world to deal with, but still that's a, that would be great. That would be a big step forward. So far the EU has just been dealing with the problem, sort of, what do you say? In specific areas, you know, going in in very small specific areas like the satellite uh, directive, the country of origin principle in the satellite directive and the country of origin principle in the new online transmissions broadcasting organizations directive. So we see these like very spotty solutions, but um, it would be easier and better for, I think, the market if we had more broad solutions. Um, in the short run, though, as I mentioned before, I think it will be a very interesting question to see what happens with the damage head of jurisdiction. Um, a number of the avocat generals have suggested eliminating it altogether. Um, it's not perhaps needed when it comes to other types of torts online, like personality rights, but because of the principle of territoriality, the damage head of jurisdiction is, in fact, very important, I think. On the other hand, though, it might need to be tweaked a little bit with some kind of targeting approach. So that's more in the short term, what I think we might be able to expect. Thank you very much. And um, I'm, thank you for having me today. Thanks so much, Lydia. Uh, thanks so much for your contribution and all uh, the thought-provoking uh, reflections you have offered us uh, today and in the book. Uh, Giancarlo, what is your take? Uh, you are muted. Thank you, Lenora. Let me thank you again for organizing all this. And um, unfortunately, I couldn't follow all the all the interventions, but uh, what I saw is great. And this is really one of the best uh, copyright things put together. So congratulations for this. Uh, all my points have already been mentioned, actually. When arriving at this point, I end up having all my points uh, being mentioned. Let, so I will just uh, I will just uh, restate them. I mean, in general terms, in connection to what uh, I was talking about in my chapter, yeah, limitation of global copyright enforcement only to residual uh, scenarios. Uh, and uh, perhaps maybe only in cases of mani manifestly, manifestly infringing content. Then uh, beyond what I was talking in my chapter, my, the things on my, on my, on my agenda and then and, and points that I think are relevant, artificial intelligence and authorship definitely, and my point and my conclusion here, let's maintain the status quo. Uh, we don't protect it. Uh, copyright law is good as it is. Uh, author, uh, human author centered. We don't need to move in another direction. If an incentive is uh, perhaps uh, to be applied, we might try to uh, mimic that proposal that came up in Japan with uh, uh, basically a model for protecting unfair competition of AI content that uh, has a reputational value and has become viral and especially popular. And then a couple of points on uh, platform uh, regulation and, uh, and, and corporate infringement on platforms. Uh, one is a wish. I like, I'd like to see the next thing to be compulsory licensing online. The motor stakeholder uh, discussion uh, around Article 17 made clear that that's not the case, that European law doesn't want to go there, that demand, the mandate of Article uh, 17 uh, it doesn't go in that direction. I think that that was a huge lost opportunities. I think that it's the time to depart from the principle of exclusivity uh, in the online environment. I think that thinking about compulsory licensing further fix all the issue and the tension that uh, Article 17 brings about in terms of uh, algorithmic enforcement, which leads me to the last point. Algorithmic enforcement is a huge problem. I mean, it's what is turning my turn our society, to, uh, my, my lead our society towards dystopian future. I mean, it's Pasquale been explaining to one about the black box society, and we don't care about it. Uh, the point is that, you know, I'm, I was, I was wa waiting for the DSA and to find a lot of uh, provision, a lot of safeguard, safeguards in connection to transparency and accountability of, uh, of, uh, of uh, algorithms, uh, algorithms. All the IP enforcement that's going to happen online is going to happen by algorithms. It's going to, it's going to be algorithmic, algorithmic enforcement, no more human enforcement. But as of now, 
it doesn't seem to me that we take uh, uh, the, the issue seriously enough, uh, considering the dystopian uh, consequences that could come out of this. So the big point of my agenda is to see an improvement in the DSA with a number of, uh, of proposals, and the proposal has been out there, in order to improve transparency and accountability of algorithms. I know that trade secrets is a big issue for, for, for big, uh, large high-tech companies, and nobody wants to disclose the algorithms and make them transparent, but, but I think that civil society needs to, to, to force that, that transparency as much as possible, and that would be all. Thanks so much, uh, Giancarlo. Uh, that was uh, very insightful. Uh, Anna, what is your take? Well, I have a prediction and a wish. Uh, my prediction is rather obvious, which is we will see an uptick of references to the CGEU, uh, mostly um, about the, the new directive, because there are lots of indeterminate concepts there that I think will end up uh, in the court and we need to, to wait uh, for that moment to have more clarity. Um, a wish or uh, my wish would be to know more um, about the interplay between the DSA and the Copyright Directive, because the, the Commission has uh, sort of touched upon uh, that subject ever so lightly. Uh, there are some calls uh, in that regard that, that focus on Article 17 specifically and the DSA, but the DSA is very fertile in, in things that might be uh, copyright relevant. And uh, out of this, I would uh, highlight only one in the interest of time, which is the concept of misuse that we have in Article 20 uh, of the DSA. The misuse of, of, uh, of uh, complaints that are manifestly unfounded is sanctioned in the DSA. Does this apply to copyright? Does it not? Why or why not? So this type of, of uh, interplays and issues uh, between the DSA and the Copyright Directive, I would very much like to see more scholarship um, and, and more discussion on that. Thank you. And thank you very much for uh, an excellent event, Eleonora. No, thanks so much uh, to you, Anna, and uh, for uh, the contribution today and uh, in the book, of course. Uh, Tito, what is your take? Thank you, uh, Eleonora. Like uh, Anna, I will share both uh, a wish and a prediction, but I will start with uh, the wish. And I will be a bit uh, repetitive, but I think um, most of us, if not all of us, have uh, previously taught or are currently teaching uh, EU copyright law. Now, considering the complexity of uh, EU copyright law, this is sometimes uh, a total nightmare to explain to students the different the relationships between the different uh, directives. So I think it is high time that we uh, codify EU copyright law. Unification might be a bit too ambitious, but at least uh, codification. Of course, the, the political feasibility behind this uh, proposal raises uh, serious doubts considering the current levels of polarization within copyright law. So probably any, any hope of a coherent and systematized reframing of copyright law would drown in waves of lobbying. So it's highly unlikely that this will happen. So that's why it's my wish and not my, uh, not my prediction. It also doesn't seem to be on top of the commission's priorities. So judging by, if we are to draw any lessons from uh, the legislative cycle that ended with uh, the DSM directive, it seems that the commission simply prefers uh, piecemeal harmonization on specific problems that have not been uh, addressed yet at the EU level rather than going for um, uh, codification. So that's my wish. Uh, it, it would make our lives significantly easier and also the lives of those who are subject to uh, copyright law, which obviously includes ourselves as well. As to a, um, my prediction, a very short prediction, um, a recent report by the European Parliament was uh, published on the illegal streaming of live sporting events, which are currently uh, not protected by EU copyright rules. So it seems that uh, members of the European Parliament want these streams to be blocked uh, in a very short period of time, actually within 30 minutes of their making available. And the commission had previously stated that uh, during the, the 2019 copyright directive discussion, it had stated that it would follow up on the proposals uh, by the European Parliament to address the challenges that uh, sports events organizers and sports broadcasters uh, face in the online world. So um, considering the publication of this report by the EP, there may be something coming up in the future. We will see. 
thank you again for the fantastic event. Thanks so much, Tito. Indeed, uh, you know, as uh, you will remember, uh, at some point, uh, there was the suggestion that there should be a new right uh, for uh, sport organizers in the DSM directive. Uh, it came uh, a bit out of nowhere. Uh, in the end, it was not included, but uh, it was uh, anticipated as, uh, since then that this would be indeed uh, an issue. And in relation to your point uh, about the uh, lack of appetite of the European Commission towards uh, uh, codification, unification, as you want to call it, uh, perhaps you know, it is still uh, suffering from a post-traumatic stress disorder after what happened with the DSM directive. And this might be also why we are still waiting for the Article 17 guidelines <laughs> after uh, many months uh, of, uh, since the conclusion of the stakeholder dialogue. Uh, Estelle? Yeah, so it's really hard to come at the end, of course, because uh, so much of it has already been said. But first, I, I would very much agree with what Alain has said. But uh, let me add a few more things and, and more wishes than, than predictions. Uh, and, and therefore what the next big thing or things should be. But first, I would reiterate, I want this to be very clear, and a lot of people agree that the Commission should not create a new right uh, for a copyright for uh, AI generated works, but it should also not create a new right on data, which is not inside a database, just data, pure data. Um, as you said, the, the revision of the database directive is, is normally on the agenda. Um, and I would, uh, of course, uh, say that uh, the Commission and, and plenty of others should just read my book about what they need to do about this and uh, also what I've written afterwards, after 2008, uh, about how to deal with the database directive and how to fix it. So hopefully that, that, that will happen. Uh, but something a bit, of course, more utopian uh, in, in, that, in the short term, at least, as, as you were just saying, we're just coming out of a, a round of, of directives and then we have the DSA and the DGA, so the, the, the commission will be very busy. So uh, in, in the next few years, in terms of copyright, I don't think new directives are going to come out. They're not gonna be forthcoming for a while, but, but in the long term, let's put it this way, the wish would be that the commission should fix certain controversial aspects of, of the Court of Justice case law. Uh, commission communication to the public is, is one of them, but there the, are the others. Now, one of the less utopian wishes that uh, one could have in the very short term uh, is the aspect of the copyright design interface on which I've, I've written a lot. And, and you may know that there is a design consultation uh, at the moment that the DG Group is, is doing and it intends to revise the, uh, the design directive and the design regulation and the interface. There are questions on this interface in the consultation. So uh, let me finish with a plea rather than a next big thing or you know what the, the prediction is, but a plea to us academics and whoever is listening today because so many people are, are still there, but also academics, consumer, user associations, general um, people in the public to please reply to commission consultations on copyright, on IP in general, on the design uh, one that just uh, is open at the moment. They want to hear from us. They want empirical evidence. So if you're doing empirical work, just, just give it to them. And also, I think we need you know, we're all busy as academics and, and we say, now ah, maybe they won't listen to us, but we need to shout and to have our voice heard, not just in our uh, research, but, you know, in replying to these consultations, because in our research, we don't maybe always answer the questions that they're, they're looking for, because we need a more balanced, more balanced answers, you know, bunch of answers to these consultations. So that's not just the, the uh, right order associations or right holders who, who answer, or no, not just certain countries as well. So that all voices throughout the EU should be heard. So that's what I would like to say. Thanks so much, Estelle. Uh, Daniele? Um, yeah, it's, it's a bit difficult to come at the, at the very end, I must say. Uh, but um, if I were to just uh, refer to one thing, I think it would be the potential disruption of copyright and um, and I would say geo-blocking um, by competition law. I think it's really something that um, is coming up that uh, um, you had like a very recent case, the, the, the pay TV or Canal Plus case where um, the, the issue could have been addressed, but uh, neither the European Commission in the statement of objection nor the, the tribunal or the court actually addressed the core issue, which is like, uh, are those geo-blocking clause um, some kind of barrier to entry to the market uh, infringing Article 101? Um, this remains unclear, but when you look at the evolution of the court case on um, competition law in those matters, I think, uh, there is a big risk um, 
that copyright might be uh, really disrupted by uh, competition law in the future. Um, and I think it could be, yeah, it could be good because then it could like trigger something uh, in those in those discussions. So yeah, not a wish, but like maybe more prediction, I would say. <laughs> Thanks so much, uh, Frederick. Thank you, Eleanor. Um, I will, I mean, as, as Tito said, it's very hard to predict uh, the outcome of the case. I will, of course, not um, try to predict uh, the, the big uh, the big trends and, and, and future. Um, but um, I have two points that I, that I would like to bring uh, under attention. Um, we've been, um, or oh, a lot of people this afternoon have been talk talking about the uh, balance of interests, uh, which courts uh, seems to, to find extremely uh, important. Um, and I think there are two points where um, this is not um, um, being carried to the to the uh, uh, right proportions. One is the um, difference between copyright and um, and designs, and I think um, Mr. Spooner said said that in the. Coffemel uh, conclusions, I think, um, where he, he literally advocates for a higher level of um, of originality in order to avoid confusion between the two um, the two systems. I think that's a that's an important point to the uh, for the future because we we see and I see it in courts uh, on a so to speak daily basis that people are claiming copyright for things that were never intended to uh, to be copyrighted and then of course the the, the consequences are, are immediately um protection uh 70 years uh, post-mortem etc it's a it's a really quantum leap uh between uh the um um, the protection you would have for an unregistered design um that's uh, one thing that that needs to be um um, kept in mind, I think. The second thing is the balance between the interest of the copyright holders and the users. Um, the enforcement directive gives um, a lot of rights to the hold, to the copyright holders, IP holders in in, in general. Um, but those rights can be abused. I mean, we see a lot of examples. Uh, Luckily, for now, uh, mostly from from the US. But for instance, um, and last week I read about uh, uh, a woman who gave um, um, piano lessons on YouTube and and who had to stop because whether she played Beethoven or Bach, um, that was being claimed by by other um, people uh, as being their copyright, and and everything she uploaded was being uh, locked down by by YouTube. Um, Example of the same thing: the, the Paris police last uh, last month, I think, um, started playing music, copyrighted music, so that people with smartphones recording the police action, uh, wanting to upload that, um, would have their their movie uh, um, or their clip removed by the um, by the filter of the of the um, um, platform. Of course, that's not a um, that's not the aim of copyright, and I think. Um, we should um, um, consider those examples, and there are a lot more um, as warning signs um, that there also should be a, a, a fair balance in the other direction. And um, and for instance, um, like the enforcement directive um, allows the copyright holder to claim all the costs um, in court, that for instance, uh, someone who's been um, Unjustly uh, sued um, could also claim uh, claim the totality of the cost, and, and, and that, that, that's just an example. But um, like I said, I think that's a point where the balance uh, should be kept in mind. And um, I don't know if that's work for the for the courts, for the ECJ or uh, the ECJ or whatever, or if, if it's policy and uh, more for the commission. But um, I think we should keep that in mind. Thank you. Thanks so much, Frederick. Uh, Tatiana. Uh... What is your take? Uh, thank you very much, Eleonora. Of course, I'm uh, the last, so many of the points that I would like to raise have already been raised, but I will add some thoughts on them. Uh, first of all, yes, I believe that uh, the European Unification or Codification Project, uh, even if I'm very wishful about this and I, I have defended this view, is not for next year. 
of course, but it's something that we really uh, need to think about it, that all this complexity and all these uh, issues, also in uh, core issues, but also in more technical uh, issues uh, related to copyright law, towards uh, for such an approach. Uh, I also agree with the view that uh, the question of the subject matter, the question of authorship, uh, and here I will add, add also the moral right, because I think that this is a kind of package, uh, they should be considered. Um, apart from the question of joint authorship, another issue where there is already a legislative basis for computer programs is employee created works at the European level. This is something also that we need to, uh, to uh, consider. Uh, regarding uh, the balance of interests, mandatory copyright exceptions, which are enforceable in courts, uh, uh, issues uh, regarding the protection against TPMs. Um, also, I will add that something maybe more provocative here, uh, finding a way to have legal certainty regarding the restrictions put by the right holders uh, uh, as regards online uses. Uh, we have seen this uh, uh, issue to the TD, with the TDM exception and the need to opt out in an appropriate manner. We have seen the question in the VGB Kult case uh, where uh, uh, we see that uh, there is need for legal certainty regarding the way that uh, the right holders may uh, impose restrictions online. And of course, I would also think uh, on uh, statutory exceptions, uh, licensing uh, in uh, major fields, and uh, something also related to the competition uh, law question, uh, copyright exceptions also for the sake of free competition. Uh, so these are some uh, thoughts uh, and uh, I would like uh, to thank again you and all the speakers and the contributors for this exciting event. Thanks so much, Tatiana, and thanks so much to all the speakers, without whom today's event would have not been possible, but also the book would have not been possible. So thanks so much for contributing to this project. I would like to conclude by asking Rihanna Harvey and Alex Zanatta-Mura to share also their views, being junior copyright professionals, as to what they would like to see happening in the copyright world. And of course, to thank them for their support. Uh, it has been really invaluable. Without them, again, today, today's event would have not been possible. So, Rihanna, Alex, what are your thoughts? Um, I, well, I, I think I may start. Well, it's very difficult to say anything after the most brilliant minds in the field have shared their views. So <laughs> I will humbly try, yeah, try to come up like the ideas. Like first, I think there's gonna there may gonna be some problems related to the rights of revocation, aka okay, topic of my thesis. That's why I know a little bit more about it uh, in terms of the what a reasonable time means and also the definition of use that can vary a lot according to, I mean, in accordance with the sector like book publishing and music sector that can vary a lot but also outside my topic of comfort you can we can say that way i think probably there's going to be some regulation uh, regulation and i turn to uh, known fungible tokens because there I, i've seen recently the that the charlie beat my finger video was sold for a very big amount of money so as there is going to be a great amount of money involved also and also copyright involved i think there's yeah there's probably going to be some eyes turned on that and also yes as everyone mentioned the intersection between ai and copyright and so much more i can there's nothing much to share but i think these are yeah these are my takes <laughs> thank you thanks so much alex uh, rihanna um, yeah, echoing what Alex said, how we meant to follow up with this. Um, I suppose the biggest thing that is of interest to me that I would like to see addressed as I addressed it in my own thesis was the full extent of the CJU um, interpretation of the communication to the public right. I mean, obviously, there's now possibility of it um, interlinking with so many other areas of um, was it IP law, so uh, DSM directive, e-commerce directive, digital services act when when um, that eventually comes into play. Um, so yeah, hopefully YouTube case will bring some light uh, or shed some light to that um, on the 22nd of June, I believe. Um, and uh, also as um, some more promo for the IFM department, um, there, is a, there is going to be a event um, held by IFM in um, 
with Blacker um, on the um, YouTube decision with some pretty cool names. Uh, so yeah. <laughs> Thanks so much, Rihanna, Alex, all the speakers, and thanks so much to the participants for enduring a full day online uh, discussing uh, all things copyright. Uh, you are very welcome to contact individual speakers. Should you have any follow up questions, please, as Rihanna reminded, uh, join us for our next event on the 1st of July, a rapid response panel discussion to the YouTube uh, ruling. And thanks again for uh, uh, making today's uh, conference possible. Thanks and have a nice evening, afternoon, uh, night, wherever you are based. Thanks again. Thank you, Eleonora. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye, everybody.